Hey, it's me, MLB. Here is the completed book of Torn Down the Middle. Enjoy. Wait, wait. Your little five-year-old voice called out to the boy running ahead of you. I'm sorry. His voice called back as he turned around to face you. I just need to talk to you away from everyone else. What do you need to talk to me about? You asked curiously, squinting at his face. The sun was hitting it at such an angle that you couldn't quite make out his features. The only thing that you could see was a beautiful warm smile that warmed you from the inside out. Well, I wanted to give you this. A plastic ring was presented to you. It's pretty, you gasped. Yin, when we get older, will you marry me? You woke with a start. Ah, oh, that dream, again. You groaned and rubbed your eyes, pulling yourself up to a sitting position. This dream was all too familiar to you. It was a flashback to your auntie's wedding day. You were a flower girl, and you'd met a very handsome boy who had proposed to you on the day. The only problem was you couldn't remember what he looked like, you couldn't remember his name, and most of all, you couldn't find the damn ring that he had supposedly given to you that day. Did this scenario even happen, or have I made it all up? He thought, as he stared down at your blankets. Yeah, if you don't get down here now, you're going to be late for UA again? Your mum bellowed up the stairs. You gasped as you scrambled out of bed, one foot getting tangled in the sheets and tripping you up as you tripped and hopped out. Mind your language, you heard your mum yell. And stop breaking my house, she added as she heard you hit the deck. I'm okay, you yelled back as you rolled around the floor trying to detangle yourself. You quickly put your school uniform on and raced downstairs. I'm here, you called as you missed the last step on the staircase and face planted straight into the wall. Your mum sighed. Ugh, you're determined to obliterate this house, aren't you? I'm honestly not trying. I'm just gifted in the art of tripping on invisible objects, you replied with a giant goofy grin. Eat your breakfast, you egg. Get your ass to school, your mum said with a slight chuckle. Thanks, mum, you giggled as you kissed her on the cheek. You loved your mum, and she loved you. You were so close that you could joke around like this, and it was normal. Your dad had already left for work, but he was just as much a goofball as you, and you two got on like a house on fire often causing a headache for your mum, who secretly enjoyed your shenanigans. You quickly made some toast and put your usual spread on it, before grabbing your school bag and running for the door. Bye, Mum. Wahoo! You yelled with the toast in your mouth as you raced out the door. Yin! You look like you got mauled by a bear. Fix your uniform! You heard your mum scream at you as you bolted from the house. You waved back at her to acknowledge that you'd heard her, but decided that you'd do it once you'd finished eating and almost made it to school. You half ran and shoved the toast down your throat as your mind wandered back to that dream. I still get such strong feelings when I think about him. I'm pretty sure I'm still in love with him. Or maybe it's just that I'm in love with the thought of him? Or the thought that someone likes me? You were so preoccupied with this dream that you didn't realise how quickly you were approaching a blind corner and ran smack bang into the back of someone, smearing the contents of your toast into the back of their shirt and neck and dropping the rest on the ground. Ah, my toast. You moaned pitifully. What the frick? The person you had just run into yelled as he spun around. Glaring, ruby-red eyes threatened to disintegrate you on the spot as he towered over you. Oh, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I... What were you going, crumbs for brains? He yelled, picking an appropriate insult, based off the fact that your face was covered in crumbs. All of your apologies were swallowed in the wake of this boy's overwhelmingly rude behaviour, and you decided to snap back at him instead. Were you deserved it for standing in the middle of the path like an idiot? You screamed back at him, your hands balled into fists. Huh? He exploded. Who the hell do you think you are to look down on me like that, pipsqueak? Pipsqueak? Is that all you have, you angry blonde toilet brush? The look on this guy's face was terrifying. Smoke poured from his palms as he detonated small, crackling explosions. Oh, damn, quirks. Forgot about that for a second. Wonder what his is. Well, doesn't matter because I'm about to die. Lord, rest my soul. Why the frick are you just standing there? The guy asked as he stared into his hands. Uh, what's your quirk? You asked curiously, completely sidetracked by the alluring explosions coming from his palms. Explosion, he replied with a proud smirk. I'm amazing. Gonna be the number one hero. You made a loud, fail buzzer noise which caused him to jump slightly. Wrong! I'm gonna be the number one, you said as you smirked up at him and crossed your arms. He exploded again. Don't underestimate me, he yelled in your face. You were about to yell back at him when you saw his uniform. Wait, you go to UA? Yeah, 
he said, confused by how he could just go from screaming to completely calm in a matter of milliseconds. I'm just starting there today. Hero course 1A, he replied proudly. What? His face fell. Confused, Kitty looked taking over. What? Is that the same class as you? You asked. He grunted a yes and a scowl crossed his face. Fantastic. I'm stuck in the same class as this asshole. You thought internally as you scowled back at him. Because you were both going to the same school, in the same direction, you had to walk the same way. So you did, bickering the whole time. You had missed the first day of school yesterday because you forgot what date it started, so everyone had started to pair up and find their friend groups. Thankfully though, a bubbly pink-skinned beauty and a dark-haired cool cat with earphone jacks came up to you as you entered the back of the room, just behind the angry blonde toilet brush. Hey, the bubbly chick called, extending her hand to you. I'm Mina Ishido. Just call me Mina though, she said, slinging an arm across your shoulders. Hey, the dark-haired girl said flatly. I'm Jiro. You waited for her to say her full name, but she was finished. Oh, okay, so no first name? Alrighty then, you chuckled internally. I'm Yin Lin, master of absolutely nothing, specialising in weird humour and everything cringe, you said proudly. Mina burst out laughing and Jiro cracked a smile. You're all right, Jiro said with a nod of approval. So you know Bakugo then? Mina said, changing subjects slightly. Bakugo? You asked, cocking your head at Mina curiously. Yeah, the guy you followed in, angry blonde, she said, jerking her head towards where Bakugo was talking to a spiky redhead. Oh, him, you said. No, I don't know him. I just ran up the back of him this morning and the mother trucker made me drop my toast. Bastard, Jiro said coldly. I know, right, you exclaimed. But Karma came back and bit him in the ass because he's still got crap in his hair and on his shirt from when my toast slammed into him. Jiro sneered as she saw what you were talking about and Mina laughed. Toast one, Bakugo zero. You laughing at me, crumb face? Bakugo suddenly bellowed across the room at you. Sure am, toast murderer, you screamed back. Match made in heaven? Jiro teased sarcastically. Ugh, if I wanted to date the devil, I'd have asked for his number sooner. You said, jerking your head towards where Bakugo was still glaring at you from the corner of his eye, while the redhead tried to defuse the situation. Mina chuckled, and then turned her attention on the rest of the class pointing people out to you and telling you their names. She had gotten about four people in when she pointed to a jewel-haired boy sitting and looking out the window. That's Todoroki Shoto, she said. You frowned. That name sounds familiar. Probably is because he's the hero Endeavor's son, Jiro said dryly. Hmm. You hummed, thinking. Just then he turned and looked at you. Your heart skipped a beat. Wait, he looks familiar. Okay, sit down everyone, time is money and money buys coffee to keep you awake so you don't fall asleep and lose your job. A very tired looking teacher said as he entered the room and stood at the front of class. Yeah, that's Aizawa, Mina said quickly as she took a seat. Ah, he said softly, looking at the teacher as he stood in the middle of one of the aisles. His bored gaze fell on you. Suddenly you realised that you were just standing there looking stupid while everyone had taken their seats. Your head whipped around looking for a spare seat to hide in. Yin Lin, I presume, he sighed. <laughs> the one and only, he said, laughing hollowly with a sigh on the end, wishing the ground would just swallow you up as all the students' eyes fell on you. Did you want to come and introduce yourself? He asked, but it was more of a sarcastic rhetorical question. <sighs> Do I have a choice? He replied as you made your way up the front, stumbling on your own feet and apologising profusely to everyone you bumped into. You got to the front, and for some reason, the only person you locked eyes with was Todoroki Shoto. Um, hi, he said shyly, acting like you were addressing him directly and him only. Everyone else in the room seemed to fade away. My name's Yin Lin. I'm looking forward to getting to know you better, he added softly, nervously twisting your fingers into the side of his skirt. He looked at you curiously, but his facial expressions never gave any more of him away. There's more of us in the room, crumb face. A sharp, annoyed voice snapped from the back of the room. You immediately located who had said it and snapped. You are the last person that I'd ever want to get to know better. You snarled, balling your hands up. The mood in the room shifted as quickly as your mood did, and a timid greenette at the front gulped and sank down in his seat. Well, that was an introduction, Aizawa said plainly. You're sitting in front of Bakugo, so you'll be getting to know him a lot better. You groaned and let your head flop back eyes staring at the ceiling. 
God, why do you hate me? You dragged your feet up the aisle and shot back a go a dirty look as you pulled the chair out from the desk and sat down. All your nerves were on edge having such an asshole sitting behind you. Todoroki had watched you walk to your seat. He couldn't help but feel that he had met you somewhere before. Mom, I'm home, you yelled as you entered the house. You had survived your first day at UA. Bakugo had been pissing off the most with his aggressive comments and actions that came out of absolutely nowhere. Right now, you just wanted to lock yourself in your room and stare at the ceiling while listening to your favourite music. Ian, sweet, can you please come here? Your mum called, her voice sounding shaky. Mum, you asked as you walked into the lounge room. She was crying. Mum, you gasped, what's wrong? Your dad was there too, his arms wrapped around your mum, comforting her. She burst into tears again, and a lump formed in your throat. What's happening? You choked as your mouth ran dry. It's Grandma, your mum sobbed. She's just been diagnosed with cancer. The doctor said she only has six months left to live. Grandma was your mum's mum, so it was hitting her the hardest. Your heart sank. So what now? You asked numbly as your arms fell to your side. Well, we go and see her, of course, your dad said, nodding emphatically and caressing your mum's head against his chest. The car ride there was painfully quiet. You had already been worn out by the day's happenings, and now this. You stared out the window, defeated. How was school, Peewee? Your dad asked, glancing up at you in the rearview mirror. Peewee was the nickname that he had given you based off your quirk. It had started as paperweight and then got shortened to PW, then softened to Peewee. Okay, I guess, he said with a shrug, still looking out the window. I made two friends. Two? he yelped. What have I told you about overachieving? You cracked a small smile, still watching the scenery go by outside. Thanks, Dad. Oh, and I'm sitting in front of the most annoying guy ever. I don't even know his first name, but he's the physical manifestation of anger management issues. You groaned. I can't stand him. Your dad snorted through his nose. Sounds delightful, he replied sarcastically. Before long, you were at Grandma's house, and the heavy atmosphere surrounding her place thickened. You all entered the house and walked down to her room, with your mum sobbing quietly. You felt terrible watching your mum go through this. Sure, you were sad too, but your mum was really upset. After your mum said a short greeting to your grandma, you stepped forwards. Hey, grandma, you said softly with a quivering smile as you approached the bedside, doing your best to hold back the tears. Yin, honey, she croaked. Look how you've grown. Ah uh ha, -huh, spanks, you replied goofily, immediately regretting your words when your mum cleared her throat sharply. Oh, oops, um, I mean... Thank you, you said again, shooting your mum an apologetic look. You all sat down on various chairs in Grandma's room and chatted about what the future held for her. She was going to be moved to the hospital for the initial treatments, but then she had the option of coming back home again. No, no, Mum, I want you to come and live with us so I can look after you, your mum said to Grandma. Really, sweetheart, she said, tears swelling up in her eyes. Yes, of course, your mum replied emphatically. Tentative arrangements were made, and then Grandma turned to you. Gin, sweet. How old are you again? Um, I'm in high school now, Grandma, you replied. Oh, she sighed happily. I had a boyfriend in high school, at your age. Do you have a boyfriend? You let out a belly laugh, then realised that she had asked a serious question. Oh, 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 you're legit. I mean, uh, serious. Um... N no I don't have a boyfriend you said in the most serious tone you could muster she sighed oh I think you need a beautiful boy to enjoy your youth with you snorted and then covered your nose quickly when your mum glared at you my best friend has a grandson who is just the most handsome young man I've ever seen your grandma said with a sparkle in her eye I would be so happy if you met him she added almost pleadingly you were about to say no, but the dagger that your mum had in her eye when she looked at you told you that you'd better agree to meet this guy or else. <sighs> Fine, he sighed. I'll meet him. What's his name? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I don't know, your grandma said, 
Oh, but I'm sure you two will hit it off straight away. I could die happy knowing you two had gotten together. You smiled. Yeah, <laughs> we'll see, Grandma, we'll see. Mom, I said no, you wailed. I'm not going to pretend to date a guy to make Grandma happy. Yin, she pleaded. Listen, it would only be for six months. This is for her. And what if he's actually super cute and you guys end up dating for real? You sighed and rolled your eyes as you crossed your arms across your chest, thinking about what she'd said. I mean, we'd only have to pretend in front of Grandma. We could carry out our normal lives outside of this, you thought. Yeah, but what if he doesn't agree to it? You then asked your mum. Don't you worry about that side of things, okay? You leave that with me, your mum said excitedly, sensing that you were starting to sway. You stared at her pleading face and then sighed dramatically. Ugh, okay, you whined. This is for Grandma, though. Your mum shrieked for joy and grabbed you into a bear hug. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, she cried. Mum, calm down, it's not that big a deal, you laughed. No, it is, sweetheart. My mum has six months left of her life to live. Six months. If this will make her happy, then I will do anything to make those last six months of her life as wonderful as possible. You smiled sympathetically. You're a really great daughter to your mum. You know that? Your mum smiled and teared up. But you're an ass to your own kid, you then added with a dead straight face. I mean, like, who makes their child fake date a guy? Your mum spurked. You might just fall in love and then we'll see who an ass is to their own kid. You snorted. Bring it on. Yin, your mum called to you up the stairs. I just spoke with grandma's best friend and she's in with helping you get a fake boyfriend. She's going to talk to her daughter, his mum, and arrange it. Wonderful, you called back sarcastically. It would have been much easier if you just bought me a body pillow with an anime boy on it. Your mum heard your response and shook her head with a smile. Honestly, this girl. I'm late. I'm late. I'm late. You chanted as you barreled down the stairs the next morning. Yin, after school today, we're meeting your boy. What the hell is up with your hair? Your mum yelped. What? You asked as you hurriedly made some toast, looking up at her with a oblivious look on your face. Child, it's sticking up everywhere. You look like a half-sucked mango seed. Nah, that's just the style I'm going for today. You said with a shrug. Oh, Lord Jesus, give me strength. Your mum mumbled under her breath. You made it to school in time, barely, and stumbled through the door. Yin, are you okay? Mina almost screamed when she saw you. Yeah, why? You asked yet again, completely oblivious to how you looked. You look like you got attacked or something, she said, concerned. Nah, this is just me, you said, striking a pose. No one understands my style, it's too high fashion. A snort came from nearby and your eyes met with Bakugos. Hey, what's up, breadhead? You yelled at him loudly. Didn't run into your stupid ass on the streets this morning. The hell did you say? Bakugo yelled angrily. Mm. You don't miss an opportunity to be down each other's throats, do you? Jiro moaned. <laughs> That's what she said. A guy named Kaminari chimed in, earning himself an ear jack in the ear from Jiro. With Kaminari screaming in the background, you continued to talk to Jiro. Oh, he just gets under my skin so badly. You hissed angrily. True love, Mina chuckled sarcastically. No one could ever fall for that. Bakugo snorted with disdain, still listening in from a distance. Oh, God, can you just shut up, you spiky blonde period cramp? He groaned. Before he could reply, Aizawa walked in and class started. So what's on for you tonight? Mina asked as you two walked out the gates at the end of school. Meeting with a guy that my grandma has picked out for me, apparently... He said with a laugh. Arranged marriage? Mina chuckled. Nah, it's kind of a meet and greet thing to make Grandma happy. He replied, leaving out the part about intending to fake date. Well, my Grandma doesn't have much time left, so... It's, um, to make her happy. You said, your eyes falling to the ground and your voice faltering on the end. Mina went silent for a bit. Hey, um, if you need someone to talk to, I'm here, yeah. She said softly. You forced a smile and nodded at her, making eye contact briefly before looking away for fear of your true emotions showing. Are you ready yet? Your mum called up the stairs later that afternoon. It was go time. You were going to your grandma's to meet the boy that she said was handsome and all that. 
You'd be lying if you said you weren't a little bit nervous. Yeah, coming, you yelled back, trying desperately to find your left shoe. How is it always the left one that goes missing? Finally finding it in the bin beside your desk, you yanked it on and ran downstairs. Yin, your hair is falling out of its ponytail, your mum said with an eye roll. Come here, let me fix it. Nah, it's not going to work. The hair tie's doing the thing. What thing? Your mum asked with a confused look on her face, eyebrows knitted together. You know, the, the thing where, like, the elastic in the band is, like, stretchy, but not full stretchy stretchy, just like a little bit too much, you rambled. So, like, you can get it to loop around your hair two times, and then it's not, like, fully tight, so you try for a third loop, but then it's just a little bit too short. So you've got this, like, random bit that's kind of just there, and, like, why? And your hair keeps falling out of it, and yin! My god! We're gonna be here all damn day talking about your hair tie, your mum said in the most exasperated voice you'd ever heard. Leave your goddamn hair out. What? Throw the tie away. Leave it out. Oh, like, let my head up? Yes. Ah, gotcha. He said with a goofy smile as you pulled the tie out of your hair and swished it around a bit, ruffling your hair with your fingers before shooting your mum the finger guns. How's it? Fine. That's it? Yes, let's go. And with that, you were dragged out the door to the car. So, do we have any stats on this dude? You asked calmly in the car on the way there. Negative, Captain. He's a mystery, your dad said in his best spy voice. Not even a name, he added with a playfully sinister tone to his voice. Okay, well, let's name him then, you replied. Your mum sighed. Oh, you can't just name Squishy, you said quickly. I shall name him Squishy and he shall be mine. Your dad snorted and your mum groaned. Okay, no objections then. Squishy it is, he said triumphantly. As your dad turned the corner into Grandma Street, you saw a car pull up in a driveway. Oh, that must be him, your mum said, seeing the same car that you were looking at. A well-dressed blonde lady hopped out of the driver's side, and an older lady hopped out of the passenger seat. Oh, which your grandma's best friend, your mum said upon seeing the older lady emerge from the car. Yes, this is definitely the right people. The boy must be in the car, your mum said as you pulled up on the street. You watched as the back door opened and a spiky blonde head appeared from the rear door. You paled as he emerged in a black shirt with a white skull on the front of it. Oh my god, fuck me dead with axe, huh? Your mum would numbly. Excuse me? Your mum gasped when she heard your unsavoury expression. Anyone but him? He continued. You know him, Peewee? Your dad asked as he shut the engine off. The blonde guy turned to look at your car. Piercing red eyes met yours for a split second before you ducked down, tucking your head to your knees, the car seatbelt cutting into your stomach. Dad! You hissed. Start the car! <laughs> what? He chuckled. Start the goddamn car and get me out of here! Hey, whoa! He replied. Language, baby. What's got you so worked up? Dad, I know him! You hissed again. Whoa, what's the problem? He asked again, or your mother waved to the guy who was still standing looking at the car. Dad, it's the annoying guy who sits behind me in class. His name's Baggygo. After arguing in the car for another five minutes, your mum threatened you enough that you got out of the vehicle. Slowly, you pushed the door open and hopped out. Baggygo's face fell, quickly replaced by a scowl. What's up, you rabid blonde llama? You said casually with an overly cheerful smile on your face. What are you doing here? He growled lowly at you. Listen, buddy, I'm allowed to be here. This is my grandma's house, so if you'd kindly trot on back to hell, that would be fabuloso, he said in the sweetest voice you could muster. Bakugo scowled. I was supposed to be meeting a really nice chick today. Yeah, that's me, baby cakes, he replied again with a hair flip for added effect. Mum, deal's off, Bakugo yelled, spinning around to face his mum, who was still standing at the car. No, the hell it's not, she yelled back. We've got too much riding on this. Hmm, wonder what their wager was, you thought. Well, your mum sighed, shall we go inside? You could cut the tension with a knife. You groaned. Back you go, made a noise. And with that, you were both ushered into the house by your respective parents. You need to be nice, your mum hissed, grabbing you by the arm and digging her nails in. This is for grandma's happiness. You grunted in reply. But the expression on your face softened and you glanced at Bakugo. He seemed to be getting the same dressing down from his mum. He sighed. 
And I kind of feel sorry for the two of us here. Both hate each other and are forced to pretend we're cool. And your grandma chirped when she saw you. Oh, and uh... Bakugo. Bakugo Katsuki. Your blonde thorn in the side replied. Oh, yes. Your grandma replied with a shaky smile. Oh, you're such a handsome young man. Now I remember you when you were just a little tot with a smile that could light up the world. Smile? As if this gremlin couldn't smile. You pulled a face and your mum nudged you sharply. You took a seat and so did everyone else in the room, with Bakugo sitting across from you, casually leaning back against the wall, arms crossed and ruby red eyes glowering. It was obvious that he was unhappy with the arrangements, but he was holding his tongue, surprisingly. So, uh, Bakugo, have you met my lovely granddaughter, Yin? Your grandma asked, smiling across at you. Bakugo snorted and earned himself a sharp smack to the head by his mum. He growled under his breath, but didn't explode into profanities like you were expecting, and you gave him a surprise look. Here, we met outside, he said lowly. Uh, okay, so we're pretending that we don't know each other, you thought. Uh, yeah, we talked briefly, you added, smiling at your grandma. Oh, well, would you two like a chance to chat a little bit alone to get to know each other? She asked with a twinkle in her eye. No. Bakugo's mum clouted Bakugo over the head. Yes. He seethed through his gritted teeth. Wanting to avoid the same treatment from your mum, you just nodded and stood up, and Bakugo followed you reluctantly out of the room. Okay, so what's the deal you got going with your folks? You asked him, once you were out of earshot of the parents. Huh? He asked rudely. Yo, chill, would you just ask a question? He said with an eye roll. You getting paid to fake day me? None of your business. He snapped, crossing his arms and staring you down. Okay, fine, he replied sharply. But hey, if you want your reward, then we gotta make it look like we're hitting it off for the next six months. Bakugo narrowed his eyes at you, but remained silent, so you continued talking. So, let's make some ground rules. He nodded. Okay, no hand holding, no kissing, no touching. The hell? He said with a shocked look on his face. How the hell am I supposed to convince my aunt? I mean, people. We're dating. If I need to stay the hell away from you. You thought a moment. Uh, okay. Hand holding is okay. And appropriate touching, you added, narrowing your eyes at him. Fine, he said, extending his hand. Shake on it. You shook his hand. <laughs> it's a good thing that this only has to happen around family and not all day. I'd die otherwise, you said with a laugh. I guess I could be stuck with someone worse. He mumbled softly, looking away from you before turning around and walking back to the room. You stood there dumbfound. Wait, what? The next day at school, you came barreling through the door as usual and ran headfirst into someone. Oh! You grunted as you fell backwards, your backside hitting the ground sharply before your hands had time to catch you. Oh, my apologies. A velvet voice said to you. You looked up. It was Todoroki. Oh, you gasped, his heterochromic eyes looking down at you. Are you okay? He asked as he extended a hand to you. You took it and he helped you up, placing one hand on your side to steady you. Your body suddenly went hot. Do you need to go to the nurse's office? I can help you, he said softly, his beautiful face merely inches from yours. Ah, no, 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 I'm, <laughs> I'm okay, you stammered nervously, your attention still keenly on where his hand was placed on you. Oi, a sharp voice called. You looked to see who it was. It was Bakugo. Ah, uh, good morning, you irate blonde pufferfish. You chirped at him as he approached you. He grabbed you by your shirt and tore you away from Todoroki's hand, making the jewel-haired heartthrob watch you be dragged away with an almost surprised look on his face. The hell's your problem, dude? You growled at Bakugo. Listen, we need to pretend that we're getting to know each other and looking like we like each other. Bakugo said lowly, looking around. What? Why? You asked. No one from our families is here, so we don't need to pretend at school. Wrong. My auntie will be attending this class as a kind of substitute teacher thing. Bakugo growled. She's doing this to watch us. Why is she so invested? You blurted out. Because, never mind. Bakugo said, averting his eyes. Just do it, okay? Well, you're going to have to tell me at some point, but I'll let you off for now. You huffed, spinning on your heels and heading back to the classroom. 
Bakugo scowled and followed, entering the classroom just behind you. Hey, is something going on with you and Bakugo? Mina asked suddenly at lunchtime. You almost choked on your sushi roll. Good, Mina. <coughs> Warn me next time you say something like that. She laughed. No, but I'm serious. You two came into classroom together this morning. So? And you weren't yelling at each other? She added, eyeing you suspiciously. I can promise you, me and the face of hostility have nothing going on. Who would want anything to do with that guy anyway? You snorted. Later that afternoon, Aizawa introduced a middle-aged lady to the class. Okay, you lot, he said in a very bored tone. This is May Wakuna. She'll be observing this class for the next few months. Bakugo kicked your chair and you flinched, wanting to give him an angry glare but refraining from turning around. I look forward to getting to know all of you much better, Mrs Wakuna said brightly. I'm sure you're all amazing heroes in training with no ulterior motives, she added, accenting certain words in her speech. You furrowed your brows in confusion at her. Who's she referring to exactly? Is this Bakugo's auntie? She looked directly at you and glared slightly before brightening again. What the heck? You sat up slightly from your slumped position. Did she just glare at me? That day after school, you waited in the locker room for Bakugo, then grabbed him by the arm as he went to walk past and dragged him off to a quiet spot in the school hall. Okay, talk, you rabid sea urchin, you said angrily. What's the deal with devil lady who came in today? Is she your auntie? The hell? Don't have to tell you anything. Don't try me, you growled. Something is going on and I need to know what's up. If I'm supposed to be somehow involved in this, then I want all the details. You glared at him as his ruby red eyes bore back into yours. He scowled. Fine. We need to go somewhere where we won't be overheard, he said, looking around suspiciously. He took you by the wrist and led you to a place at the back of the school, away from everything. Okay, listen up, because I'm only going to say this once. He growled. You nodded and waited. He sighed angrily. My auntie has the power to freeze all of our assets and inheritance. If I screw this up, which I won't, we could be in for a hard time. She told my mum if she finds out that our supposed relationship isn't real, she'll blow the whistle on us and it'll all be over. Your jaw dropped. You serious? You asked. He clenched his jaw and nodded stiffly, looking away from you. Man, my, my reason is so simple compared to yours, he said with a forced laugh. Why, um, my grandma has cancer. We've been told that she has six months left to live. She wanted me to meet you and hopefully date you because it would make her happy. Your eyes fell to the floor. That's why I'm doing this. Bakugo looked back at you, his face softening slightly, although you never saw it because you were still looking at the floor. It's news to me, he grunted. I didn't know she was sick. You nodded, head still down. Yeah, okay, well, let's just make this look as as possible for now, he grumbled. All we have to do is just make it look like we're nice to each other. Gotcha, you replied, giving him a double thumbs up and turning away. You still weren't up to looking him in the eye at that point. Your heart was still heavy from thinking about Grandma. Hey, Mum, you called as you sat on the lounge. I had a talk to Fakey 180 and we're going to do our best to pretend we're going out. Jin, that's fantastic, your mum squealed. Grandma will be so pleased. Yay, go me, you replied sarcastically. I have a fake boyfriend now. I'm winning at life. Well, it's better than a body pillow boyfriend, your mum jeered. Yeah, well, at least a body pillow boyfriend won't talk smack about me and will actually smile at me, like, constantly, creepily constantly, because it can't not smile, you know? You said in a deadpan voice, looking at her. I don't ask for much in life. You are a strange child, Yin, your mum said, shaking her head. The next day started normally enough. You fell out of bed, stubbed your toe on the desk chair as you stumbled past it, Dropped a plate in the kitchen, smashed everywhere, you got yelled at, all the standard stuff. But you made it to class on time. You entered the room and smiled at Mina, who was talking to Jiro. She stopped talking when she saw you, and both girls fell silent. Yo! <laughs> What's up? You asked with a nervous chuckle as you approached them. Uh, Yin, can we talk to you for a sec? Mina asked with a hesitant smile. Sure, you said suspiciously. We, um, heard rumours that you and Bakugo might be dating, Mina said with a confused look on her face. Your mouth fell open. Man, 
we haven't even told anyone about this. Who would be saying, ah, uh, wait, devil auntie. You were about to say something when an arm was slung across your shoulders and a figure appeared beside you. Jira, we're dating. We're offered extras. A gruff voice that could only be Bakugo said from beside you. You whipped your head to the side and stared at him. He looked back at you with a very serious look on his face. You were about to push his arm off and punch him when you spied Devil Auntie watching from the hallway through the classroom door. Ah, uh, yeah, we are, you replied through gritted teeth. Now get your arm off me, you growled, glancing at Bakugo from the corner of your eye. Bakugo clicked his tongue against his teeth and removed his arm, marching off to his desk and plopping down. Mina and Jiro were just gawking at you silently. You looked at them, and then your eyes found Todoroki's in the distance. Your heart sank. Ah, oh, great, now cute two-tone prince thinks I'm taken by Blasty McSparkle. Fantastic. Yeah, actually, I've never seen you two hold hands or anything, Jiro said as she looked at you suspiciously. Ah, uh, it's just really early days for us, he said with a nervous laugh. <laughs> Give us a break. Jiro cocked an unamused eyebrow at you. Yeah, still don't buy it, she added dryly. You sighed dramatically. Ugh, fine. Hey, hot-headed prickle, you called to Bakugo. He turned and shot you a dirty look. These girls want proof we're dating, you said with a so what are you going to do about it look on your face. I told you we're dating, yeah? Bakugo snapped at Mina and Jiro. Yeah, we heard you, Jiro said bluntly. But where's the affection? Bakugo's scowl deepened. Oi, walking disaster. Come here, he said looking at you with his sharp crimson eyes. What's he going to do? I told him no kissing. I hope no kissing. I'm going to slap him if he tries to kiss me. Hesitantly, you approached him. Give me a hand, babe, he said lowly. To everyone else, it sounded sweet, but you were so close you could literally feel the effort he had to put into getting that word babe out without gagging. You thrust your hand out as if to give him a handshake, and he took your hand roughly and manoeuvred it so that you were holding hands like a couple would. There. He snapped at Jiro. Happy now? Hmm, guess, she said, not particularly impressed with his display. Ah, uh, I wanted a kiss, Mina pouted. Oh my god, she actually ships it? You cringed. Just then, Todoroki walked in, and you yanked your hand away. Ah, uh, thanks baby, that was nice. Yeah, you rambled quickly, running your words together so that they would be indistinguishable as you dropped your head and power walked to your desk, then sat down. Bakugo sat down in his chair behind you, and you heard him whisper to you, Oi, what's that about? You didn't reply, and just kept looking down at your desk. After a few seconds, you hesitantly glanced up and over at Todoroki, just to see if he was looking at you, and you saw that he was, indeed, watching you, so you looked away quickly. Class is starting now, find your seats before I lose what little patience I have left, Aizawa said from the front, just suddenly appearing there as if he materialised from thin air. How does he do that? We're doing sports practice with your quirks today, he said in the most bored tone you'd ever heard. Soccer. There was a mixture of groans and whoops of excitement throughout the class. The groans coming from those who are not particularly good at sports, you being one of them. Okay, get changed into your sports uniform and get out on the field. Another teacher will be there. I'm going to sleep, he said promptly before walking out of the room. What? Man, that was quick. You laughed internally at how desperately your homeroom teacher just wanted to take a goddamn nap. Soccer with quirks was an interesting ordeal. Some of the quirks were perfect for soccer, some were not, and Bakugo got red carded in the first five seconds for trying to blast anyone who came near the round white and black thing in the middle of the field. He sat the rest of the game out. You did spectacularly terrible, as usual, and even face-planted right in front of Todoroki, which was just splendid. He helped you up, like the gentleman he was, so that was a silver lining to your smackdown, I guess. At the end of sports class, the teacher in charge commissioned you and Todoroki to pack the soccer ball and goal nets away, so after getting tangled in one and nearly cutting the circulation off your pinky finger, you finally got the net down and folded it as best you could, if you could even call it folding. You walked into the shed right behind Todoroki and put the net down next to where he had put his. Hey, um... So I know we haven't spoken much, he said to him, wanting to make conversation but not really knowing how. Um, but apparently our families know each other. Ugh, Yin, seriously, that's the opening line you're going for? You berated internally. 
Yes, I know. He replied in a soft, monotone voice. I asked about you. Your heart jumped in your chest. You, you asked about me? You stuttered as he turned to face you. His beautiful heterochromic eyes flashing in the dim light that was flooding in from the shed door, capturing his blue eye and making it sparkle. You were mesmerised. Yes, he nodded. I feel like we've met before. Your heart skipped a beat. He was gorgeous. You couldn't take your eyes off him. The same here, he replied. Do you, um, do you think we maybe met when we were little? Todoroki opened his mouth to say something, but just as he was about to speak, you saw a shadow fall across him, and he looked past you to the door. You turned around to see who it was, and Bakugo was standing there. What are you doing with my girlfriend? He seethed at Todoroki. Last time I checked, she didn't have your name on her. Todoroki said back coolly. I can talk to her if I want. She's free to talk to me too. Bakugo growled and stalked into the sports shed, grabbing you by the arm and dragging you out. Let go of me, you bitter melon. You seethed. Can't be alone with him in the shed. What's that going to look like? Bakugo snapped back at you. Who cares? You retorted. This is all fake anyway. It's just stupid. Oi, he hissed. Keep your voice down. Why? You yelled. You have the hots for icy hot, don't you? Bakugo snapped at you, changing subjects quickly. Uh, I, I don't know. You snorted, stammering with embarrassment. Then why are you wasting your time talking to him? Bakugo replied, crossing his arms and raising an eyebrow. You're just jealous, Katsuki. You huffed. <laughs> As if, he replied, spinning on his heels and marching off. I'm walking you home today, so don't freaking move until I'm there with you. He called back over his shoulder. You just stared at him as he walked off, hands shoved deeply into his pockets. Ah, uh, what the hell kind of a mess is my life right now? Mom, my life is ruined, so I'm going to change my name and move to the Bahamas. You screamed as you entered the house after school that day. Ugh, the theatrics. Your mum sighed as she walked from the study room and out into the hall. What happened now, child? School finished a minute late and you had to sit in class for a whole minute longer? No one understands my life. You moaned. Your mum laughed. No. What happened? Tell me. Okay, well, you know how fake boyfriend and I were going to do the fakey thing? You said with flamboyant arm movements. Yeah. Your mum replied dubiously. Yeah, well, now we legit have to do the fakey datey thing because his auntie's watching us like a hawk and I'm pretty sure she is the one who spread the rumours about us being together. Wait, what? Auntie? What auntie? Your mum said, confused. Ugh. Okay, so TLDR, Bakugo's auntie is the devil and she's going to freeze her income if she finds out that we're fake dating? What's it to her though? Your mum asked, still not following. I have no idea what her angle is, you groaned with exasperation. All I know is that I'm stuck with the physical manifestation of a urinary tract infection when all I want to do is get to know Doki Doki Todoroki. Wait, Todoroki? We know the Todoroki family well, your mum said. Do you have a Todoroki boy in your class? Who is it? Toya? Natsuo? Shoto? What? You screamed. We know the family? Why didn't you tell me this earlier? I made it up. But it's legit. Um, I didn't realise it was that important. Your mum laughed, holding her arms up in defence. Well, how do we know them? You asked, putting your bag down. Through business, your dad and Engie have had a lot to do with each other over the years. Ugh, I need a drink. You said, turning stiffly and walking to the fridge. After pouring yourself something, you sat down and took a sip. Okay, would I have met any of these boys before? You asked. Your mum nodded. Yes, at a few engagements, actually. At my auntie's wedding that I was a flower girl for? You asked. Your mum thought a moment. Yeah, I think they were there. But if I remember correctly, not all the kids came. Maybe just one or two came. Which one or two came? You asked, staring your mum down in earnest. Whoa, Detective Yin on the case? Your mum laughed. I can't remember. Why? Do we have any photos of the day? You continued. Yes, in an album somewhere? Your mum said, still amused at your sudden change of focus. Where is the album? You asked, standing up. Upstairs in my cupboard? She replied. Thanks and bye, you said quickly, taking your drink and bolting upstairs. If you spill drink on my carpet, your mum threatened as you dashed out of sight. For the next four hours, you trawled through album after album, trying to find pictures from your auntie's wedding, but you came up short. There was no evidence at all. 
You sighed. Oh, am I thinking too much into this? What if that dream never happened? Or what if it didn't happen? Or what if it did happen, but with someone else and not Shoto Todoroki? You closed the last album and put it away, standing up to leave. Wait, but in the dream, that boy gave me a ring. What if I find the ring? If I have the ring, then the dream has to be correct, right? You turned and went to your room, walking to your cupboard and immediately ripping objects out in a frantic search. A good hour later, you pulled out a pretty flower band that you recognised immediately as the band that you wore on the day of the wedding. You smiled at it fondly, grateful that you'd kept it all this time. You reached up and put it on your head. Looking in the mirror, you did a twirl, the band falling off your head and onto the floor in the process. A small item bounced out of it and you gasped. Ah, damn, I've broken it. You frowned. Then you took a proper look at the object. It was a small ring. You gasped. Oh my god. Oh my god, it's real! You screamed. You bent down and picked the ring up, turning it over as you looked at it. You looked around and found your old jewellery box, and, pulling out a chain, you slipped the ring onto it and then put the chain around your neck, clipping it closed. There. Now I have the ring with me at all times, you thought, smiling down at it before tucking it inside your shirt. Oi, a gruff voice said from behind you as you almost reached the gates of UA. You turned around. Ah, well if it isn't my bipolar bomb of a fake boyfriend, you said cheerfully. What can I do for you on this fine morning? Keep my distance with pleasure, you said loudly, turning and walking away. He grabbed your wrist. Listen here, you freaking disaster, he said, glancing at the state of your hair. We need to make this legit, so shut up or I'll blast your ass into next week. You pouted angrily but didn't say anything. Fix your damn hair, he scowled, letting go of your wrist. I've tried, you snapped, but my hair tie is doing the thing. Pass it here, Bakugo grunted. Exploding it isn't going to be any help, you angry nugget, you said with a scowl. Turn around, he ordered, and you handed him the tie. You obeyed and turned your back to him. Uncharacteristically tenderly, Bakugo raked his fingers through your hair and plaited it down one side, doing a diagonal plait to the opposite side of the bottom of your skull and used the tie to finish it off. There, now you don't look like crap, he said nonchalantly as he brushed past you and marched to class. You gently patted your hair to feel his work. Damn, son, the boy's got skills. You followed slowly behind, walking to the classroom. Yin, Mina gasped. Your hair's beautiful. You actually put effort in? She laughed. No, actually, Gordon Ramsay with a quirk did it for me, you said, glancing over at Bakugo, who had his back to you at that point. Mina laughed. Okay, I know you two are supposed to be dating, but you don't use any endearing terms? Nah, we get off teasing each other, you said with a shrug. At the end of school, you waited for Bakugo at the gates. Aw, waiting for your boyfriend, Mina teased. Uh, I wish I could tell them this is killing my life. Yup, he replied bluntly. Because who wouldn't want a blonde sparkler to walk them home? Mina snorted. I have no idea how many names you have on tap for him, but let's see how long this book goes for and see if you can keep it up for the entire time. Book? You asked. Uh, never mind, babe. Enjoy the Baku boy, she said with a bright smile and a wave as she ran off. You grunted. Oi. Bakugo's deep voice drew your attention as he walked up beside you. My auntie's stalking me. We need to walk home together to satisfy her for now. You looked back behind him and saw her duck down behind a bush. Ah, yep, she has the subtlety of a freight train. You snorted with amusement and turned back to Bakugo. Okay, let's go, you added, promptly walking off. You walked together in silence for a bit before he spoke. So what's his stupid quirk anyway? Yes, you replied. Huh? Yes, my quirk is stupidity and I have nailed it perfectly, he said proudly. A smirk pulled at Bakugo's lips, but he looked away so you couldn't see it. As annoying as this chick is, her carefree attitude's refreshing, he thought. Yeah, I know that. What's your actual quirk, though? He asked, genuine curiosity in his voice. Hypergravity, you replied without looking at him. It's the opposite of Eurarica's quirk. She makes things float, I make things heavy. How's it work? He grunted. You reached out and touched him. Suddenly, it was as if he had had a ton of bricks thrown onto him, and he crumpled to the ground, unable to move or lift a finger. Forget Bitch, get your quirk off me, he gasped, even his breathing becoming heavy. 
The best thing about this quirk is I can manipulate it with my emotions, he said happily, thinking happy thoughts and watching as Bakugo was able to lift himself slightly as he felt the immense weight relieved slightly. When I think happy thoughts, I can lighten the force, but if I think bad or angry thoughts, he shrank back down to the ground again with a groan as the air was forced from his lungs. Turn it off, he snarled through ragged breaths. You need to sing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star to get it to deactivate. He slowly turned his head and glared at you, looking to see your face to determine if you were serious or joking. You stood there, straight faced. He hesitated. I'm kidding, you cackled and reached out to touch him, deactivating the quirk instantly. He collapsed to the ground and gasped for air, his airways finally free to take deep breaths. Good quirk, huh? You pried, looking for a little recognition. He just glared at you with his piercing red eyes. Before you ask how I got into UA, I'm not smart, but I scored high in the entrance exam. I froze a fair number of robots on the spot and they couldn't move. I even managed to crush one completely because I got mad that it could still move after I had applied my quirk. You laughed. So that's why you're borderline bipolar. Bakugo commented. Me? What does that relate to? Being able to manipulate your quirk with your emotions. He added. I prefer hypermobile emotional fluidity, but whatever blows your goat, I guess, you said, waiting for him to get up. Finally, he lifted himself up and you both continued on. You made idle chat as you continued, and although he wasn't an amazing conversationalist, he eased up slightly on the harsh words and you found that you had some movies and music in common. All too soon, you got to your house. Uh, thanks for walking me home, you said stiffly as you got to the front door of your place. Just doing what a boyfriend would do. He replied dismissively as he turned sharply to head down the street. See ya. He added with a raised hand, not bothering to look back at you. You shook your head and walked inside. A few weeks went by and Bakugo and you had not really made a lot of progress, but you made the occasional attempt to look affectionate. Your main objective was to talk to Todoroki as much as humanly possible. Todoroki was quiet, but a sweetheart. And you loved that he didn't back down whenever your dyspepsic golden retriever ended up on scene and tried to get between you. One afternoon, Mina and Jiro were on your case particularly hard when you couldn't hold it in anymore. Okay, okay, listen, I have something to tell you, you said in a harsh whisper, looking around. The classroom was empty, as it was lunchtime, and the three of you had ended up back there because it was hot outside. Bakuho and I aren't really dating, we're just pretending, you said lowly with a sigh. What? They both shrieked. Shh, you hissed. Keep it down. But why? Mina hissed. Why are you faking? Oh, it's a long story, you sighed. We both have reasons. For me, I only need to do this for six months. For him, I don't know, not my problem. Jiro nodded. Well, we're here for you, yeah. We're your friends. You can count on us if you need anything. Mina slung her arm across Jiro's shoulders. Yeah, same goes for me too, she said with her signature brilliant smile. Thanks, guys, you said with a relieved sigh. But please keep it on the DL. Ah, uh, gotcha, Mina replied with thumbs up and a wink. You smiled. Oh, hey, by the way, we have swimming carnival coming up, Mina said with a grin. Swimming carnival, you screeched. I don't do swimming carnivals. Oh, come on, babe, we need you. You don't need to be good at it, we just need participants. You groaned. Uh, I guess I do owe you one for keeping my secret, you grumbled, looking down at the ground. Oh, that's the spirit, she squealed. It's in two weeks, so we have lots of time to practice. Ugh, great. Swimming. You groaned internally as you walked home alone. Maybe I could ask Todoroki to help me out. He has an ice quirk. It's like water. Solid water. You pulled the ring on the necklace out from your shirt and looked at it. Oh, I really hope he was the boy who gave me this. The day had come. Swimming carnival day. You had practiced a few times with Mina and the other girls and had actually managed to back out of all of the swimming races except for the relay race at the end of the day. You were hoping that by that point some people would have left for the day, but unfortunately the stands were still packed with spectators, all cheering for the relay teams. You hadn't gotten a chance to ask Todoroki for help with swimming because Bakugo kept cutting in, but you felt like you might be okay to do this one lap without looking like a complete idiot. Mina and Jiro had been really good teachers. After lunch, you all headed to the poolside to determine your positions. Okay, Yin, I'll go first, Mina said. Then Jiro will do the next stretch. Then she pointed at Jiro. 
and then you and then Eureka. Okay, Eureka, you're gonna have to save my ass because I am not a fast swimmer and you better be fast because I'm gonna be slow, you said, looking at her and laughing nervously. It'll be fine, she said in a bubbly voice. We can do it, girls. Mina and Eureka were pumped. Jiro was indifferent and you just wanted the ground to swallow you up. You looked around and up into the stands to see both Todoroki and Bakugo were sitting there, leaning forwards with forearms on their knees, watching you intently. You grimaced and walked to the end of the pool that you would be starting from. Oh, can this get any more embarrassing? You thought as you saw both boys' eyes follow you. You stood behind Mina and waited nervously as the officiator got ready to ring the start bell. The crowd started cheering and yelling out words of encouragement as they sensed the start of the race drawing near. Mina hopped up onto the block and bent down to get ready, fingertips just over the top of the starter platform. Suddenly the bell rang and she sprung from the board, taking off into the water at lightning speed. You looked down the line at the other girls that had jumped in too. Wow, Mina's a good swimmer. We're well ahead, you thought as you watched them go. Mina touched the opposite end of the pool and Jiro dove in. Oh crap, I'm next. Jiro was powering along, still ahead of the other teams. Okay, I just need to hold this lead. She approached your end and you stepped up onto the block and crouched slightly, ready to jump in. Her hand touched the pool wall and you sprung forwards, hitting the water sharply. Okay, so not the most graceful entry, but what else is new? Furiously you poured at the water, kicking as fast as you could. Okay, rhythm, rhythm, find the rhythm. You tried to steady your breathing and settle into a good stroke pattern, but just as you were about to get into some kind of rhythm, you felt a searing pain rip through your right calf. Ah, oh, what the, oh cramp, oh my god, seriously, now? You tried to keep going, but the pain disabled your lower half, and you stopped mid-stroke to reach back and grab onto your lower leg. Taking one last deep breath, you sunk <gasps> under the surface of the water as you curled around to hold onto your leg. Suddenly, strong arms grabbed you and pulled you up to the surface. Your rescuer was kicking furiously to drag you to the side of the pool and out of everyone's way. Vaguely, you saw a flash of red when you half squinted an eye open, but there was so much splashing you shut them again. Two teachers grabbed you from your rescuer's arms when you reached the side of the pool and hauled you out, taking you straight to the nurse's office for an assessment. Was that Todoroki that saved me? I saw red. At the nurse's office, they gave you some medicine to relieve the cramp and a towel to dry yourself with. Mina came to check on you and then went to get your clothes, and you thanked her when she returned and went to the change room to change into your dry outfit. Hey, um, did you see who it was that pulled me out of the pool? You asked her while you were changing. She had taken a seat outside the change room. Uh, yeah, you didn't see who it was? She asked quizzically. No, I had my eyes shut, you said with a sigh. But I did open them once and I saw red. Was it Todoroki? Mina laughed. Why would Todoroki have jumped in? Wait, so it wasn't him? You asked slightly sadly. Of course not, she snorted. It was your boyfriend. Wait, Bakugo? You yelled. Why? I don't know, babe. You might be faking this relationship, but I think there's more to it on his side. <laughs> As if, you retorted. No, I'm serious, she said. He wouldn't just jump in and save anyone. Yeah, but his auntie was probably watching, so he felt obligated, he replied dismissively. I don't know if she was there, Mina said. I didn't see her. Yeah, she's probably hiding, he said nonchalantly, playing it off. It doesn't mean anything. You finished getting changed and walked out, looking down at your uniform to fix it up a bit. There was a knock on the door, so Mina got up to answer it. Hey, the voice said, is you okay? Oh, yes, back you go, she's fine. You looked up. He was looking past Mina to you. You scowled slightly. I'm fine, you grunted. He snapped gruffly and turned away, walking off down the hall. Yen, Mina hissed. You need to thank him. I do not. You hiss back. I don't owe him any thanks. If it weren't for him, you'd still be on the bottom of the pool, she snorted playfully. Just go and say thank you. It won't kill you. It might. Am I really willing to take that risk? You said with a cheeky raised eyebrow. Just do it, she sighed, walking behind you and pushing you out the door. You could see Bakugo walking away in the distance, so you called out. Oi! You screamed at him down the empty hallway. He turned around. What? He yelled back. He was too far away for you to yell thank you, and you didn't want to embarrass yourself like that, so you started walking towards him so you could say it in a quieter fashion and not draw attention to yourself, should anybody else enter the hallway at that moment. 
Ugh, man, he walks so quick. Why is he so far away already? This is super awkward, him just watching me walk towards him. I should do a little jog. No, that'll look stupid too. Maybe a power walk? By the time you got to him, you were more angry at the length of time that had lapsed than anything else. Why do you have to walk so far away? You huffed. Is that what you came to tell me? He snapped, urged that you had stopped him walking to complain that he had walked too far away. No, you snapped back, averting your eyes before launching into your lengthy gratitude. Thank you, you mumbled. There, buddy, that's all you get. Huh? Don't ha me, you overgrown hedgehog, you said, your angry, embarrassed eyes meeting his. Stupid girl. Why'd you agree to go to the swim after eating lunch anyway? He growled. Because they needed me, you said with a scowl. Look, all I came to say was thank you, okay? You looked away angrily again. He looked at you for a moment, taking in your features. I had to do it anyway, he said. I was supposed to be your boyfriend, remember? Yeah, I thought that would have been the case, you said, annoyed at yourself for thanking him when your suspicions of him doing it out of obligation and not compassion were confirmed. You turned and walked away, leaving Bakugo standing there watching you go. Can't even freaking figure this chick out, Bakugo thought with a scowl. The next day after school, you were placed on cleanup duty. You sighed as you moved all the tables and chairs aside and swept the floor. You'd been teamed up with Kaminari, but he had disappeared before the end of school, leaving you to do all the work. You had almost finished sweeping when a voice at the door stopped you mid-sweep. Do you need some help, Yin? A velvety voice asked. You looked up and your eyes met two beautiful heterochromic ones. Oh, a Todoroki. Uh, um, um. You didn't get a chance to get a proper sentence out before he had put his bag down and started rolling his sleeves up awaiting instruction. His perfect toned arms drew your attention and you had to bite your lip as he walked up to you and stopped. He was so close that you could hear his soft breathing. What do you need me to do? He asked slowly. Would saying take me right here on the desk be too forward? You thought as you hesitantly looked up into his face. Um, uh, here, let me finish the sweeping. He offered, stretching his hand out to take the broom from you, his hands settling on top of yours. You retracted your hand quickly and scratched your cheek nervously. Oh, my apologies, Yin. He said lowly. Did my touch make you uncomfortable? No, 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 not at all. I, I, I liked it, you blurted out, then immediately face palmed. Oh, wait, I mean, Todoroki smirked slightly. That's fine, he said, walking past you to continue sweeping. So, you and Bakugo, he added as he passed you. And we're not really together, you blurted out before gasping and covering your mouth. I know, he said casually. Wait, what? You said, spinning around to look at him. I don't know the reasons behind why you're faking a relationship, but I can tell it's not real, he said, sweeping the floor gently without looking at you. You studied the side of his beautiful face as he worked, still not looking at you. Plus, you have much better taste in guys, he added. Your heart jumped and you chuckled nervously. He looked up at you. I'm glad you're okay after yesterday. I was about to dive in, but then that idiot beat me to it. <laughs> I wish it was you that had jumped in, you grumbled, looking away in annoyance. Then you realised what you'd said, and your eyes snapped back to his curious ones. Oh, um, <clears throat> I mean, like, well, um, you've got a water-based quirk, so you would have been a better swimmer, and... Yin, you absolute walnut, what on God's green earth were you thinking? Saying something so bold like that out loud? You berated internally. Todoroki just seemed to accept your reason without a word of reply and immediately went back to sweeping. Ooh, it's a bit too much, I guess, you thought with a grimace. Hey, um, Todoroki, could you keep it quiet that Bakugo and I are faking, please? You asked softly. Of course, Yin, yeah. he said, looking back up at you softly before going back to work. Changing subjects slightly, you made small talk about quirks and other things as you continued to clean side by side. Just being in the same room as this gorgeous guy made your heartbeat pound in your chest and you were glad you got to have some time alone to chat and get to know each other a little more. After finishing with the cleaning, Todoroki walked with you to the gates and then you parted ways, heading home. Mum, I'm in love, organise the wedding for tomorrow, you yelled as you walked through the door that evening. You've fallen in love with Bakugo? She asked as she looked up from where she, what she was doing in the kitchen. What? No. That's some dairy grenade? I don't think so, you snorted. She laughed. Well, who is it then? Shoto Todoroki, he said with a dreamy sigh. He's so gorgeous. Ah, the Shoto child, your mum replied with a smirk. 
I remember him. Two different coloured eyes and white slash red hair parted down the middle. It was very cute, even as a child. Oh, that's him. He sighed again with a bit of a sing-song voice. I'm pretty sure he was the kid that came with his parents to your auntie's wedding, she said nonchalantly. You walked over and slammed your hands down on the bench in front of your mum. Mum, you said sharply with an acute inhale through your nose. I need to see the album from the wedding now. Why are you so hell-bent on finding out if he was at your auntie's wedding, she said with a laugh. Because he could be my one true love, that's why. Child, where did you get this dramatic flair from? She asked with a chuckle and a tired sigh. Oh, God. Listen, okay, I'll ring your auntie. She would definitely have the album at her place if it isn't here. Well, I know it's definitely not here, you said. I tore your room apart looking for it. Yes, I know, because I had to clean it up, your mum said with a sigh. Oh, okay, let me ring her and ask. She pulled out her mobile and rang your auntie. Hey, just me. I have a very desperate girl here who claims her one true love went to your wedding and she needs to see the album to find him or she'll die. Your mum said bluntly, looking you dead in the eyes she spoke to your auntie. There was a pause and then your mum laughed. Okay, great. Thank you. You've saved me from arranging a funeral. I'll send her over. Your eyes lit up and you squealed loudly while your mum waved her hand at you to try and get you to calm down. Okay, okay. No worries. Thank you again. Bye, your mum said before hanging up the phone. She said she has the... Oh my God, thank you so much. You're amazing. I love you. You screamed at your mum as you tried to hug her over the bench, dropping your bag on the floor in the process. Okay, calm down. Your auntie's expecting you go, she said with a shooing motion of hand. You're the best. I'll give you front row seats at the wedding. You shouted as you raced out the door. I'm the mother of the bride. Of course I get front row seats. You heard her yell in reply as the front door slammed closed behind you. You got to your auntie's place in no time flat and tried to push the door open to run inside but didn't quite time the turning of the handle and the pushing of the door at the same time and ended up just running face first into the door. I'm here! You yelled as you finally entered. Yes, I heard you imprint your face into my wooden door, your auntie's dry reply came, drifting from the study. You followed where her voice came from and found her pulling out the albums. I love you, I love you! You squealed as you walked in and picked up one, opening it and scanning the pictures. Who exactly are we looking for? Your auntie asked. I'll help. Little kid, red and white hair, two different coloured eyes, one blue, one grey. You listed authoritatively as you continued to flick through the pages. So far the book that you had picked up was the pre-wedding pictures of your auntie getting ready in the morning with the bridesmaids and you. Okay, this is the wrong book, you said, putting it down and picking up another. I have the attendance in the garden album, your auntie said. Yes, I kind of remember it being like a gardenish setting, you replied, holding your hand out to her. Can I have a look, please? She nodded and handed it to you. You started at the beginning and started scanning through the photos, muttering red and white as your eyes flicked over the pictures. Suddenly you spotted him. <gasps> there! You gasped loudly, pointing to a picture. There he is! Your voice was so shrill it shocked your auntie, and she nearly dropped the other album that she had picked up. She looked over to where your finger was planted firmly onto the page. It was the back of a little boy's head, but he definitely had the red hair on one side and the white hair on the other. Yep, well, that definitely matches your description, your auntie said with a laugh. Is this where we say case closed? Mm, not quite, you mumbled. I need to see if I can find a picture of him and I together, or... You reached into your shirt and pulled out the ring on the necklace. Find a picture of him holding this ring. Did he give that to you? Your auntie asked curiously. Yeah, he did. Well, that's what I remember, anyway. Okay, well, I'll help, your auntie said, turning her attention back to the album in hand. I'm pretty sure it happened in the garden, you added, still flicking through the album in front of you. There was silence as you both looked through your respective books. You found a few more pictures of Todoroki with his parents, but none of him on his own or with you, and certainly none with him and the ring. <sighs> Well, I have half a bit of evidence, you thought as you came to the end of the album. The last few pictures in the album were group photos with the bride and groom, and you were about to close the book and move to the next one when you saw a group shot with all the kids in it. You looked. There you were in your flower girl outfit standing next to Todoroki. Your heart skipped a beat as you stared at the photo. Then a little blonde boy standing on the other side of you in the picture drew your attention. Auntie? Who's that? You asked, pointing to the blonde boy. She looked over. 
Oh, um, I'm not sure, but if you pull the photo out, I've written the names of everyone on the back and their connections to us, she said with a laugh. There were so many random people at the wedding that day, I had to ask relatives who everyone was. You pulled the photo out and flipped it over, scanning the names. Todoroki Shoto, Lin Yin, Bakugo Katsuki. No, you screamed. No, your auntie laughed. What's no? Your dead, soulless eyes slowly looked up and met hers. That blonde kid is Bakugo. And? she asked. Okay, well, first of all, what the heck is he doing there? And second, you turned the picture back over and pointed to his hand that was half open. Your auntie looked where you were pointing. Oh, it's the same ring as what's around your neck. That can't be right, you said almost lifelessly, like your whole life was now a lie. I, I was so sure it was Todoroki. Well, you did remember what he looked like. You knew the description, your auntie pressed. Yeah, but that's only because I go to school with him now. In the dream I keep having of what happened that day, I can't remember what he looked like. All I can remember is his smile. And it was an amazing smile, you said dreamily. There is no way that Bakugo gave me that ring as a child. It's basically impossible. Mm, so why does he have the ring here, though? Your auntie said with a raised eyebrow, pointing to the picture. I don't know, you wailed, but I'm going to find out once and for all. The next day at school, you were on the warpath. Well, detective path, to be more precise, but you looked aggressive. Yo, Mina greeted you. You look like you're about to stab someone. I am, you said purposefully. I'm either going to stab someone, or I'm about to get stabbed in the heart with some truth that I don't want to hear. Girl, I do not understand you, but I support you, so go do your thing, Mina said as she plopped down in her seat, getting ready to start the school day. You walked over to your seat and sat down, glancing back at the door occasionally to see if Bakugo had arrived yet. Soon enough, he sauntered in with his bag slung over his shoulder and dropped it by his desk as he sat down. Oi, good morning, girlfriend, he muttered as his backside hit his seat. Okay, you listen here, anger on a stick. We need to talk in the first break, so meet me in the equipment shed, you said, spinning around in your seat to face him. He says I need to do what you say, he snapped, scowling at you. It's important, you said, narrowing your eyes at him. Fine, he grunted settling back in his seat, closing his eyes while placing his arms up behind his head. First break came, and you got up from your seat and made a beeline out the door, down to the equipment shed, and waited for Bakugo. You walked to the furthest end inside the small shed and sat down on a pile of gym mats, waiting for him to arrive. It didn't take long before his form blackened the doorway and you sharply told him to come inside. It's so important, he grunted as he sat down opposite you. Um... Oh crap, I haven't even thought about how to ask this question, you thought. Um, I have a question. There was silence from him as he studied your face. You looked a mixture of concern and embarrassment, and he didn't quite know how to read that emotion. Yeah, he said lowly. What is it? Um, do you have any memory? Huh? What the hell kind of question's that? He exploded. Oh crap, that was a stupid question. No, I mean, does the word ring bring anything to mind? Bakugo looked at you. What was she saying? Does she want me to propose? What the hell? He started to blush slightly. You saw the blush before he turned his face to the side quickly. Oh, well, I know what you're talking about, but I, I don't want to bring it up just now. He said. Now it was your turn to feel that rush of blood to your face. Wait, so he remembers the ring? And the promise? You thought clearing your throat before continuing. <clears throat> so, you, um, so it, it was you? Bakugo looked at you, confused. Was me what? That made the promise? Promise what? Stop messing around, Baka Go! You fumed. You weren't in the mood for games. Oi, not messing around, he said sharply, standing up. What exactly are you talking about? You paused. Wait, so he doesn't remember? What was he talking about before then? I'm confused. You both stared at each other silently. Suddenly, the equipment door was pulled shut and locked. Wait! You yelled, jumping up to run to the door to get to whoever it was that locked it to open it up again. Bakugo must have had the same idea and had started to turn towards the door as you jumped up, 
causing you to slam into his side and knocking him off balance as you tripped over his leg and fell onto him. He had spun his top half and grabbed you as he fell backwards, cushioning your fall on his body as his back hit the mats again. Ouch, he said. That must have hurt. He grunted, slightly winded by the fall, but okay, nevertheless. You tried to push up off him, but he still had his arms wrapped protectively around you. B back you go, you, you can let me go now, you said, slightly embarrassed as your eyes adjusted to the darkness and you looked down at him. He groaned and his hold on you lessened, but you were kind of captivated by his eyes in the darkness and he didn't move. He tried to sit up and propped his torso up, dragging his arms back and leaning on his elbows, bringing his face up inches from yours. Boy, he said lowly as your face came dangerously close to one another. Your breathing hitched as you felt his hot breath on your neck and jaw. Get off. I, I, I can't, you replied. His leg came up between yours and pressed firmly between your legs, causing you to squeak a little as you jolted forwards, your nose nearly touching his. You saw him glance at your lips, then suddenly the doors flung open. Both you and Bakugo looked over at the door at the same time. Todoroki was standing there panting. Yin, I found you. Are you... He stopped. You and Bakugo were in a very uh, suggestive position, with you hovering over his body and he with his leg bent up between yours, leaning back slightly on his elbows. Oh, Todoroki, it's not what it looks like! You screamed. He just stared with his mouth ajar slightly. You tried to jump off Bakugo, but being vertically challenged, you fell and twisted your ankle on the way down, knocking over a heavy duty broom and some buckets and sending them all crashing down on top of you. Yun, you okay? Todoroki called as he raced into the shed to help you. Ah, he hissed. I think I've twisted my ankle. I oh, might arm is bruised. Hold on to me then, Todoroki commanded, wrapping an arm around you. I'll take you to the nurse's office. He helped you up and held you protectively against himself. Bakugo was too stunned to speak and just stayed in his position on the gym mats. What the hell just happened? He thought as his mind went back over the events that just transpired. Why did you suddenly look so cute leaning over him like that? The way your hair fell across your eyes? with your lips slightly parted, he'd gotten a sudden urge to lean in and kiss you. His heart had been pounding that whole time. Why didn't you get off straight away when he told you to? Why did you linger? He sighed angrily. She's just a fake girlfriend. Don't get ahead of yourself. He tried it internally. Do you need me to carry you again? Todoroki asked as you hobbled beside him, his arm still wrapped around your waist, your arm slung across his shoulder. No, no, I, I'm fine. Th thank you, Todoroki. You grimaced. Do you need a break? He asked softly as he halted and turned to you, your chest coming in contact with his, your arm still up around his neck as your proximity to him forced you to look up into his eyes. You gasped softly. The way he was looking down at you as he held you in his arms made your mouth run dry and you quickly looked away. Oh my god, I'm so close. I could kiss him. We're almost at the nurse's office, he said softly. Can you keep going? You nodded and hobbled back a bit as he resumed his position by your side. Finally, you both arrived and he sat you down on the bed. The nurse wasn't there, so he looked around in some drawers for band-aids and bandages. Todoroki, you, you don't need to do this, you said apologetically. I'll just wait for the nurse. You've done enough already. I won't hear it again. His gentle monotone voice replied, let me take care of you. Your heart fluttered. He turned around with his array of medical supplies and walked over to you, placing them down on the bed beside you. Now, let me assess you, he said authoritatively. You looked down at the arm that was throbbing and saw a few bruises that had already started to come up. Man, I'm so soft. I bruise like a damn pear, you muttered, looking down at your legs that had been marked as well. Todoroki was completely confused and just cocked his head at you. You, you don't look anything like a pair he stated you laughed it's a figure of speech he said he was still confused but accepted your answer and took your arm in his to inspect it it was slightly swollen and he activated his ice quirk and placed his hand on your arm to cool it down a little you hissed softly through your teeth it hurt but at the same time felt nice his touch was just something else you were too busy looking at your arm that you didn't realize he was looking at your face you glanced up at him and your heart skipped a beat. He had his head down, but his eyes were looking up at you. 
The way his fringe fell across his eye made him look too damn sexy, and your breathing hitched. Uh, that, that feels really nice, he whispered out. Does it, Ian? He asked in a low, raspy tone, his eyes never leaving your face. You swallowed thickly. Uh, uh-huh. Where else are you bruised? He asked, his eyes travelling down your body. You felt yourself heating up as his eyes roamed your form. I'm bruised everywhere, you said with a hollow chuckle. I bet I even have bruises on my thighs, even though I'm pretty sure nothing hit me there. You slid your high school skirt up slightly, and lo and behold, a lovely red mark that was the start of a bruise was staring back at you. See? You said with surprise. I didn't even know how that got there. Before you could stop him, Todoroki activated his right hand ice quirk again and placed it on your thigh, halfway between your hip and your knee. You'd never been touched there by a guy before and you jumped slightly. Sorry, is it too cold, Yin? Todoroki asked. You froze. No, 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 you stuttered, a runtime error stamp covering your face. You look a little flustered, Yin. Are you okay? He asked, reaching out with his left hand and brushing your fringe out of the way. He's so close, the closer he gets, the harder it is for me to breathe. He leaned in slightly, his hand still on your bare thigh, with the other hand slightly caressing your face, his blue and grey eyes peering at you intently. Just then the nurse came in. What is going on in here? She barked. You two looked like you are about to kiss, or do something else. You jumped, but Todoroki remained calm. He told of the accident that happened, and how he had brought you here, but there was no ice pack, so he had to use his quirk. The nurse could tell that his actions were innocent, and she relaxed, taking over and assessing you herself. Yin, we'll be staying here, Todoroki. You may go back to class now. Thank you for your help, the nurse said as she started bandaging your ankle. Todoroki nodded and turned to leave. I'll visit you at lunch, Yin, he said before leaving. Rest well. You nodded and looked at the nurse as he exited the room. Is my ankle broken? You asked. She laughed. No, just a sprain. You'll be up and running again in no time. After bandaging you up and putting your band-aids on your cuts and grazes, she instructed you to lie down and rest, which you did gratefully. All the adrenaline from the morning's happenings had you sapped of energy and you fell asleep instantly. Todoroki knocked softly on the door at lunchtime and slid the door open. The nurse wasn't there again and you were sleeping peacefully, so he let himself in and walked over to the bedside. He smiled very softly as he looked down at your sleeping form and you shifted slightly in your sleep, the necklace around your neck becoming visible and the ring just poking out of the top of your undershirt. Todoroki tilted his head as he looked at it. That ring looks familiar, he thought. You stirred and your eyes fluttered open. Todoroki was standing by the bedside, looking down at you and you smiled. Oh, what a lovely dream I'm having, you croaked airily. Oh, but you look awake to me, Todoroki replied. You gasped and sat bolt upright. Okay, not a dream. Todoroki looked at you quizzically, and then he looked back down to the necklace that had now fallen out of your top and was hanging visibly from your neck. You glanced down and saw the necklace had been revealed. Snatching it quickly, you scooped it back up into your shirt and cleared your throat. Um, <clears throat> so, hi, I'm feeling better, you said with a goofy big grin. Todoroki was still obviously preoccupied by the necklace and still hadn't looked you in the eye yet. Uh, Todoroki? You asked, ducking your head down slightly to catch his attention. Oh, my apologies, Yin. Your necklace caught my eye, he said, finally looking you in the eye. My, my necklace? You asked. Yes, he nodded. It looks familiar. The ring does. It does? You gasped eagerly. From where? He looked at you his eyes looking into your left eye and then switching across to look into your right eye. A long time ago, he said softly. Your heart leapt in your chest and all of a sudden it became harder to breathe. Can, can you remember when? You asked, painfully aware of how this conversation was affecting your whole body. Garden, he said with a slight furrowing of his brow. You wheezed audibly, unintentional of course, but he heard it and reached a hand out to you. Yin, please lie down. You don't sound too good. No, no, you have it wrong. It's too good. This is why I sound like I'm dying, you thought, but lay back down anyway. Oi, half and half bastard, a voice barked from the nurse's office doorway. Todoroki turned. Oh, it's you. Yes, it's frickin' me, Bakugo snapped. 
came to check on my girl. Your heart fluttered slightly when you heard his words and you scowled, confused as to why him calling you his girl had made you feel slightly giddy. I'll take my leave now, Yin, Todoroki said through gritted teeth as he turned and walked past Bakugo, shooting him an icy stare as he passed. Bakugo growled lowly at him as he passed, his ruby red eyes watching the handsome jewel haired boy depart. What are you doing here? You snapped at Bakugo. I came to see how you were doing, he said gruffly, plopping down on the side of the bed and running a hand through his spiky blonde hair. As if you care, he said bluntly. I'm fine, you can go now. Bakugo sighed harshly. I actually freaking care about you, okay? No one has a gun to my head. I came here on my own free will. Your facial expression softened and you sighed. Okay, sorry, you mumbled, looking down at your hands. There was silence for a bit before Bakugo spoke. Didn't know you wore jewellery, he grunted. I don't, you said, curiously looking up at him with a confused look on your face. What's this then? He asked, reaching out to your neck and pulling at the necklace that was semi-exposed. You pushed his hand away sharply and tucked the necklace back under your shirt. It's not jewellery, it's the intestines of my enemies, you said quickly. Bakugo snorted. Is it an heirloom? No, it's just special, you said softly. Why? What's it to you? You snapped. Oi, just asking. He shot back defensively. Fine, whatever, it's just a stupid necklace anyway. He huffed, getting up to leave. It's just this, you said quickly, pulling the ring out and showing it to him, while averting your eyes with embarrassment. You waited. Come on, you livid caramel donut. Just freaking say you recognise it or not. Something. Anything. You hesitated a look in his direction, but his face was still in its usual neutral scowl. Who gave it to you? He asked. I was hoping you could tell me that, you shaved moose knuckle. Don't know. You lied. Well, it was kind of true. You actually didn't know who gave it to you, but you had your hunches. Bakugo grunted. Gave a girl a ring once. When I was a kid, she lost it. He said as he turned sharply and left the room. Wait, wait, back you go, wait! He yelled, throwing the covers back and stumbling out of bed, your skirt getting caught in the side rail and ripping as you tried to bolt. With a scream, you hit the floor. You'd completely forgotten about your sprained ankle. Back you go was back in a flash. Yin, you idiot, what are you doing? I'm making a complete fool of myself. What does it look like? Ow! You groaned as you tried to get up. You tried to stand but fell, and back you go caught you. He clicked. Hang on a second. Just hold on to me. You gripped his shirt and buried your face into him, inhaling his delicious burnt caramel scent. He tentatively wrapped his arms around you to lift you so that you could sit back down on the bed. Then he pulled back. He coughed and turned his head away quickly when he saw your bare thigh exposed. Your, your skirt, he said softly. You looked down and screamed again. Oi, okay, calm down. Calm the hell down, dumbass. He scolded as you flailed and whined. But I'm naked! You wailed. You're not friggin' naked, you idiot. Hold on a second. He says he quickly covered your lower half with the bed covers. I'll be back. He was gone and back in a flash with his hero pants. They were black with green dark belt that had attachments for grenades, and they looked kind of baggy and comfy. Here, he said, holding them out to you. Put these on. You took them from him and he turned his back to you so that you could hesitantly slip your skirt off under the covers and pull the pants on, doing up the belt to the smallest hole. Wait, this belt hole seems to be the most used. Do we have the same waist size? You done yet? He asked gruffly. Uh, yeah, you replied, standing up with the weight on one leg and looking down at the pants. Bakugo glanced over his shoulder at you and your heart jumped. Here, he said, turning and holding out a hand to you. His other hand shoved into his pocket as his head turned away so you couldn't see his blush. Damn, she looks cute in my pants. You reached out and took his hand to steady yourself. Come back to my place. Today, I'll get my mum to fix his skirt. He mumbled. You looked at him. Nah, I'll be fine. Just come, he grunted, still scowling while looking away. I just want to spend some time with you. Back you go, you don't have to be doing this, he replied, trying to catch his eye. I want to, okay? He said through gritted teeth. You glanced away shyly. Oh, okay. Gingerly putting your weight on your injured leg, you tried to weight bear, but almost fell when the pain shot through your ankle. Bakugo caught you again and pulled you into him. 
So hold on to me, all right? You looked up at him. His piercing red eyes bore right into your soul and your heart fluttered for a second. Okay, he whispered as he remained in his embrace. I can carry you. Bakugo said lowly as he continued to look into your eyes. I idiot, that's not necessary. I can wa- No, you can't, you dumbass. You just tried and nearly fell over. He grunted, his hot breath rushing across your cheek. Your heart jumped again. Oh my god, he's so close. As much as I hate this bleached asshole, he's pretty cute. And he's actually got a sweet side under all that squaring and ego. Can you even carry me though? You jeered. What the hell? I could carry 15 of you. Not a problem at all. He said with a smirk. What if I activated my quirk on myself? Do that and I'll kill you. He said with a deadpan look on his face. School had finished by now. So no one saw Bakugo giving you a piggyback down the hall and out of the school gates all the way to his house. Oi, old hag, get out here. Bakugo hollered through the door as he got home with you still on his back. I've told you before, I'm not an old hag. I am a maiden who's been aged by her useless son who... Oh, hello, sweetheart. Did he kidnap you? Her ability to go from full throttle to idle was amazing and you laughed. Um, hi, my skirt ripped and now I'm in his pants you said. Also, my social skills go south when I get put on the spot, so excuse me. Bakugo's mum laughed. I like this one, she said to Bakugo, who just clicked his tongue and slid you off his back. She's my fake girlfriend after all, he said lowly. Your heart jumped again. Bakugo's mum gasped. Oh, of course, I remember you now. We met at your grandma's house that day. You nodded. Yep, that's me. Nice to see you both getting along, she said with a cheeky eyebrow raise. Shut up, Bakugo yelled with a soft blush dusting his cheeks. It's just fake. A little pang twitched in your chest. Wait, why did that statement hurt? I'm Mitsuki, by the way, Bakugo's mum said, extending her hand to you. You shook it and clung to Bakugo for balance. Nice to meet you, I'm Yin Lin, but you probably already knew that. It's always nice for a refresher, she said kindly. Now, what the hell did my idiot child do to your skirt? Oh, no, this one was all me. I tried to get out of the nurse's bed and it caught on the rail and ripped. He said with a sheepish chuckle. Can you fix it or not? Bakugo shot at her. Have some respect, child, she snapped. Yes, I can fix it for your girlfriend. That's no worries. I told you. We're not. Yes, I heard your lies, son, Mitsuki replied, picking up the skirt that Bakugo had dumped in his bag and turning it over to assess the damage. Bakugo blushed deeply and clicked his tongue before getting a better grip on you. Come on, you can lie down in my room, he said lowly. Y your, your room? You stuttered nervously. Wait, why am I so nervous all of a sudden? Yes, my room. It's your problem, idiot. Oh, nothing, he replied. Okay, onwards and forwards, my steed, you said, quickly recovering your embarrassment with humour. No horizontal dancing, you two, Mitsuki said mischievously over her shoulder as she walked to the study to get her sewing kit out. As if that had ever happened, Bakugo barked. Ah, so this is what hell looks like, you said with a bright smile as Bakugo pushed his bedroom door open. Shut up, he snorted, desperately trying to hide his amusement. He helped you over to the bed and you lay down, snuggling into his pillow. Oh, it smells like burnt caramel. Oh my god, I can, can I get this made into a perfume or something? Oi, you weirdo. You sniffing my pillow? Bakugo yelled. You quickly pushed it away. No, why would I be smelling something that's so delicious I just want to eat it? I won't. He deadpanned. Sorry, sometimes my inner thoughts just come out loud. He just shook his head and walked over to the wardrobe. I'm going to get changed, so go back to sniffing my pillow, you freak. He called over his shoulder. You turned your head away, but glanced back when you heard him take his shirt off. Your mouth ran dry when you saw how muscular his back was. Fuck, yeah, fudge cake and ice cream. He's friggin' cut like the Statue of David. You groaned internally, your eyes roaming his form as he slipped the shirt on. He glanced back at you and saw you staring. He smirked. What's the matter, dumbass? Couldn't keep your eyes off this perfection. He asked as he turned his, to face you. His shirt still half rolled up, showing off his killer set of abs. Nope, you replied bluntly. He was expecting a smart reply, so your honesty threw him. Well, guess you being my girlfriend makes it okay for you to check me out. A flustered look graced your face, and you looked away. But, uh, but I'm just faking, so... 
Are you faking your attraction to me too? He asked slowly as he walked over to the end of the bed and then crawled up, his top half hovering over your bottom half. Y y yes of course I'm faking as if I'd find you attractive. You stuttered, blinking furiously while looking away. You're lying, he said lowly as he inched closer to you. You pulled back. W what about you? Are, are you attracted to, to me? You asked softly, your heartbeat pulsating your vision, eyes still averted. There was a lengthy pause as he thought about his reply. You're not exactly ugly, Yin. He replied in possibly the sexiest voice you'd ever heard him use. You hesitantly looked at him. He was still holding his position over you. Ah, uh -huh, Spanx, he said with a lopsided smile. You're an idiot, he said with a smirk and pulled off you. You breathed a sigh of relief. Oh man, that was intense. Did he just pay me a compliment? A weirdly delivered compliment, but a compliment nonetheless? You smiled. Stay for dinner, yeah? He said as he walked back to the wardrobe and closed the door. Do you really want me to? You asked. If I didn't want you to, I wouldn't have brought you here in the first place. He scoffed. The rest of the night went well, and you ended up chilling on the lounge watching TV together. A weirdly comfortable vibe flowing between you two. You'd texted your mum to let her know where you were, and she offered to come and pick you up later. Things between you and Bakugo were shifting. Were you catching feelings? Or was he? Or were you both falling for each other? Your ankle was feeling much better over the next three weeks, and eventually you were able to walk on it again normally. Child, we're going to visit Grandma in the hospital now, your mum called up the stairs one evening. Can't go, sorry mum, I'm on a date, you yelled back, pausing the anime that you were watching on your laptop. What do you mean by date? She hollered back. With my favourite anime character, you replied. Doesn't count, get down here now. You groaned. Mm, sorry, my love, I'll be back. Don't go anywhere, he said, kissing the laptop screen. It had been about three months now of fake dating back ago, so that meant that you had yeah, around about three months left to go. You weren't happy with what would happen at the end of those possible next three months, and your stomach churned as you walked down the stairs and out the door to the car. Your grandma had definitely gone downhill since the last time you saw her, and you fought back tears as the reality of her situation hit you like a truck. As usual, your parents did most of the talking, and it was arranged that grandma would come and live with you guys in another two weeks. She smiled feebly over to you. I'm looking forward to seeing you and your boyfriend again, she said in a soft voice. Of course, Grandma, you said, choking back tears. The car ride home was really quiet, and when you got to the driveway, you hopped out of the car and walked down the driveway. Where you going, Peewee? Your dad asked kindly. I just need to go for a walk, he replied. I'll be back. Okay, sweet, he said gently and let you go. You pulled your hoodie up over your head and shoved your hands into your pockets as you walked. You didn't really know where you were going, but you just needed to walk. Tears started streaming down your face as you picked up the pace, jogging slightly as you sobbed. <laughs> this is a stupid idea to run and cry at the same time. I get breathless just cutting my toenails. What made me think I had the lung capacity to run, run and cry at the same time? You slowed and tried to control your breathing. Maybe I should get something to drink and calm down. You thought as you approached the sober shop that you knew had a pretty good drink vending machine. You had a few coins in your pocket and counted them as you entered the shop with your head down, making a memorised beeline for the vending machine. You glanced up at the machine and wiped your tears away slightly so you could see the prices. The drink that you wanted was just a little more expensive than you anticipated and you were a few coins short. Damn it. You muttered, looking back down to see how much you had for maybe another drink. Suddenly a hand reached from beside you and placed a decent amount of coins into the machine. Pick whatever you'd like, the velvety voice said. W what? You started in surprise as you turned to see who it was. Todoroki's kindly face was looking sympathetically at you. You looked away immediately. Oh, not now. My eyes are red and puffy and I look more like a potato than usual. Yin. He said softly, please get whatever you'd like. You somewhat reluctantly pressed the number for the drink you originally wanted and picked it out of the catch. Thank you, Todoroki, he said softly. Would you like to walk with me, Yin? He asked gently. I can see you're hurting. I'm here for you if you want to talk. 
You welled up with tears again and nodded. Yeah, actually, yeah. You sniffed. I haven't spoken to anyone about this yet. I probably should talk about it. Todoroki nodded and led the way out of the shop, walking to a nearby park so you could sit on the bench and talk. So, um, what a coincidence bumping into you, he said, making small talk. That's my favourite sober shop, he said frankly. I'm always there. Oh, good to know, you laughed, cracking the drink bottle open and taking a sip. Ah, you sighed. I'd hit the spot. Want to try some? He said, offering some to Todoroki. He reached out and took the bottle, sipping a little bit before handing it back. <gasps> oh my gosh, an indirect kiss? It's a pretty good gin, he said with a small smile. Oh my god, my life has been fulfilled. He smiled. He sighed dreamily. May I ask why you're sad? Todoroki asked, point blank range. He wasn't always the most tactful, but he was straightforward and you appreciated that. Um, it's kind of a long story. He said with a sheepish laugh. It's, um, it's got to do with why I'm fake dating back ago as well. He looked at you. Go on. Um, well, my grandma's, um, she's dying. She, um, she initially, the doctor said she had six months left to live and she wanted me to have a boyfriend because it would make her happy. And, um, because the gods hate me, I somehow ended up with back ago because of family connections and... You rambled on for another 10 minutes as Todoroki listened silently to you. You babbled on and on, with Todoroki just sitting quietly beside you, letting you get it all out. When you finally took a breath and calmed down, you were equal parts relieved and mortified that you just emotionally dumped on him like that, but he didn't seem phased in the slightest. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> you sniffed. That was hella embarrassing. You couldn't look him in the eye, so just kept your gaze steady on the ground. Todoroki shook his head. Not at all, Yin. I know what it's like to bottle emotions up. It's not good to pen them up. Yu sniffed and looked up at him, giving him a weak smile. Thanks, Todoroki, he said in a quiet voice. Shoto, he replied softly. Would you call me Shoto? Your eyes shot up and met his. He looked away quickly and his cheeks were slightly pink with embarrassment. Sorry, that was too forward. He said regretfully. No, no, not at all, Sh Shoto, he said. Hearing his first name roll off your tongue like that made you feel funny inside. Todoroki's blush deepened and he turned his head and looked at you gently. Thank you, Yin, and thank you for confiding in me. You're my friend, Shoto. I'm just happy you spent time to listen to my useless ramble, he said with an embarrassed laugh. It wasn't useless, Yin, and you're welcome. Anytime. I'm here for you. He said with a gentle smile. Here, um. He pulled his phone out and handed it to you. Would you like to exchange numbers? W would, would I like to exchange numbers? Would I like to exchange numbers? Is there a word that's more expressive than just plain yes? He thought. Ah, uh, sure, he said, trying to sound as calm as possible while the mariachi band played fanfare music in your head, topped off with the hallelujah chorus. You put your number in and handed his phone back to him. He smiled. It was a beautiful, warm smile. A smile that warmed you from the inside out. Immediately you had flashbacks to when you were five, being gifted a ring at your auntie's wedding. Sh Shoto? You whispered as your eyes grew wide. Your hand clutched to your chest, encasing the ring on your necklace with the fabric of your shirt. Shoto's smile faded slightly and he looked at you. What's wrong, Yin? He asked. Sh Shoto, I, I need to ask you something. You said as you quickly pulled the ring out of your shirt and showed it to him. You said this looked familiar and you said the word garden. Did you give this to me when I was five years old? Your heart was pounding wildly as you watched his face. He looked at you and then down at the ring and then back to you. No, Yin, I didn't. He said gently. Your heart sank. You'd been so sure. You'd been so sure it had been him. His smile just now connected the dots for you. How could it not be him? Oh, he said, disappointment setting in. Let me walk you home, Shoto offered, changing the subject. You nodded as you put the ring away and hopped up off your seat. The walk back to your house was somewhat quiet, but you didn't have the energy to try and maintain a conversation. 
I'll see you tomorrow, Yin. Shoto said as he left your house and headed to his own. Yu nodded and smiled. Thanks for everything, Shoto. He said as he waved goodbye and went inside. The jewel-haired heartthrob sighed and put his hands in his pocket as he strolled down the street, head down and deep in thought. I hope that she will forgive me, that I lied to her. Good morning, Yim. Shoto said, greeting you as he entered the classroom the next day. Hi, Shoto, he said shyly. The hell? Your ever-present blonde bomb yelled when he heard you greet Shoto by his first name. What is it now, you short-circuiting Furby? You hollered back, getting an instant bee in your bonnet. There's no hell you're calling him Shoto, if you're calling me Bakugo still. Yeah, but I don't call you Bakugo. I call you everything else that I can possibly think of, but rarely Bakugo, you replied smartly. Call me Katsuki, dumbass, he growled. Cat suck my balls, you said loudly. Bakugo, enraged with jealousy and frustration, lashed out at you. He wasn't intending to hit you, just throw a few explosions close by to show that he was serious, but he hadn't banked on Shoto jumping into your rescue. As his right arm came up, it was quickly encased in ice, anchoring it in place. You casually touched his now frozen form, activating your quirk and taking him to his knees as his arm was held up by the ice. Don't mess with Wikatsuki. If you have a problem, you can just talk to me about it. You said lowly as you crouched down in front of him. He looked up at you, seething. You stared down at him a second, and then touched him again and released the quirk. He coughed and breathed deeply, still staying on his knees. Shoto, you can release him now, you said kindly to your protector, and he nodded before solemnly getting you to work, melting the ice off Bakugo. Bakugo's eyes watched you as you walked away and sat at your desk. Mmm, lover's row? Mina hummed curiously, looking at you from the side of her eye. Mm, something like that, you mumbled, crossing your arms as you stared at Bakugo. During class, he kicked your chair and passed you a note. You sneakily read it. Need to talk to you. Equipment shed. First break. You nodded so he knew that you'd read it and then put the note in your pocket. First break came and you made your way to the shed. Is it a good idea to meet in here? You asked Bakugo as you entered, your eyes finding the blonde in the shed instantly. Last time we were in here, I nearly died. So dramatic, he huffed. What do you want to talk to me about? You asked as you pulled up in front of him, arms crossed across your chest, looking up into those captivating red eyes. His breathing hitched slightly. All right, back you go paused. Well, you pressed. I don't like you being close with half and half. He grumbled while scowling and looking away. Why? You asked sharply. Because. That's not a good enough reason, Baku Katsuki, you said frowning and tapping your foot on the wooden floorboards. I can be friends with whoever I want. Yeah, I know that, he replied angrily. But you're mine, remember? No, I'm not yours, you shot back angrily. This is fake, remember? Well, we need to start doing a better job at making it look real. It's going to make us both look bad if you're getting chummy with the shitty icy hot. And how do you propose that we look real then? You asked with an eye roll and air finger quotation marks around the look real part of the sentence. Well, he said, blushing and looking away. Holding hands as a start. When? I don't friggin' know. Break time? He said with a huff, still blushing and avoiding eye contact. Okay, fine, you said. He relaxed a little. Okay, he grunted. Okay, is that it? You said, half turning to go. And I want to friggin' take you on a date too, dumbass, he said, reaching out and grabbing for your wrist. Your brain momentarily stopped functioning. A, a, a date? Yeah, because I'm supposed to be your boyfriend, he grumbled, scratching his cheek to hide the pink tinge to his skin. Oh, yeah, of course, you replied, slightly saddened that it was obligatory again. You went to walk away, but he hadn't let go of your wrist yet and he tightened his grip on you as you tried to pull away. You looked back at him curiously. He had his head lowered now, with his other hand shoved in his pocket. Ah, uh, Katsuki, you can let me go now, he said, shaking your wrist slightly to get his attention. He didn't move nor speak. Katsuki. Suddenly he yanked you towards him, and you stumbled and spun, being thrown off balance by his sharp tug on your wrist. Your face planted directly into his chest and he wrapped his arms around you. You were speechless. Back you go, Katsuki was hugging you. You froze in his embrace, the palms of your hands against his chest. With your head still face first into him, 
You allowed his intoxicatingly delicious scent to permeate every inch of your being. You could feel his heart pounding against your palms and you turned your head slightly to look at his face, which he had turned away slightly to avoid eye contact. Uh, this ball of sundary can't be honest with himself, Kenny. You smirk to yourself. Taken over by the vulnerable moment of this gorgeous blonde disaster, you found yourself reaching up on tiptoes and placing your lips gently against Bakugo's cheek. Retreating your face immediately, realising what you'd done, you quickly broke away from his hug and ran, leaving a very flustered Bakugo in your wake. You bolted for the, out of the shed and headed for the girls' bathroom. You figured it would be safest there. Oh my god, what the hell am I doing? What did I just do? I just kissed him on the cheek. Oh my god, I'm a hoe. You raced inside and slammed the cubicle door shut. I can't face him again, that was so embarrassing. Time to fake my own death. You hid in the bathroom for the rest of the break and then waited until the noise in the hallway had died down before exiting and going back to the classroom, making your way straight for your seat with your head down, refusing to look at Bakugo, who was still blushing madly. You avoided him for the rest of the day, opting to hide in the girls' bathroom every time you had a break. The soft kiss to the cheek had confused and excited Bakugo. By now he was starting to realise that he had developed feelings for you, but he didn't know how to tell you. Seeing you get close with Todoroki only make it, made him angrier, scared that he would lose to that bastard. He hadn't banked on you returning his feelings because who could ever love him? Had that kiss been obligatory or did you like him back? Every time he wanted to talk to you about it, you had avoided him, which pissed him off even more. Stupid dumbass. Why won't she confront me? Hey, Yin, Mina called. We're heading to the beach this weekend. Want to come? Yeah, you called back as you scurried out of the school building, looking around wildly to make sure Bakugo hadn't seen you. Awesome, she called back. I'll text you details, yeah? Sounds good, you yelled back as you bolted for home. You flung the front door open and screamed at the top of your lungs. Your poor mum dropped everything that she was doing, bits and pieces flying everywhere. Yin, what the hell? You fake sobbed as you dropped your bag to the ground and dragged yourself to the kitchen. There'd better be a good explanation for your reenactment of the exorcism of Emily Rose, she said with a scowl, picking up the things that she'd dropped. I like two boys, I think, and I don't know how to choose. You wailed as he slumped down in the chair and fake sobbed into your arm. Um, but I thought Shoto Todoroki was, uh, Salt Bay. Bay, mum. Just Bay. You deadpanned. Yeah, well, he's definitely Bay, but I kissed Bakugo on the cheek today, and now I don't know what to do. Your mum gasped dramatically. You shot her a scowl. I'm being serious, you said in an annoyed tone. Oh, sorry, I didn't know that was possible, she replied with a cheeky smile. Okay, but go on. Well, he hugged me and I just couldn't help it and I kissed his cheek and then I haven't spoken to him since and I don't know how to address this. Your mum sighed. Ah, oh, youth. You dropped your face to your hands and groaned and then you remembered the weekend plans. Oh, also, I'm going to the beach this weekend with Mina. Is that cool? Wow, just a second ago you were crying over Salt Bay. Bay, mum, just bay. So can I go? Yes, sure, Yin. If this helps ease the pain of loving two boys at once, she jeered playfully. Mm, I'm never going to live this down, am I? You grimaced. No, she replied with a giant grin. It was now Saturday morning and you were collecting everything together to head to the beach. Mina had said that it was going to be just the girls, so you were looking forward to a super fun time together. Sunnies, water, hat, sunscreen, towel... Oh my god, let's not forget that again like we did last time, shall we? You mumbled as you shuddered at the memory of having to ask a random beach goer for a towel to use and then riding the bus back home with a wet ass. You also packed a few snacks, overnight clothes, casual wear and then borrowed some money from your mum before leaving the house and walking to the bus stop. It was the most absolutely perfect day for the beach and you were in high spirits. Mina had booked a beach house at the furthest end of the beach and you were all going to stay overnight then come back on Sunday night. After getting to the beach, you jumped off the bus and texted Mina. Yo, I'm here, you typed out before looking around. Hey, come down to the chip shop, she replied, and you looked around for the shop. It was a well-marked shop with the words chip shop plastered over the top of the building doorway. Well, even I can tell that's the shop, you thought as you walked down the hill to the meeting spot. You pushed the door open and spotted Mina. You waved and your eyes scanned the others who were there. Jiro? Yeah, of course, that's a given that she'd be here too. Kushma. Oh, okay. Didn't expect guys. I thought it was just going to be the girls, but hey, he's cool, so all good. Kaminari. Another guy? 
Okay, well, he's cute and fun, so no complaints. Back you go, Katsuki. Katsuki! Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, not him! Your heart suddenly started to beat heavily, and your footsteps faltered as you made your way towards the table. Bakugo turned his head, and his crimson eyes met yours as you froze halfway across the room. Hey, Yin! Mina called out. Your terrified eyes met hers. Bitch, what have you done? Yin! Bakugo called to you. Need to talk to you. Your pounding heart only strengthened. I know what he's going to ask. He's going to want to talk about the kiss from before. He got up from the table and casually walked over to you. He was in shorts and a muscle shirt, and his biceps bulged as he walked. He was definitely a handsome looking guy, and your heart skipped a beat. Mm hmm, okay, you mumbled as he approached you. Let's walk, he said lowly as he stopped in front of you, looking down at you. You leaned to the side and looked around him to Mina. I'll be back, he said sheepishly to her. Kaminari was already pretending to kiss his hand, giving you an exaggerated eyebrow wiggle as your eyes met his. You covered your face with your hands with embarrassment and Bakugo looked back to see what had happened. He only just caught sight of the tail end of Kaminari's teasing. Knock it off, dunce face, or I'll kill you. Bakugo yelled at the electric blonde. Kaminari stopped immediately. Let's go, Bakugo said as he grabbed your hand and walked past you, half dragging you backwards as he walked. You stumbled and spun around so you could catch up beside your fake boyfriend. Hey, hey! Why the rush, blonde bomb threat? It's Katsuki, he growled, not looking at you. Hmm, not in the mood for games today, huh? Bakugo led you outside and away from everyone over to a hill and sat down. You stood beside him for a bit before gingerly sitting down. Um, so what did you want to talk about? You asked hesitantly, yanking a blade of grass from the ground and fiddling with it. What happened in the equipment shed? He stated. It wasn't a question, it was the subject title by the sounds of it. Um, well, it was just an obligatory fake girlfriend kiss to the cheek, you said running with his theme of having to do things because it's obligatory. This annoyed Bakugo and he scowled heavily. It's not fair to kiss someone and call it obligatory. Oh, isn't it? Well, that's rich coming from you, you replied sassily at him as your hand slammed into the ground. It's fine for you to play that card with me, but you don't like it when I pull the same card on you, hey? Bakugo just looked at you speechless. Go to hell, Katsuki. I'm done with being your fake girlfriend, you snapped at him before getting up and marching off. He didn't know what to say. He'd been thrown. This is not how he expected the talk to go at all. He saw this as a chance to corner you into confessing to him so that he didn't have to be the first to talk about his true feelings, but so far this definitely hadn't gone to plan. You stormed back to the chip shop and threw the door open. Did you kiss him? Kaminari asked loudly when he saw you enter. Go to hell the lot of you, you seethed as you marched towards the table. I came here for a good time not to fight with Baku bitch and get teased by you guys. I'm sorry, babe, Mina said sympathetically. We'll stop. Kaminari apologised too and invited you to have some food. Once you'd calmed down a bit and the conversation was flowing, Bakugo sauntered back in sheepishly. He sat down quietly, not talking to anyone, especially refusing to make eye contact with you. After lunch, you all headed out for a swim. Your spirits boosted slightly from food and the thought of getting into the water. You, Mina and Jiro set up the towels and beach umbrellas that Karishma had bought and then you took your clothes off, revealing the swimmers underneath. You hadn't been self-conscious about your outfit until you caught Bakugo checking you out, and you scowled at him and he looked away quickly, walking down to the water, his back muscles rippling as he walked. Secretly, you checked him out as he left and sighed. <sighs> Why are we always fighting? The day went well and Bakugo didn't try and talk to you at all, but you both would make eye contact occasionally when trying to check each other out sneakily, which caused bashfulness from the two of you. As the day progressed, you were feeling more and more torn about how things went down with Bakugo, and you warred with yourself over the whether or not you'd said and done the right things. Ugh, I'm just I'm just sick of this whole girlfriend charade. I don't know if I want to be his actual girlfriend or not, but having this on and off kind of relationship is killing me, and especially when I kind of like Shoto as well. You ducked your head under the water as another wave passed over you. Ugh, it's embarrassing enough that I kissed him certainly didn't want to admit my feelings right there and then. What if he'd laughed in my face? You scowled at the water and sighed. Hey, I'm sorry. A masculine voice said from beside you. You jumped. 
You'd been so deep in thought you hadn't realised that Bakugo had waited up beside you. Oh, oh, I didn't hear you coming. You replied as you looked at him and then back to the water. It's okay, I'm sorry too. Wait, did you just apologise? You screeched, your eyes wide flicking across to him and settling on his face. Yeah, I did. What of it? He grumbled. Well, I mean, you're the last person I would have thought would apologise for something, he said with a light laugh. He smirked. Yeah, I'm freaking hardcore, but I know when to apologise. Uh, fair enough, he said with a smile. Still kind of want to know what that kiss was for. I mean, I hugged you and all, he said, slightly softer than his usual abrupt tone. Almost like a sundary wall had been half knocked down and you could see a bit of vulnerability peeking through from the other side. Um, I just, I felt close to you, so my, my body just kind of acted on its own without me thinking. You mumbled, swishing your fingers in the water while you kept your eyes down. He stole a glance at you from the corner of his eye. Damn, she's super cute like this. Mm, okay, he said. He didn't want to push his luck, and to be honest, he was happy with that reply for now. Yeah, well, I hugged you because I wanted to show you that I didn't find you annoying enough to not have you in my arms. He stated quickly, before turning and making a hasty retreat away from you. You whipped around and watched him leave. Wh what? Is that his roundabout way of saying that he wanted to hug me because he actually wanted to? Is there a chance we could actually be together? Your mind was going 100 miles per hour. What if he asked me out for real? What would I say? That night, Mina suggested dinner by the fire, which you all thought was a great idea. Back you go, Yin. Can you get us some firewood? Mina called as she set up stuff for dinner and Karishma collected rocks to make a circle pit for the fire. Yeah, sure, you called back, waiting for Bakugo to walk over to you before you both headed off into the bush nearby. Should we get big sticks or just lots of little ones? You asked Bakugo, making small talk. Mix, he replied, holding back a tree branch for you to walk past without it smacking you in the face. Aw, he's trying, you thought with a smile. Hey, um, <clears throat> do you have a type? You asked him suddenly, as he walked past you to push another branch back. What? What do you mean? He asked, looking back at you. I mean, do you have a type of girl that you like? You asked again, a little annoyed at having to repeat yourself. The question was embarrassing enough as it was. Yeah, he replied gruffly, not looking at you. Well, um, what's your type? You asked in a soft voice. I like girls with balls, he said. So you like dudes then? What? Or transvestites? The hell? You cackled. <laughs> I'm messing with you. Go on. Chick with balls. Speaks her mind. Not too girly, but shows a soft side every now and again. You were feeling quite flustered by this point, and your brain was asking a million questions. Is... is he describing me? Why? He grunted, turning to look at you. Oh, um... no reason, he replied, rubbing the back of your neck and looking away. Hey, um, how how do you think it would go if we um if we did actually date for real? Bakugo's heart leapt into his chest. What? Is she asking me to be, be her boyfriend? How do I respond to that? Hell, I like her, man. I, but I've never had a girlfriend before. His pause made you sweat bullets. Oh, I shouldn't have asked that. Time to yeet myself out of here ASAP. Trying to play it cool, Bakugo replied in the most sundary Bakugo way possible and started with a sharp laugh. Huh. <laughs> We'd suck, right? Always fighting like we do now. I don't even like you like that anyway. His heart sank as the harsh words came out of his mouth. Oh, damn. Shouldn't have said any of that. But, <clears throat> you know, he started to say. Okay, just stop. You said in an emotionless voice. I've heard enough. He looked at you. You had your head down, shoulders slumped, complete dejection swallowing your entire form. He had hurt you. You turned and walked away, picking up sticks as you went. He exhaled through his nose softly. Damn, I think I did the wrong thing. It's funny, you were hurt, definitely, but it's like it was the last straw and there was no pain. You just felt dead, void of emotion, like you just didn't care anymore. You got back to the others at the makeshift fire site and gave them a big fake smile, handing the sticks to Karishma, who set them out in an arrangement. Where's King Explosion Murder? Kaminari asked as he helped Jiro chop food. 
I don't know, getting bigger logs, I guess. Huh, <laughs> figures, he replied with a snort and a laugh. Bakugo returned later with armload of wood. You guys didn't look at each other. You'd made up your mind to move on. Room for one more. A velvety smooth voice asked from behind where you'd sat down on the sand and you spun your head around to see who it was. Shoto Todoroki was standing behind you in casual gear. A soft white button-up shirt that was left unbuttoned covered some of his torso and blue and red bodies completed the outfit on the bottom half. You smiled brightly. Sure, come and join us. Shoto looked around at the group and nodded a greeting to everyone before taking a seat beside you on the sand, his knees up with elbows resting casually on top of them. You smiled happily across to him, your eyes lingering on his soft, well-defined arms. What, um, what are you doing here? You asked casually. My family owns a beach house here and we decided to come for the weekend, he said frankly, his mesmerising eyes taking you in softly as he looked across to you. Must be nice to have a house here that you can come to whenever, Karishma piped up. You looked over to him and your eyes went past the red head to a very seething blonde beside him. Bakugo's crimson red eyes had the intent to kill look in them and you could almost feel the black aura radiating from him. He obviously didn't like Shoto being there or being so close to you, one or the other, but maybe it was the first option because he had said that you weren't his type, right? Your train of thought led you right back to square one and you scowled at your fake boyfriend. Ugh, screw you, you can't sit there and hate Shoto if you hate me already. Oh, Yin, you have a bit of sand on your cheek. Shoto said as he gently placed a hand on your opposite cheek and turned your face towards him. It successfully broke you out of your annoyed trance and your doe eyes met his. He tenderly brushed something off your cheek with his other hand, keeping the original one where it was to keep you looking at him and your body froze on command. You're tense, Yin, he said quietly and lowly. Your heartbeat increased. Has Bakugo done something to frustrate you again? You let out a sigh. Oh, damn it, I thought he was going to pick up on the fact that his touch is making me feel things. Um, yeah, but it's okay. You're here now. You replied back softly. A smile pulled at his lips at that last line and your body broke out into nervous sweat, realising how forward you sounded. I'm glad my presence calms you, he said gently as he let your cheek go. You giggled shyly and looked away. You heard Bakugo softly and then he stood up. I'm gonna go for a walk, he stated angrily as he turned and stormed off. I'll go with you, bro. Karishma said and scrambled to his feet to follow the stalking, raging blonde. Your eyes followed the pair as they walked off together. You started to relax more now that Bakugo wasn't constantly staring you down. Dinner's ready, Mina called and you looked over at the food that she'd laid out. She'd really gone all out. Shoto got up quickly and turned to extend a hand to you to help you up off the sand, which you gratefully accepted. Your eyes glossing over his torso and his rippling abs that were visible through the open part of his shirt as he helped you up. Naturally, your eyes slowly travelled up and met his, and you both looked into each other's eyes before you shyly looked away, a smile pulling at your lips. This layout's plus ultra, Mina, you commented, letting go of Shoto's hand as you walked over to the table. Shoto stayed close to you as you walked around, getting food and sometimes your hands would touch as you reached for the serving utensils. It felt like every three seconds you were saying sorry for touching his hand. He didn't seem to mind though, and would always offer the, you the serving utensils first before he used it. Hey Todoroki, you want to stay with us tonight? Mina asked. We have two rooms, one girl's room and one boy's room. I'd like that, Todoroki said as his heterochromic eyes glanced across and settled on you. Yo, um, Kirin, back from coming up to eat. They'll miss out, Kaminari said with a mouthful of food. Dunno, you shrugged. He'll come back when he's ready, I guess. Bro, what's gotten into you? Karishma asked as Bakugo kept marching purposefully onwards. Did you and Yin break up? No, Bakugo snapped. We didn't. So why are you so mad then? Is it because of Todoroki? But you were even mad before he turned up, Karishma amused. I'm just pissed off, alright? Yeah, I can see that, Karishma chuckled. But why? I don't get what's going on between you two. You're still together. Did you have a fight earlier? Yeah, Bakugo grunted. Oh, I see. What happened? Karishma asked in a bold move. It's complicated, Bakugo grunted. Karishma sighed. Well, all I can say is, if you love her, you've got to apologise and talk things out, yeah? She's your girlfriend, bro. She'll understand. Yeah, but she's not. You're faking it, Bakugo replied with a scowl. 
What? Kirishima shouted. Bro, and you never told me? Oi, I have my reasons, okay? Bakugo snapped. I'm sorry, I didn't tell you. It was complicated. Kirishima stayed quiet for a moment, thinking about what Bakugo had just said. Do you like her though, bro? He asked. Bakugo went bright red in the face. No. Why the hell would I like Yin? Kirishima looked at him. Lying isn't very manly, Bakugo, he said bluntly. Damn, Bakugo spat. Is it that obvious? Bro, I can't believe you just asked me that, Kirishima laughed. Yeah, it's pretty obvious, but no one said anything because we all thought you two were actually dating. So of course I would explain why you're always looking at her and teasing her to get her attention. Bakugo grunted. Bro, just ask her out for reals, yeah? I'm like 99% sure she'll say yes, Kirishima said as he gave Bakugo a good pat on the back. What if she says no, though? Bakugo asked, his voice breaking and showing a degree of concern. Listen, bro, sometimes you gotta let that manliness override your pride, or you'll get nowhere in life, Kirishima said with a smile. How could she say no to you? You're amazing, manly, strong, and good-looking. Anyone would say yes to you. Bakugo smirked. Yeah, guess you're right. It's just... I've only ever made a move on a girl once before, and it was when I was a kid. My memory's hazy, but she was a flower girl at a wedding, and I found a ring, so I gave it to her, but she obviously didn't care about me because she lost the ring. He said with a scowl, that memory's been with me ever since. That was when you were a kid, though, Kirishima said. You're older now, and who knows who that flower girl was? This is Yin. She wouldn't do something like that. Yeah, but that's the thing. Yin's such a wild card. Who knows what the hell she'll say? Bakugo scowled. Okay, look, just think on it, yeah? But I think you need to tell her how you really feel. Bakugo just grunted and turned back towards where everyone was. Let's go eat, he said briskly to Karishma. The redhead smiled and turned around too, ready to head back to the group and food. After dinner and chatting by the fire, you decided it was time to turn in for the night. It was close to midnight and you had had a massively emotional day and just wanted a bit of space. You and the girls headed inside to get changed and ready for bed. Well, someone was popular tonight, Mina teased as she nudged your arm. What do you mean? You asked innocently. Oh, come on, as if you don't know what I'm talking about, she said with an eye roll. Bakugo was just sitting there staring at you all night from across the fire and Todoroki was trying to find any excuse to touch you or look at you. You looked away shyly. Ugh, you make it sound so terrible when you word it like that. I'm just saying it how it is, she said with a smirk. So who are you going to choose? What do you mean choose? Well, they're both obviously into you. Which one do you like? She pressed. You looked away, flustered as all heck. Oh my god, Mina, don't do this to me. I don't even know. Like, yeah, I'm angry at back ago, but if he asked me out, I'd probably say yes. But same goes for show. Then you remembered something important. Bakugo told me I wasn't his type, he said, looking back to Mina with a deadpan expression. What? When? She gasped. When we were picking up sticks and stuff for the fire, I'm so confused, because when I asked him what his type of girl was that he liked, it sounded like he described me. Then he immediately said I wasn't his type, he said with a perplexed look on your face. I don't get him at all. He sounds like he likes you, but is afraid to say it, Mina said. If he doesn't like you, then why was he looking at you all damn night? I don't know, you groaned dramatically. I can't figure him out. Yeah, well, that's probably how he feels about you too, she said with a laugh. Ugh, you grunted. I think I need to go for a walk. I'm starting to stress. All good, babes. You go. Don't go too far, though, and come back in a half hour, yeah? Okay, mum, you said with a cheeky tongue poking out. I'll be back. I just need to calm down before bed. All good, she said dismissively. Plus, I want to grill Jiro about Kaminari, she said with a devilish smile, turning her attention on Jiro, who was just sitting quietly listening to this whole conversation. Wait, what? Jiro yelped with a giant blush. I, I don't like him. He's an idiot. Sure, Mina teased. You slipped out while they were still talking and tiptoed down the hallway and out the door, jogging off down the beach a little way before settling back to a walk. It was a beautiful night, clear and mild, and you looked up at the moon as you walked, the ocean breeze lifting your hair slightly as the sounds of the waves crashed on the shore, caressed your ears and calmed your senses. All other noises faded away as you walked further and further from the house. Yun, a voice called to you, and you looked back over your shoulder. Shoto was jogging up to you. Sorry, I caught a glimpse of you leaving, and I wanted to spend a bit of time with you. 
I hope you don't mind. Oh, no, not at all, he said with a smile as he stopped and waited for him to catch up. How is your grandma doing? He asked as he fell in step beside you. You sighed and updated him on the happenings as best you could. Grandma was the last thing on your mind right now, as you had two boys rivaling for your attention sitting front and centre. You and Shoto ended up walking the length of the beach and ended up on the rocks at the furthest end, just chatting generally and telling stories. Ah, man, it's so nice out here, you commented as you looked around at the water lapping gently against the rocks. It's beautiful. Water always calms me, Shoto commented. It's also quite the romantic setting. You laughed. <laughs> I agree, it's almost like we need to kiss to complete the setting. You froze. What the hell did I just say? Shoto was looking at you. You dared not move. You dared not make eye contact. You just continued to stare straight ahead. I immediately regret this decision. Yin, he said lowly. Oh, I'm sorry, Shoto. That was such a weird thing to say. I. He grabbed your hand gently and squeezed it, forcing you to bring your attention to him. You looked at him and swallowed absolutely nothing because your mouth had run dry. Would you allow me to kiss you? He asked as he turned his face to you his dual-coloured fringe swaying gently in the night breeze. You found it easier to focus in on his left eye as the moonlight had caught it at that angle and it shone as he looked at you intently. Yes, you replied softly, your answer coming out more like a question than a statement. Would it complicate your situation with Bakugo if I kissed you? He asked. I don't know, you replied. Your brain had turned to mush at this point and was basically useless to you. I would like to kiss you, Yin. But I fear it would mess up your promise that you made to your grandma. I will wait patiently for you, and when the time is right, I would like to express how I feel about you. Bitch, you basically could just confess to me, you screamed internally. May I hug you instead, Yin? You nodded numbly and reached your arms up around his neck as he stepped into you and wrapped his arms around your waist to hold you against him. You had never felt more safe in all your life. Gently he bent his head down and tucked it into your neck, his warm skin pressed against yours. You were in such a state of bliss that you started praying that this hug would never end. This is nice. You mumble stuttered as you turned your head slightly to snuggle into his neck more. It is. He confirmed in his low voice, the vibrations from his words reverberating through you as your breathing became a bit erratic. Your heart had been beating so fast for so long now that your breathing rate was having to spike a bit to keep an adequate amount of oxygen circulating so you wouldn't pass out. Are you okay, Yin? Shoto asked, pulling back from you a bit. Yes, definitely, my body's just spazzing out a bit, but no biggie, you replied with a laugh. Shoto had no idea what you were meaning, but the smile on your face told him that you were okay, so he just smiled softly as he released you from the hug. We best head back, so the rest don't worry about you, he said as he turned and held his hand out to you. You took it, and the two of you walked all the way back to the beach house holding hands. It had been the most perfect ending to the day, and you went to sleep that night with a giant grin on your face. As the afternoon on Sunday drew nearer, you all packed up your things and got ready to head back home. It was going to be school the next day, unfortunately, and none of you were looking forward to the work side of things, but you were definitely excited to be seeing Shoto again so soon. You picked up your bag and headed out of the house, walking down onto the sand to join the others. Bakugo had avoided you and wasn't even looking at you, but right now you were Team Todoroki, so you could have cared less that he wasn't paying you any attention. You were having a good chat to Jiro when you suddenly realised your necklace and ring had gone missing from around your neck. <gasps> My necklace! You screamed, scaring Jiro with the sudden panic in your voice. When did you have it last? She asked, clicking straight into detective mode. Um, uh, this morning, then, um, uh, lunch, and then, I don't know, you wailed. Okay, okay, so it could be in the house still, she said calmly. Let's have a look. Just then, Karishma bounded out of the house. Hey girls, is this anyone's? He asked, holding up your necklace and ring. Yes, oh my god, thank you, Kiri, you yelled with relief. Where was it? In your girls' room. I thought I'd do one last sweep of the house to make sure we hadn't forgotten anything, he said with a big toothy grin. Glad I did. Oh, I'm glad you did too, he said with relief, and took it from his outstretched hand. It's a pretty ring, Yin. Where'd you get it? He asked curiously. Oh, um, I was given it a long time ago, you said with a smile. Is it a family heirloom thing? He asked. You laughed. Katsuki asked the same thing. No, it was given by someone special. Oh, that's sweet, he said gently. A childhood sweetheart? Yeah, kind of like that, you said with a laugh. I was a flower girl at a wedding. Karishma's eyes shot wide open. 
Wait, what? You looked at him, confused by his sudden change. Uh, yeah, and a boy gave it to me? You continued, a knot forming in your stomach. There was something about the way that he responded to you that had you a bit uneasy. Kurishima just stood there. Are you okay? You asked hesitantly. Kurishima shook his head slightly. No, uh, yes, uh, I mean yes. Yes, I'm fine, sorry. He said with an uneasy giggle. Well, I'd better get going. He added with a chuckle and rubbed to the back of the neck. I'll, um, I'll see you at school tomorrow. You watched him go, wondering what all that was about. Then it clicked. <gasps> no, what if Katsuki remembers the wedding and the ring and he's told Kiri, oh crap, I haven't even asked Katsuki about this. Back you go, back you go, wait up. Karishma called out frantically to the blonde, who was just done with this whole stupid weekend thing. What? Bakugo snapped impatiently as Kiri came up beside him. She, the rig, it's her, she's her, the flower girl, Kiri panted incoherently. The hell? Shitty hair, slow down, what the hell are you saying? She's the, she's the girl, she has the ring, Karishma shouted emphatically. Who's the girl? Yin, she's the flower girl, you gave the ring to, she has the ring. Kurishma yelled again as he puffed to get his breath back. What? Not following, Bakugo said with a confused look on his face. Kurishima explained what you'd said and linked it to the story that Bakugo had told him, but Bakugo still wasn't convinced. I don't even remember what she looked like, so it could be just a coincidence. Plus, a flower girl lost the ring, he said with a shrug. Bro, it's not a coincidence, Kiri said, running in front of him to grab Bakugo by the shoulders. I think it's her. And she's found the ring again and has kept it ever since. Bakugo clicked, acting like he dismissed the whole thing. But really, the cogs were turning and he was determined to get to the bottom of this. Old hag, I'm home! Bakugo yelled as he entered the house. I have something to ask you. He called out again as he plopped his bag down and walked into the kitchen to get a drink. Well, I have some fantastic news, Mitsuki yelled back as she walked into the kitchen. Power of attorney has been overthrown. Huh? Bakugo asked with a scowl. You know how we hired a lawyer to try and get the power of attorney lit title lifted from your auntie who had control of the assets, etc.? She asked. Yeah. Well, we just got news today it's been approved. She no longer controls the accounts, Mitsuki said with excitement. Which means you don't have to fake a relationship if you don't want to. You can ask you now for real now, she said with a sly grin. As if I would do that, Bakugo snapped angrily, a heavy blush settling across his cheeks. Actually... Speaking of Yin, he said, looking away as he fiddled with a glass that he had pulled out of the cupboard. Grandma is her grandma's best friend, right? Would there have been a chance that Yin and I met as kids? Mitsuki thought for a bit. Yeah, I think so. At a wedding, maybe? Bakugo's eyes widened. Where are the photo albums? He asked abruptly. In the study, why? Mitsuki asked curiously. No reason, he said before walking past her to the study, opening cupboards and yanking out all the photo albums he could find. After a good hour of searching, he found a photo album that had pictures of his family at a wedding. He slowed his furious flicking and took his time scanning each photo, looking for two things, a ring and a flower girl. He turned the page over and his eyes fell on a picture at the bottom of the album. There was a photo of him standing next to a gorgeous little flower girl in the garden of what he could only assume was the wedding venue. He lifted the protective plastic covering and slid the photo out. We're taking this to school tomorrow. Good morning, Yin, Shoto said in his usual soft, monotone voice as he approached your desk. Good morning, Shoto, you replied, giving him a nice big smile. I enjoyed spending time with you over the weekend, especially Saturday night, he said, then turned to walk over to his desk. Mina turned and gave you a, and what happened on Saturday night? Look, which made you look away and panic internally. You hadn't told her or Jiro about almost kissing Shoto and how he had basically confessed his love for you and then hugged you and held hands. Trying to be discreet, you shook your head at her, trying to silently dismiss what Shoto had just said, but she obviously wasn't buying it. Just then, your seat got kicked from behind you and you knew exactly who it was. What do you want, you cherry-eyed b- Katsuki, you asked, almost forgetting to address him by his first name. I need to talk to you in first break, he said lowly. The tone in his voice, dead serious. You always need to talk to me, you muttered with annoyance. I don't want to talk to you though, just leave me alone, okay? This is serious, Yin. You glared at him. I swear to God, Cat, if you waste my time, I will drop you like a ton of bricks. Fine, he replied confidently. But you'll see what's so important once we talk. You rolled your eyes and turned back to face the front of the classroom, 
crossing your arms across your chest in a huff. Shoto had been watching the interaction between you and Bakugo, and he frowned slightly. He didn't like that Bakugo kept making you either upset or angry. What is it? You snapped at Katsuki as he stopped you in the stairwell at the other end of the building. Not many people use that stairwell. He stepped up to you, backing you up against the wall with one hand up beside your head. The way he had you boxed in slightly took your breath away. The devilish smirk that he was sporting didn't help either. So, he said lowly, his crimson eyes locking onto yours. You want to tell me about that ring you keep around your neck? I don't have to tell you anything, you replied defiantly. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a picture, the same picture that he had pulled out of the album the night before. He held it up in front of your face. You want to explain this then? He asked in a tone that you couldn't quite decipher. It was almost smug. You looked at the picture and paled slightly. Where'd you get that? You asked softly. From the photo album at home. He replied, still watching your face intently. That's you, isn't it? You glanced at the picture and looked back at him, hesitating. Don't you lie to me again, he growled. You sighed. <sighs> okay, it's me. What of it? You said, gritting your teeth and trying to downplay just how flustered you were about this whole situation slowly being revealed. I gave you that ring, didn't I? He said lowly, putting the picture back in his pocket and raising his other hand to box the other side of your head. I, I, I don't know, you replied, looking away from him. I told you not to lie. He said lowly, I gave you that ring. I know I did. So? You asked, trying to hide your embarrassment with anger. It's fate, isn't it? He said, leaning in that little bit closer to you. You pressed yourself back into the wall, his hot breath on your neck, causing you to break out in goosebumps. What's this about fate when you literally told me on the weekend that I, I, I wasn't your type? You said, slightly breathlessly. His body was so close to you it caused you to lose a bit of composure. I lied, he said lowly as he leaned closer still, his fringe brushing the side of your head as you swallowed thickly. I can see how your body reacts to me again. I know you like me too, he added in a raspy tone, his lips coming closer to your neck. Back you go, a voice said sharply. Back you go yanked back and looked in the direction of the voice. Your icy hot knight in shining armour had found you both and was not happy about how close back you go was to you. Forgive my intrusion. But I was the one who gave you in that ring in the garden at the wedding. Shoto said lowly as he walked towards Bakugo and gripped the wrist of the blonde's arm that was closest to him. Bakugo yanked his arm away from Shoto and pushed off the wall. Your jaw was hanging open as you just stared at Shoto. But, but I, I thought you said you didn't... Mm, sorry again, I lied to you, but I have my reasons. Shoto said sadly, having said that, I feel I need to set things straight now that I have a rival. He added shooting an icy stare at Bakugo with his gorgeous heterochromic eyes. Screw you, half and half bastard, you weren't even at the wedding. Bakugo seethed. Unfortunately for you, I was. Shoto replied nonchalantly. Um, I can confirm that with a photo. You chimed in. The hell? Bakugo snapped in surprise. So what the hell's happening here? From what I just heard, Bakugo, I believe that I know the full story now. Shoto stated calmly. When I got the courage to talk to Yin at the wedding, she was looking for something. She told me she had lost a ring. He said, looking at you, I happened to find the ring and I gave it to her. See? I gave you the ring first! Bakugo interjected loudly, his eyes burning into you. You looked back at Bakugo and then back to Shoto. Wait, I'm, I'm so confused. I don't remember having the ring and then losing it though. I just remember a boy giving it to me and saying, Yin, when we get older, will you marry me? Shoto said softly, interjecting and proving that he knew the line. Your mouth fell open. That's what the boy said, you whispered as your sparkling eyes met his. He nodded softly as he gazed at you. Big deal, Bakugo interjected. Doesn't mean anything now, because you're my girl. Listen, I'm not your girl. You do not own me. This fake dating thing is only going to go on until my grand... Your words faltered and you pursed your lips together. And plus... Shoto knows we're faking, so there, he said. Bakugo's eyes shot open. Since when did Icy Hot know? Since I told him, okay? You snapped, getting more and more frustrated with the situation. You turned to walk between the two boys, but Shoto put his arm out to stop you. Yin, I... No! Shoto, you lied to me. Why did you lie to me? You shot at him, 
hot, angry tears spilling down your cheeks. You told me you didn't give me the ring, but you obviously did. You pushed his hand aside and stormed past, breaking into a run and heading for the girls' toilets. Your heart ached for so many reasons. One, the adrenaline of Bakugo finding out that he had been at the wedding and given you the ring. Two, the way he had boxed you in like that had, and had literally just confessed his feelings in his own weird Sundari way was hot as hell. And not going to lie, you were hella turned on by his dominance and confidence. Uh, side note, was he going to kiss you? And three, Shoto had lied to you. Your trustworthy prince had shattered his perfect image. Why would he have done that? So many mixed emotions spilled forth and you didn't know how you were going to look them in the eye for the rest of that day. You know what? I'm done with today. I'm out bitches. I'm going home. And with that, you snuck out of the bathroom, grabbed your bag from the lockers and ran home. Yin, you'd better have a good reason for being home this early, your mum yelled as you entered the house. You had texted her that you were coming home early and had promptly ignored all of her following texts after you'd sent the first one. This reason is the god of all reasons, you called back, trying to keep up your cheerful facade. Your mum rounded the corner and took one look at you inside, her face showing her concern. She knew something was wrong. Okay, who do I need to murder? She asked with a sympathetic smile. What happened, Peewee? Just the way she softened and used your nickname made you fall apart and you burst into tears. She walked over and hugged you. Are you okay? She asked softly, patting your head. No, <laughs> you wailed. I'm terrible at decisions and right now I think I want two husbands. What the heck, child? She replied with a laugh. I thought this was serious. It is! You wailed again. Why can't I have two boyfriends? Yin, you're not making any sense. You tearfully told her about what had happened in the stairwell and how all the new information had overwhelmed you. It's just too much now and I don't know what to do. You sighed, wiping your eyes. Ah... Uh. It's tough being beautiful, hey? My head up mugging boggy for my fellow readers. Your mum said with a chuckle. But that's what I don't get. I'm a potato. Why they fight over potato? Potato fight? No comprende. You said, making weird hand gestures. Uh, potato kink? Your mum offered. You deadpanned. Okay, that's the weirdest thing I've ever heard you say. But still, what do I do? I don't know, hun. Your mum replied with a sigh. But don't apply for a polygamic wedding because it won't work. Ugh, fine, rain on my parade, you said with an eye roll as you moped up the stairs to your room. Yin, there's someone here to see you, your mum called out later that evening. I'm watching my anime husband be amazing for ten minutes, can I come back later? You called back to her. His name is Shoto Todoroki, she yelled back. You screamed and then yelled an apology and came flying down the stairs. It was indeed a very low-key, flustered-looking Shoto Todoroki, standing awkwardly in the door, twisting his bag strapped nervously in hand. Hello, Yin. Pardon my intrusion, but there's something I need to apologise for. He said softly as his, he hung his head. Ah, uh, come in, you stammered, showing him to the lounge area. He nodded and followed you, sitting stiffly down on the seats. Oh, water, drink, drink? Do you want anything to drink? You asked, fumbling for words. Oh, no, thank you. I'm fine, he said, still semi-avoiding eye contact. Um, okay, so what's up? You are sitting down in a seat adjacent to him. Yin, I feel terrible that I lied to you. That was wrong, he said. I only told you that it wasn't me, because I thought that it would get in the way of your promise to your grandma. I know how much you love her, and I didn't want to interfere. But then when I heard Bakugo confessing, he blushed and looked away. I knew I needed to tell you. And Yin, he added, looking back into your eyes. If you'll have me, I intend to stay true to that promise that I made to you on that day. Your heart skipped a beat and tripped on its untied shoelaces and then fell face first into your gut. Did Shoto just uh, propose to me? Um, uh, wow, okay. Um, this has been a really big day with a lot of information to process, so thank you for apologising and explaining. And, um, as for the promise, I just... I can't make any decisions right now. I completely understand you, and this is certainly not the right time for me to be pushing for an answer. So all I want to say is that I'll be here for you, no matter what. You smiled and relaxed. Thanks, Shoto. You're always welcome, Yin. He replied with a soft smile. Both boys were a little more subdued the next day. Shoto gave you a little smile and a head nod as you entered the classroom, 
and Bakugo leaned back in his chair and gave you a sharp jerk of the head up with a grunt as you sat down. But apart from that, there was no other interaction. The two of them had seen the state that you had been in yesterday before you left early and both felt bad that they had made you feel uncomfortable. Okay, a voice said from the front of the class. Everyone was looking in the direction of the voice but no one could see where it was coming from until you stood up and saw Aizawa in his yellow sleeping bag on the floor. What is with this yellow caffeinated addicted slug? You thought as you sat back down again. This weekend we have a class camp on, he said with a yawn. Personally, I could care less, but get your parents to sign the permission slip. I'm getting Midoriya to hand back to you all, he said in a flat, lifeless tone. The wad of papers came to you, and you took one before handing it back to Bakugo without looking. His fingers gently touched yours and ran from your knuckles to your fingertips before he grabbed the papers and took them from you. Your heart glitched. Oh, damn it, exploder son. Why do you have to touch me like that? Pleased with his flirtatious move, he settled back and took a paper before passing the wad of papers on. Fast forward to camp. The bus pulled up to the stop and the excited chatter increased as everyone looked out the window to the cabins nearby. Yin, this is going to be such a fun weekend! Lena squealed, grabbing onto you and shaking you with violent excitement. Oh, I just hope I survive, you sighed as you allowed her to shake you. Your two heartthrobs had been in a bit of a tense standoff all week, and you felt like this was going to be one of those weekends where they'd both try and win you over at the same time. You stood up from your seat and shuffled out into the aisle, reaching up to try and grab your bag from the overhead compartment. Being a little too short to reach it, you tried to jump a few times to snag the handle so you could yank it down. Oh, get it. Here. A sharp, gruff voice said from behind you, and a body pressed into you as you watched the owner of the voice reach up and get your bag effortlessly and pull it down for you. This is why you need a man like me. The voice whispered lowly in your ear, their hot breath tickling your ear as they remained right behind you. You glanced back, your eyes locking with the burning crimson ones of your sunny Baku babe. Thanks, I'll keep it in mind, you said coolly as you took the bag from his hand and turned to walk down the bus aisle. I'm serious about you, Yin. Bakugo said lowly again as he caught your arm to stop you for a second. You jumped a little with the sudden spike in adrenaline and nodded, not wanting to draw attention by holding the line of people up who were behind you and Bakugo. Get a room, you two! Kaminari called from the back of the bus, still unaware of the whole faking situation. The only people who knew about your true situation with Bakugo were Shoto, Mina, Jiro and Karishima, but only Bakugo knew that his side of the fake dating deal had been resolved. He was just holding that title till he could ask you out properly, whenever that might be. Yin, please allow me to carry your bags for you. Shoto offered from the seat in front of where you'd been sitting. He had been waiting for you to walk past so he could cut in in front of Bakugo and follow you out, but Bakugo's little display of manliness had foiled his plans. You turned and smiled at Shoto, handing him your bag. Thank you, Shoto, you said as Bakugo let go of your arm and turned to scream death threats at Kaminari. Finally, the line was moving again and you all filed out of the bus. Once you'd settled down in your respective dorm rooms, Aizawa called everyone out so that he could give a rundown of what would happen during the camp. Before I pass out from sleep deprivation, here is what will be happening tonight and over the next few days, he said with a yawn and heavy eyelids. We'll be cooking curry for dinner tonight on the outdoor stoves, so you'll need to get firewood. Then tomorrow we have quirk training, endurance exercises, test of courage and hot springs bath. Sunday we'll be exercising, packing and then home. There were ripples of excited chatter and even you had to admit it sounded like a pretty good weekend. Okay, go and get firewood from now. Aizawa said before turning and stumbling towards the teacher's sleeping quarters like a zombie. You looked at Mina and Juro. Okay, let's go, he said, leading the way. Mina, be my partner for cooking, you called over to her as you walked back with an armload of firewood. You're gonna want to be with me, Yin. Bakugo said lowly as he passed you. And why is that? You asked curiously. Be my partner and find out, he said with a smirk and a wink as he made his way over to the stove. Oh my god, smooth as caramel, he mused, your interest peaking at his vague yet confident statements. You go be with your boyfriend, babe, Mina said with a mischievous smirk. I'll pair with Joe, and we'll try and get a stove next to Kaminari. What, why, why would we want to be near that half-baked idiot? Joe stammered with embarrassment, ducking her head down and blushing. 
because you so have the hots for him and he has the hots for you and I'm going to get you two together, Mina said enthusiastically. Jiro groaned and covered her face with embarrassment as you laughed and headed over to Bakugo, who had secretly been stressing that you wouldn't come over to him. He gave you a proud smirk as you approached. You're gonna frickin' love this. My curry's the best. Bakugo announced proudly as you walked up beside him. So what do you need me to do? You asked, putting the wood down and placing your hands on your hips. Grab a knife. I'm gonna show you how it's done. He said proudly as he wielded his own knife carelessly. Do I trust you with that thing? You said, nodding towards the knife that he was waving around. You don't need to worry about anything. But if Icy Hop gets any cute ideas... You lay one finger on him, you said lowly, a very serious threatening look in your eye. Bakugo scowled at your protectiveness of his love rival and put the knife down. Whatever. I'll organise the vegetables first, if you want to get the wood in place. Roger, you said with a sharp salute. He shook his head, trying not to let his amusement show. Let me light it for you, Yin. Shoto said, coming up beside you. Oi, half and half. Back off, yeah. She's got it, Bakugo growled. Actually, Shoto, your quirk would be really handy right now, he said brightly, ignoring the black aura radiating from Bakugo. Shoto crouched down, ignoring the seething blonde and helped you arrange the wood, your hands touching multiple times. You were a mess by the end of it, but he seemed very calm. Please stand back in. I wouldn't want you getting hurt, he said softly as his left hand activated and burst into flames. He held it under the wood and waited for it to catch a light before removing his hand. There. He said with a small smile, standing up and walking past you, your fingertips brushing gently as he passed. Bakugo never saw it. Oi, let's get started. Pick up a knife, Bakugo ordered, setting up a chopping board for you and handing you a peeled potato. You took it from him and stepped forwards, placing the potato on the chopping board, ready to attack it with the knife. Do you even know how to hold a knife? Bakugo shot. You're going to cut your clumsy ass. Okay, here, he said walking up behind you and wrapping his arms around you, his right hand over your right hand to show you how to cut properly. Katsuki, I, I know how to chop, you don't need to... Yes, I do, he said as he pressed into you, his head lowered to your ear, almost resting on your shoulder. Plus, this position's comfortable, he added lowly. You immediately started heating up and you glanced around, but no one had noticed just how close Bakugo was to you. You're getting flustered, Yin, he said his breath tickling your neck. Calm down and work with me. I I can't when you're so close, you whispered, your mouth running dry. Why? Is it because you like feeling me this close? You can't focus on anything else, he asked slowly again. You couldn't deny his words, so you decided to grit your teeth and push through, allowing him to guide your hand and focus on chopping. Better, he grunted after he had guided you for a bit. You see, he said proudly. I don't need supervision anymore, prickle pants. You can stand next to me instead of behind me. Oh, you want to feel something in my pants, do you? He rasped, his hand sliding from the top of your hand up your arm, creating a wave of goosebumps as it went. You can't deny your feelings for me, Yin. He said, watching how you broke out in a sweat at his touch. Your body gives you away. E enough, Katsuki! You growled with embarrassment. <laughs> he smirked as he pulled back from you. I'll have you by the end of this camp. He sniggered. You pouted as you chopped, trying to ignore just how forward he was being. Whew, mate, he's really feeling the pressure now that Shoto's on the scene. Here, try it, Bakugo insisted after you two had finished cooking. He turned to you and held out the ladle for you to try the curry that he'd just cooked. It's still hot though. Just freaking blow on it and try it, he grumbled, getting nervous about your critiquing of his dish. You leaned forwards and blew on the contents of the label before placing your lips to the edge of it. You had to admit it smelled amazing and after taking a sip you couldn't deny that that tasted amazing too. Whoa! You gasped as a bit of the sauce dripped down your chin. That's amazing! You spilled it! Bakugo scowled, placing a thumb to your chin and wiping the spilled contents off. Don't respect my curry like that. It's a sign of appreciation! You pouted. Messy eating's my specialised skill. If it drips like that again, I'll lick it off, he said with a mischievous smirk. You made damn sure that it didn't drip the next time you tried a bit. He served up two bowls, one for you and one for him, and you were about to walk over to the table to eat when Shoto appeared holding his own bowl of curry. Yin, I would be honoured if you would try my curry, he said as he held out his bowl to you, 
head bowed politely. Oh, of course, Shoto, I'd love to, you said happily as you quickly placed your bowl down on the table nearby and accepted the spoon and curry bowl from Shoto. You dipped the spoon in and tried it. Oh, wow, this is gorgeous, Shoto, very creamy, you complimented him. He smiled gratefully. This bowl is for you, Yin. Midoriya and I made plenty, he said, offering you his bowl. She already has a bowl of my perfect curry, half enough bastard, Bakugo growled from nearby. I can eat too, he replied happily. I'm a curry whore. Bakugo snorted and Shoto didn't know what to say, but he was just grateful that you accepted his offering. As you sat down with Bakugo across from you, others joined your table, with Shoto making a beeline for the seat beside you. The rest of dinner was spent with your and Shoto's leg almost intertwined under the table. Every time you moved, he would adjust so that he was touching your leg again. You found it very cute indeed. The first night of camp was uneventful with the boys once you had all gone to bed, but you and the girls of 1A sat up chatting about all kinds of things and talking about each other's crushes. The next day was full on with quirk training and endurance exercises and you couldn't help but admire just how into it your boys were getting. Bakugo had his shirt off, throwing explosions left, right and centre as he ran around and your eyes drank in his chiselled form hungrily. He caught you oogling him at one point and smirked, flexing just that little bit more so he could show off to you. You looked away, embarrassed at getting caught. Your eyes then found Shoto, who was half submerged in a drum of water, alternating the use of his fire and ice quirks to regulate the water temperature, pushing his body to the extremes of hot and cold. He locked eyes with you the minute that you looked at him, his mouth hanging open slightly as he panted from the exertion, sweat dripping down his fine features, making his hair cling to his face. There was something about a sweat-drenched Shoto that made you bite your lip. You shook your head and tried to refocus on your quirk exercise, using the mental images of Bakugo and Shoto to channel your emotions so you could manipulate your quirk better. The endurance exercises were equally as gruelling and you couldn't wait for the tough part of this day to be over so that you could have some fun and then relax in the hot springs after. Just then Aizawa called an end to the day and a groan of relief escaped your lips as you wiped your forehead with your sleeve. Yes, time to eat, rinse off and then have a fun evening, you thought with a smile. After a quick shower, you threw some casual clothes on and joined the rest of the class outside for the test of courage. Okay, everyone knows how this works, Aizawa said with a sigh. Pairs of two at a time follow this track, he said, pointing to a dirt track that led into the forest. There will be ghosts and monsters along the way, so beware. Some of the girls squealed quietly with fright while you snorted. Pfft, can't be that scary, can it? Okay, time to draw numbers from this hut, Aizawa said in a deadpan voice, holding out a black cap. You stood in line and took a number out of the hat when it was your turn. I got number eight, you said as you walked up to Mina. I got three, she replied. Who got number three? Kirishima's voice rang out. I did, Mina called. Oh, Mina, we must be partners then, Kirishima replied cheerfully. Did, um, did anyone get eight? You called out. That would be me, Yin, Shoto replied, walking over to you. You tried to hide the massive smile on your face as he approached you, his eyes shining in the darkness as he stopped in front of you. I'm most happy with how things have worked out. He said softly as he looked down at you. Same, Shoto. You replied softly as you blushed, looking away. Yin, may I hold your hand during this test of courage so I can keep you close? He asked slowly. Sure, you replied, taking his hand in yours. He squeezed it gently and pulled you closer to him. You lined up, ready to go, and all of a sudden you felt nervous. What if it actually was scary and you screamed like an idiot? One by one, the couples were released, and the first set started down the track. It wasn't long before you heard the distant screams clearly and you shuddered. Don't worry, Yin. I'm here, Shoto said in his monotone, soft voice, his eyes trained on the darkness ahead. You nodded, grateful that you had been paired with him. Just then, you remembered Bakugo. I wonder who Katsuki got paired with. You looked over your shoulder to try and see if you could spot him in any of the pairs behind you, but you couldn't see him. Is everything all right, Yin? Shoto asked upon seeing you looking back. Oh, uh, fine, yep, all good, you replied, looking back uh, to the front. Yin and Todoroki, Aizawa said as he stepped forward. Time to go. He waved his arm in an open gesture and you took a step forwards and into the darkness. Were we allowed torches? You whispered to Shoto. Not sure, his voice replied in the darkness. But I can cast a flame with my finger to cast a light if you'd like. 
No, maybe not. That might draw attention, he whispered back. Just then, something hideous jumped out from behind a tree, and you screamed while you turned and clung to Shoto. He wrapped his left arm around you protectively, and instinctively threw his right arm out to cast an ice blast. He only just managed to calm the ice stream to a bare minimum before it hit its target, but a little bit still hit the monster. Ah, Taroki, dude! Chill out with the quirk, yeah? You heard Kaminari's voice plead underneath the mask and outfit. You sighed with relief. Oh, it's you, Kaminari. Yeah, I'm monster number one, he replied with a laugh. Beware of ghost three, though. He's out for Todoroki's blood. Who would be out for show? Oh, Katsuki. Gotcha. Thanks for the heads up, he said with a nervous chuckle. You and Shoto walked on, still hand in hand. Do you think Katsuki would really try and hurt you? You are Shoto? Yes, he replied solemnly. He knows my intention regarding you. You bit the inside of your cheek nervously. Each time a monster or ghost popped out, you'd end up in Shoto's warm embrace, feeling very safe and comfortable. It was now down to ghost number three, and you knew Bakugo wouldn't do a sneak attack. When he jumps out at us, take cover. Shoto said lowly, he's after me, so I'm going to fight back. You nodded. Yin, Shoto said as he stopped. You looked at him curiously. I'll never back down from Bakugo. You deserve better than him. Tonight... I'll prove myself as a worthy boyfriend. Your heart skipped a beat as he pulled on your hand a bit to spin you towards him, your free palm coming up to his chest as he gazed down at you in the darkness. Not a lot could be seen, but the pounding of your hearts could be felt. Suddenly there was a loud bang and an explosion detonated from nearby. Shoto knew who it was immediately and spun you around behind him before holding his arm out to block the oncoming threat. He's here, Shoto called. Go now, Yin. You ran from behind him, aiming for a tree nearby so you could watch the fight and intervene if need be. Get your hands off it, bastard! Bakugo hollered as he hurled through the air, propelled by his explosion. I clearly do not have my hands currently on her, Bakugo. Shoto replied coolly as he raised his right arm and shot up a wall of ice between him and the mid-air Bakugo. Bakugo's eyes widened as he realised he was about to slam headfirst into Shoto's ice wall, but at the last minute he threw his right arm out to the side and blasted a shot, changing his course instantly and aiming himself at a tree. He tucked his feet under himself and as he connected with the tree trunk he launched from it and around the ice wall toward Shoto. Die! he screamed, his white ghost outfit flapping furiously as he flew towards his opponent. Shoto raised his left arm out to the side and activated his fire quirk, flames bursting from his being, almost blindingly bright, showing Bakugo exactly where he was as the explosive blonde hurled towards him. Die! Bakugo screamed again as he approached. His right arm reared back, ready to throw a hard right hook once he got close enough, but at the last moment Shoto deactivated his quirk and jumped away, leaving Bakugo temporarily blinded by the sudden loss of light and, un and unable to locate his target. Shoto had already calculated where Bakugo would be at that point when he jumped away, and as the dual-haired hero landed he stomped his right foot and shot a shard of ice in Bakugo's direction, just grazing Bakugo on the back as he flew past, ripping the ghost costume and setting the blonde careering off course. <coughs> you gasped as you heard the sickening thud of Bakugo hit the ground heavily, followed by a gasp and heavy coughing. Shoto, wait! You called out, springing from behind the tree and running towards where you could still just make out Shoto's form. Stop! Please stop! You begged, grabbing onto Shoto's shirt as you reached him. I'm sorry, Yin. Shoto said softly upon hearing the distress in your voice. Who says we're done here? Friggin' half and half! Bakugo's gasping voice growled from the darkness. You don't know when to quit, Bakugo. Shoto replied darkly. Clearly, you are no match for me. That reply angered Bakugo, and as he released a throaty roar, releasing small explosions from the palm of his hands, he staggered to his feet. Bro! Bakugo! Wait! Hold on! Kirishima's voice pierced the darkness. Oh, thank God. You breathe. Kirishima seemed to be the only person that Bakugo would listen to, and the adorable redhead was the voice of reason a lot of the time. Is everything okay? You heard Mina call as she ran towards you. Yes, we're fine now, you called back, still in Shoto's embrace, as you heard Karishima talking back you go down from a second duel. What happened? Mina asked as she jogged up to you. Ugh, Prickle got his all-white knickers in a knot and needed to get them ironed out by Shoto, you stated calmly to Mina. Ah, she replied, nodding knowingly. You, <clears throat> you know what kind of underwear 
Shoto stammered with a heavy blush that went unseen in the darkness. I, I did not know you already had that type of relationship with Bakugo, Yin. Huh? Oh, no, no. Oh, no, 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 no. Not like that. It's a figure of speech. I've, I've never, we, we've never. You blabbered, gripping harder onto his shirt and shaking the material. And I've never ironed Bakugo's undergarments before either. Shoto stated seriously. Shut up, you icy hot bastard. Bakugo screamed from nearby. After Karishma had defused the situation, all four of the rest of the Courage attendees headed to the finish line, leaving Bakugo to scare the rest of the students coming through. You'd been impressed with Shoto's calm and intelligent fighting style, and you couldn't get over how clever he'd been to use his fire as a blinding tool instead of an attack strategy. During the fight, he hadn't said anything except for at the beginning and the end, and it let Bakugo spiral out of control with his own rage, basically letting him self-destruct. But then your mind would keep replaying the sound of Bakugo hitting the ground, and your heart would sink a little. Ugh, that must have hurt like a mother drugger, hitting the ground so heavily. Not to mention the feeling of losing to someone you consider a fierce rival. I kind of feel sorry for Katsuki's ego right now. Bakugo was fuming with humiliation, and he was aching from the fight. When Shoto had sent the ice shard towards him, a jagged edge had grazed his back, ripping the back of his costume and shirt open. His back stung, and he could feel blood running down his torso, which only seemed to fuel his anger. His arm ached slightly too, where he'd only just managed to raise it up to break his fall. He sighed forcefully. All he could hear in his mind was your pleading for Shoto to stop. She thinks I'm pathetic. Later on, you collected your things together for the hot tub and joined Mina and Jiro as they headed to the bathhouse. The owner was waiting for everyone to assemble before giving a little rundown of how the rules worked. This bathhouse is many centuries old, he started by saying, giving a brief history on the original owner and some interesting facts about how and why it was built. Bakugo scowled and glanced at you. His eyes travelled your body, taking in your curves as he stood behind and slightly to the side of you. He was so distracted that he didn't hear the part where the owner explained the signs. Instead of a male and female sign above the hot springs pool, there was a dragonfly and a bee sign. Neither of these related to male or female, they'd been put there because one pool seemed to attract more dragonflies around it, and the other one seemed to attract more bees to the plants around it. The bee side was now known as the female only hot springs pool, and the dragonfly side was now the male only hot springs pool. Bakugo followed the rest of the boys into the change room, taking his clothes off and putting them in a locker before wrapping a small towel around his waist and walking into the bath and shower part, taking a seat at one of the taps to wash his hair. He scrubbed angrily as he worked, essentially ignoring the frivolities of his fellow classmates. Bro! Karishma gasped when he glanced over at Bakugo's back. Are you okay? Your back is badly gouged. Shut up, shitty hair. Bakugo growled. I'm fine. Does it sting, bro? I can get some dressings on it for you. Said I'm fine, okay? Bakugo snapped, whipping his head around to stare Karishma down. Oh, okay, okay. Karishma replied softly, backing away. Bakugo clicked his tongue and washed the shampoo out of his hair quickly before standing abruptly and walking to the door that led to the hot springs. He paused when he saw the signs and his angry eyes flicked from the dragonfly sign to the bee sign and back again. What the hell is this? Which one's for the guys? He mulled over them before concluding that the B-side must be for the males and marched on in. He was the first to enter the pristine steaming waters of the outdoor hot springs pool and he waded in flinging the towel from around his waist and tossing it across the rocks before marching in and making his way to the far end of the pool. He was in a bad mood and didn't really want to interact with anyone at that point, so he stood in the back corner of the pool and sank down the hot water enveloping the wound on his back and causing him to hiss sharply as the stinging sensation peaked. My hell, that hurts. You rinsed yourself quickly in the shower section, keen to get out into the relaxing atmosphere of the hot springs pool. I'm going ahead, you called happily to Mina, tiptoeing out the door to the hot springs entrance. You walked under the B sign and gasped in awe at the beautiful setting of the outdoor pool. Untying the knot on your towel, you let it fall to the ground as you stepped into the water. The warmth drew you in as you took another step, inhaling deeply and sighing in the silence of the night. It was dark outside, but you didn't wait for your eyes to adjust. You just let the water guide you as you kept walking in deeper and deeper. You headed to the far end of the pool and you thought you saw a head, but all the girls were still in the shower section, so it must have just been a plant or something. 
The plant swayed and turned around, its red eyes flickering in the moonlight. Wait. Katsuki? You gasped and then screamed, dropping down into the water to hide your nakedness. He lunged at you and smacked a hand over your mouth, the other hand gripping your arm. Shh! Shut up! Don't scream! He hissed slowly. What the hell are you doing in here? He growled. He slowly took his hand away to allow you to reply, but kept a firm grip on your arm. What? This is the girl's side! You hissed completely mortified. The B sign is the girl's side! What? He hissed back. Why the hell would it be the girl's side? I don't know! You wailed quietly. That's just how the original owner designed it. Well, he's an idiot. Katsuki, this current conversation has nothing to do with anything. You need to get the hell out of here before the rest of the girls get in here. Oh, hell. He spat, standing up. You squealed and covered your face as you had just caught a glimpse of a full frontal Bakugo edition. Realising he'd just exposed himself to you, he sank quickly back down into the water with a heavy blush. Oh, sorry, I... Go! Please, just go! You wailed into your hands. He turned to head out of the pool when Mina came bounding through the door and threw her towel off, running and splashing into the water with a squeal of delight. Crap! Bakugo gasped and turned back around to you. You pulled your hands away upon hearing Mina's voice and gasped. Oh, no, 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 you cried. Quick, Kaski, get around behind me, hide. He obeyed, swimming behind you and placing himself between you and the rocks behind. Yen, where are you? I can't see you, Mina called. You breathed out a sigh of relief. Oh, okay, so she doesn't know Bakugo is in here yet. Um, my mum, over here, you said sheepishly. Suddenly you felt Bakugo's hand caress your sides as he sunk deeper into the water. You suppressed a squeal. You knew he was just trying to keep you within arm's reach so that he could remain behind you should you move suddenly, but feeling his hands on your bare hips was a sensation you definitely weren't ready for. Ah, how nice and relaxing is it in here? Mina sighed happily as she sank down into the water and swam over to you. You backed up a bit as she got closer, not wanting her to see Bakugo behind you. As you reversed, you felt your back press into his upper torso. Bakugo didn't want his own back to touch the rocks behind him because of his injury, so he didn't move back when you did. You tripped on his foot and fell back slightly, sitting into his lap. You felt his fingertips grip into you as your soft backside sat down onto him, his spiky hair brushing the back of your neck at the water level as he held his breath and ducked under the water a little. Your entire being flushed and froze. Great, mother of all might, I'm sitting in Bakugo's lap right now. Suddenly you felt something hard press against your butt cheek and you screamed. Mina jumped. What is it? Oh, nothing. I'm just happy and I want to scream for joy. You lied, laughing hysterically with a hint of panic. Hey, Yin, Mina asked quietly. Who do you think's bigger? Bakugo or Todoroki? She asked seductively with an eyebrow wiggle. You screamed again. Well, the one I'm feeling pressed up against my ass right now is anything but small, you thought internally. But Mina, you can't ask a question like that, you wailed with embarrassment. Oh, come on, she cajoled candidly. Personally, I think Bakugo might be packing a little more heat, but you never know, Todoroki might be that little bit bigger. You squealed again as you felt the hard thing against your backside twitch, and you shifted forward slightly. Mina, I don't even know where to start with answering. Just then, Jiro and Yurarika entered the pool, giggling and laughing as they hopped in. Mina looked over and saw them, waving and splashing furiously as she waded towards them. Hey, hey, we're discussing important things over here, she said with a cheeky giggle as she bounced around in the water. What kind of important things? Jiro asked bluntly. The size allocation of the 1A boys? Mina said with an exaggerated eyebrow wiggle. While Yurarika was squealing with embarrassment and Jiro was trying to talk Mina around the topic, you turned your head slightly to the side to whisper to Bakugo. How the hell are you going to get out of here? Jump the fence. He whispered back, his mouth making bubbles as he spoke just on the waterline. The only problem is, my hands are freaking wet, so I don't know how well my quirk's going to work. Ah, oh, fudge. You grunted softly. Okay, well, I'll try and create a diversion. Wait. You can't move, idiot. Otherwise they'll see me. He hissed slowly. Okay, uh, I'll stay here for now, but I need to move forwards because... Because... Uh, reasons. You stammered embarrassedly. Just then, Momo arrived, and she created her own diversion with the size of her breasts. 
Oh my god! Mina screamed. I'm so jealous of your boobs! She lunged at Momo, who screamed and tried to escape the gropes of the envious pink-skinned beauty, while the other girls who were present giggled and watched on. You reached back and tapped Bakugo rapidly on the side, who took your cue and jumped up out of the water, making for the fence that divided the two pools. He shook his hands rapidly, trying to get as much water off his palms as possible, so his quirk would work well, and he threw his hands back at the ground as he neared the wall. You hopped up and ran towards the group of girls, splashing and trying to keep their attention away from the buck-naked Bakugo, who had almost reached the fence. As you heard the crackle of his explosions, you screamed and shrieked to cover the sound, and all seemed to be going to plan. Everyone was confused by your sudden splash and scream attack, but soon everyone else had joined in. Jiro was the only one who happened to look in the direction of the escaping Bakugo, just as he cleared the fence and descended onto the other side. She froze, eyes glued to the fence. What's up, Jiro? You asked, half out of breath. I... I thought I saw a flying ass. She said in the most hollow tone you'd ever heard her use. Oh, <laughs> oh you must be seeing things, you laughed forcefully. Why would there be a flying ass over the fence? I don't know, but I'm scarred for life, she replied in a dead tone. Oof, you and me both for slightly different reasons, but still, I feel you, girl, you thought sympathetically. After Bakugo's event, everyone settled down and relaxed in the warm water. It was indeed refreshing, but certain images kept popping up in your mind, making you blush. Why was he aroused? Do I turn him on? How do I face him after tonight? After hopping out of the pool and drying yourself, you got changed, looking for your precious ring necklace, but you couldn't find it. Ugh, seriously? You groaned. Again? What's up, babe? Mina asked, hearing your annoyed exclamation. I've lost my necklace and ring again. Okay, well then, let's retrace steps. Where'd you have it last? She asked. You thought for a bit and realised it must have come off when Bakugo and Shoto were duelling out in the Test of Courage track. Ugh, oh, damn it, it must be there, you grumbled. I'll go look for it. I'll come with, Mina said with a smile. Nah, don't worry, babes, I'll go by myself. I'll be fine, he replied dismissively. I don't think that's a good idea, she said. Let me help. Okay, he resigned, walking out of the bathhouse with her and back to the girls' room to get your torch. Bro, are you sure you're okay? Karishma asked as Bakugo prepared to leave the boys' room. Yeah, the blonde grunted. Just want some air. Okay, bro, if you're sure. The grumpy blonde grunted in response and left. Kiri watched him go but decided to leave him be to cool off a bit. Bakugo shoved his fists deeper into his pockets and stalked down the steps and out into the darkness, his mind replaying the events in the hot springs pool as a heavy blush covered his cheeks. She definitely felt me against her. I know she did. Yeah, I can't even look her in the eye again. Just then he heard Mina's voice and looked up. He paled slightly and froze when he saw you walking beside her. Oh, back you go! Mina yelled happily when she saw the blonde standing still in the darkness. What you doing out here? Walking, he grunted. We're looking for Yin's necklace and ring. She lost it again. You had remained silently staring at the ground up until this point, but you hesitantly looked up to see what Bakugo's expression was. He was looking at you softly, still blushing slightly. You looked away. Well, I'll leave you two to find the necklace and ring together. Okay, bye! Mina yelled before turning on her heels and running away. Wait, me! You called after her, but she was gone. You looked back at Bakugo, who was scowling at the ground. Um, it's okay, I'll go on my own, you said quickly, turning towards the trail. I'm coming too dumbass. You'll probably get lost out there anyway, he said gruffly, still avoiding eye contact. Um, okay, you said, shining a torch down the dark track. You both walked silently side by side for a bit before he broke the silence. Hey, um, did, did you feel? He started softly. Your brain screamed with embarrassment instantly. Ah! What do I say? The stress from that pool situation? Yes, indeed, I did feel that, you said loudly with a nervous laugh. Phew, <laughs> glad that's all over, hey? You added with an exaggerated sigh and wipe of your brow. Let's never let that happen again, huh? But I get why you were confused. I mean, who would use bees and dragonfly symbols to indicate gender? That makes absolutely no sense whatsoever, you babbled on. Dude was probably senile as hell when he designed the plaque, or did it on purpose to confuse people so that things like that would happen. Stupid. Absolutely stupid. If it were me, I'd 
Suddenly Bakugo turned and backed you up against a tree, his hands pinning your wrists to the wide tree trunk. You talk too frickin' much, he growled as he held you in place. I'm nervous, you admitted bluntly. Why? He snapped. Because you're going to ask me if I felt your dick against me and I don't know whether to lie or tell the truth, he said honestly. Well, you obviously felt it then, because you just said so, he said lowly. Yep, okay, I did. End of story. Period. Finito, you said, struggling to get free. Quit fidgeting. I need you to listen to me, he growled, the light from your torch catching the red in his eyes and making them shine. I, I'm, I'm sorry, he mumbled as he looked down. I just, my body did it on its own. I'm attracted to you, okay? He grunted, almost angrily. You don't need to explain it to me, he replied quietly. He looked up into your eyes and there was a moment as you both stood there panting slightly from the stress of the current conversation. His eyes flicked to your lips and you bit the bottom one nervously. What would you do if I kissed you? He asked slowly. Uh, I, uh, I, I don't know, a uh, kiss back, maybe? You whispered as your mouth ran dry. He leaned towards you a little and your breathing hitched. He held back from coming the whole way though and waited for you to close that gap on your end, but you were too frozen in place. After a few seconds, he pulled back and let you go. Not the right time, he muttered as he turned and headed off down the track. Whoa, wait, you can't just get my heart racing like that and then walk off, you said, almost angrily. So you wanted to kiss, he barked, spinning around to face you. If you really did, then you needed to close that 5% gap. I gave you that opportunity and didn't take it. He spun back around and marched off, so you chased him and grabbed his hand, yanking on it to turn him around. What do you want? He snapped as you lunged into his arms. He caught you and pulled you into him tightly, burying his head into the crook of your neck as he wrapped his arms around your waist. I'm, I'm pathetic, I know. I'm weak, useless. I know you're looking down on me, but heroes always win in the end. I'm going to win. Bakugo strained out, trying desperately to control his emotions. You hadn't banked on him opening up right there and then, and you didn't know the pain that he was holding on to until all of a sudden you realised just how big a hit his ego had taken when he fought with Shoto and had come off second best. You didn't say anything, you just let him hold you as you hugged him back. He stood there a little longer before pulling away and wiping his eyes, refusing to make eye contact. Let's go find your ring and necklace, he finally said holding out a hand for you, for you to hold it. You reached out and took it, figuring this little gesture was the least you could do for him right now. Searching everywhere hand in hand for over an hour, you finally found it beside the tree that you had been hiding behind during the fight between him and Shoto earlier. I found it! You yelled as you held it up in the torchlight. Okay, good, let's go. Bakugo grunted, turning around to head back while letting go of your hand. It was then that you saw the back of his shirt and it seemed to have a bit of a stain on it so you shone your torch on him. Blood was oozing through his shirt and you screamed. Katsuki, you're back, what happened? Nothing dumbass, he shot back with an embarrassment as he tried to turn away so you couldn't see it anymore. Let's just go back. No, let me see, you insisted. You can't do anything, so just leave it, he growled. When did this happen? Was it when you fought Shoto or when you were escaping the girls pool? You pressed. The fight, he grunted. This ice got me. You gasped softly and tried to lift his shirt. Stop it, he barked, unwilling to let you see. Stop pitying me. I'm not pitying you, you hat. I just want to see the damage, you responded sharply as you managed to pull his shirt up. You gasped again and nearly dropped your torch. It was a deep gouge that spanned from his left rib side cage to his right shoulder blade. Katsuki, this is really bad. You need to get it treated, he said softly. Fine, he grunted allowing you to pull his shirt back down again gently. When you got back to the cabins, everyone was asleep, so you told Bakugo to try and rest as best he could and you'd be with him tomorrow when he went to see the site nurse. He just nodded and looked away. Oi, he said as he started to walk towards the girls' room. You stopped. What is it, Katsuki? Thank you, he mumbled, for tonight. All good in the hood, you replied stupidly before turning and running. Ugh, that's the worst reply ever, Yin. Well done, you berated yourself internally. Bakugo smirked as he watched you go. Can't believe I like this idiot. The next day was Sunday. Exercise, then pack up and go home. You woke early and made your way over to the boys' cabin, 
determined to drag Bakugo's stubborn ass to the nurse's office to be fixed up, whether he liked it or not. You found his room and knocked on the door softly. Hearing footsteps on the other side, you stepped back a bit and waited for the person to open up. A very sleepy Karishma in nothing but boxer shorts opened the door to you, spiky red hair all over the place. Oh, Yin, he rasped in his just woke up voice. Hey, you here for Bakugo? Uh, uh, yeah, you said, averting your eyes so you wouldn't be caught staring at his very fine looking chest and abs. Um, he's still asleep, but you can come in and wake him up, Karishma offered, opening the door wider to let you in. Is that really a good idea, to wake the bear? You said with a chuckle as you walked in and towards Bakugo's bed. You reached out and touched the covers that were lumped over Bakugo. Oi, you said softly. Get up, Katsuki. Time to see the nurse. At first there was no response, so you pulled the covers back a bit, exposing a very sweaty-looking head. He was turned away from you, facing the wall. Katsuki... You stopped, taking a closer look at him. He was shallow breathing and covered in sweat. Hey, you said, slightly shocked. Katsuki, are you okay? You pulled the covers back more and he groaned, his body shaking slightly and pale to look at. Katsuki, you gasped. Hey, hey, what's up? You leaned forwards and placed your hand on his sweaty forehead. He was burning up. Krishma, you yelled, your head whipping to the side. Katsuki has a fever. We need to get him to the nurse's office now. The red head flew into action throwing a shirt on quickly and grabbing his red crocs before coming back to help Bakugo out of bed. You gently pulled the covers back and exposed Bakugo, who had chosen to sleep in his boxer shorts too, his slashed up back facing you as you pulled the sheet down. This looks bad, Krishma, you muttered when you saw the state of Bakugo's wounds. I think I might be infected. Krishma nodded sadly. Yeah, I, I agree, Yin, he said, coming around to Bakugo's head and trying to talk him into getting up. What do you want, shitty hair? Bakugo moaned. Leave me alone. I just want to sleep. Bro, we need to get you to the nurse. You're not well at all, Krishma said, concerned. Bakugo groaned again and swore as he rolled over, trying to sit up but failing. Hey, hey, easy, Katsuki, you cooed, grabbing under his arm and trying to hold him up in a sitting position so he wouldn't flop back onto the bed. His half-littered gaze met yours and he froze, staring at you intently. Oh, damn, he whispered, then looked across to Karishma. She's gorgeous, bro, he mumbled slightly. You looked away with embarrassment. Ah, uh, um, seriously, he mumbled again, looking back to you with unfocused, fever-induced stare. You're a babe. What's your name? D does, does he not remember me? You stammered with embarrassment to Kiri, who just shrugged with confusion. Uh, Katsuki, it's me, he said with an embarrassed laugh. Oh, hell yeah, first name basis, he slurred. Are we dating? Oh, please, so we're dating. God, you're hot. Um, you stammered nervously. Uh, look, l let's just get you to the nurse, hey? Uh, we can discuss this later. I'll go if you're going, he said again with one of the sexiest fever-drunk smirks you'd ever seen. You and Karishima pulled him up to standing, and Kiri wrapped Bakugo's arm across his shoulder, his hand around the blonde's lower back and on his waist to support him while you took the other side, trying to hold your fever-drunk blonde bomb as you, best you could. Mm. Bakugo moaned slightly. I love it when you have your hands on me, babe. He looked down at you with a bit of lust in his eyes. I don't know how much of this type of Bakugo I can take, he said to Karishima with a laugh. Well, it's certainly something different, Kirishma laughed, struggling to hold the staggering back ago. Finally, you and Kiri got him to the nurse's office and knocked sharply on the door. She answered, and after taking one look at the panting, sweating back ago, knew something was wrong. Bring him in. What happened? She asked as she indicated for you and Kiri to lie him down on one of the beds nearby. Um, he has a bad injury on his back. Uh, he got it yesterday afternoon, and I think it might be infected, he said, rolling back ago on his side to show the nurse. She nodded and grabbed some medical supplies immediately, giving Bakugo a needle to get some antibiotics into him immediately. He m might have sepsis, she said as she assessed the wound. His body's fighting a systemic infection. Um, is he going to be okay? You asked with concern. Yes, I think so, but he needs immediate medical attention from a hospital, so I'll call for an ambulance for him right away. Please stay here and I'll be right back. 
she said before quickly leaving the room to call from the office. Um, Yin, I need to get ready for training exercises today. Are you okay to stay here with him? Karishma asked. Yeah, of course, he replied. You go, I'll be out once the nurse comes back. Karishma nodded and thanked you before leaving. You sighed and sat down on the bed next to Bakugo, resting one hand gently on his as he panted furiously. You're gonna be okay, you whispered to him. Is... is everyone gone? Bakugo whispered softly. Yeah, they're gone. Kiri's gone back to the boys' cabin and the nurse is calling the ambulance. Good, he said, popping an eye open and giving you a mischievous smirk. Before you knew it, Bakugo had grabbed you and yanked you down on the bed, pulling you under him while he hovered shakily over the top of you, caging you in with his arms and legs. Now that we're alone, he said in a low, carnal tone as he lowered his sweaty head to your neck. I can show you just how much I like you. K Katsuki! You squealed. No! What, what are you doing, you half-baked pizza roll? His hot breath came in short, sharp bursts as his sweaty lips ghosted your skin. Mm, baby, I love it when you say my name. He rasped lowly, his arms shaking violently as he struggled to hold his body weight above you. Katsuki, you're sick and sweaty as hell. And yes, I said your name, but I also called you a pizza roll. Are you just going to forget that? You protested as he placed a few rough, needy kisses on your neck. You're calling me Katsuki. We're together, right? He asked slowly again as he lowered his hips to yours, a firm bulge pressing into your thigh as you tried to shift out from underneath him. You squealed. I don't want to feel that again. Oh, you mean this? He asked, grinding his hips into you as he clenched his jaw together. Mm, I want you so badly. Stop, Katsu, please! You begged, trying to push his torso off you so you could slide out from underneath him. He bent his head back down to you and kissed you along your neck, coming up to your jawline and moaning softly in your ear. Your body flushed with a strange tingling sensation, and all of a sudden you were wanting more, but at the same time, not. You wrapped your fingers up around the back of his neck and wove them into the base of his hair, gripping onto him as he made his way towards your lips, kissing across your cheek and out a corner of your lips. Your heart was pounding as his sweaty face hovered above yours, big beads of sweat dotting across his forehead. Suddenly his lips were on yours and you both let out a soft sigh as he kissed, his sweaty torso lowering onto yours as he let out a guttural groan of pleasure as your mouths moved together, his tongue slipping between your lips as he slowly rocked his hips into yours. You were so stunned it took you a second to register what was happening before you quickly turned your head to the side, breaking the kiss as you looked away. His head fell into the crook of your neck and he passed out, his whole body weight sinking onto you, nearly crushing you underneath him. Oh God, you're hopeless, you lukewarm beverage. You grumbled as you struggled to get out from underneath him. You were almost out when the nurse returned. Ah, uh, he um, pulled me in for a, a fever cuddle, you said quickly as the nurse entered the room. She smiled sympathetically. He won't remember any of this. He was well and truly out of it when you brought him in, and it's probably for the best. Oh, thank God, you exclaimed. The nurse gave you a confused look. Oh, I mean, um, well, we did have to drag him here, so that might not have been a pleasant experience. She nodded, accepting your answer. You're free to go now. I'll watch him till the ambulance arrives. I know you have morning activities to attend to, so please go ahead, she said with a smile. Oh, thanks, you replied, giving back a go one last look before leaving. Oh my god, I can't believe that just happened, you thought as you left the nurse's office, touching your lips. Yun, is everything all right? A gentle yet strong voice called to you as you walked down the hall. You looked up to see Shoto walking towards you. Your heart skipped a beat. He looked as handsome as ever, his beautiful, clear, mismatched eyes peering at you intently from beneath his two-tone fringe. Yes, I'm fine. Bakugo has a fever and his injury is the cause, so he has to go to hospital, you said as you walked up to him. Yes, I met Karishma just beforehand, and he told me about the gash on Bakugo's back, Shoto said solemnly. That was my doing, I assume. Yeah, it happened during the fight you two had on the trail, but it's okay, he'll be fine. Shoto nodded and looked at you with concern. Are you okay, Hien? You look a little shaken. Me? You laughed nervously. Oh, no, no, no. I'm fine. Let's get going to training, you said, jerking your head for him to follow you back to the cabins. Yun, ready. Aizawa barked and you crouched in the sprint position to start. It was training exercises and everyone was lined up, one behind the other, to do single timed runs through the bush. 
Okay, all I have to do is be faster than Minetta and I'm good, you thought. The grape gremlin was the slowest at these things, so you knew if you could beat his time, you'd be set. Go, Azawa yelled, and you took off down the trail, focusing all your energy on not falling over. Why is keeping upright the most difficult thing about this run? You thought as you tripped multiple times on absolutely nothing. The further you got down the track, the harder it seemed to get with logs and rocks that needed to be scaled to proceed to the finish line. You were coming up over a large mound of rocks when your mind wandered to what happened between you and Bakugo that morning. What now? I seriously hope he doesn't remember it. What if he does? Your concentration lapsed and you stepped slightly askew on one of the rocks, rolling your ankle sharply and going down heavily on one knee. You screamed out in pain and lost your balance, falling down the side of the rocks and into the coarse underbrush below. You hit a few hard tree stumps and rocks on the way down and just lay in a crumpled heap at the base of the small cliff. Bursting into tears, you stayed still for a bit, sobbing. You tried to move your left leg, but severe pain shot through it, and you cried out in anguish again. <laughs> Have I broken it? You thought as you looked down at it. It was cut up and grazed, but there were no bones protruding, so that was a good sign at least. You whimpered as you tried to sit up and wiped your eyes. Oh, I guess I need to wait for the next person to come past and yell to them, you thought, looking up and listening for anyone above. While you were still looking up the cliff, a noise nearby drew your attention, and you looked into the bush beside you to see what it was. A low, animalistic growl made your blood run cold. Mm, well, time to die. You stared at the bush that was nearby, your eyes glued to where you had heard the growl come from, but you couldn't see anything at that point. Presently you heard another low hiss that definitely sounded like an angry animal, and you panicked internally. Okay. I'm about to die. Shifting your weight, you winced, not exactly sure how to handle the situation at present. Okay, if I hold my hand out and touch whatever it is in the bush there, when it comes out, then I can activate my quirk on it and possibly bring it down before it eats me alive. Shakily, you held a hand out, waiting for the creature to present itself. Then you saw movement and a giant black cat emerged slowly from the thick underbrush, its ears flat back against its head as it bared its teeth at you. What the hell is that? Is that a jaguar? Black panther? They're not even native in Japan. You whimpered as the black cat stalked towards you, its tail twitching angrily. No! G go away! You half yelled shakily. The cat growled and hissed again. All of a sudden a figure landed in front of you in a classic hero pose, eyes shooting from his he right hand that had slammed into the earth the minute he touched down. The jaguar leapt to the side, dodging the ice and preparing to lunge at your hero, who activated both of his, his fire side and his ice side at the same time. You gasped. This was the first time you'd ever seen both quirks activated simultaneously, and you held your arm up to shield your eyes. It was a sight to behold as fire leapt from his left side and ice encased the ground on his right. Shoto was staring the cat down intently, willing it to back down, but for some reason this beast was out for blood and had backed away but was still facing the jewel-haired hero. Your hero deactivated both sides and waited, his eyes still on the cat, shirt half burnt off. Yun, are you okay? He called back to you, not taking his eyes off the black beast in front of him. N no, but I'm better now that you're here, you replied, tears welling up in your eyes. The cat crouched and pounced, with Shoto waiting for the last minute before activating his ice and freezing the beast on the spot. The second that he had encased the threat, he spun around to you breathing heavily as he came over to you. The stress of the situation, coupled with the relief of being saved by the guy you adored and not being eaten alive, caused you to burst into tears again, and Shoto captured you in his arms as he knelt down beside you. You're okay now. I'm here, he said softly as you bawled into his shirt, your knuckles going white as you gripped him like you feared he would disappear at any moment. Are you hurt, Yin? He asked slowly as he pulled back to check you over. You nodded as you sobbed and pointed to your left knee that was now becoming visibly swollen. What happened? He asked. You tearfully told him how you had twisted your ankle and then fallen on your knee and then rolled down the cliff and then this stupid jaguar appeared and how you believed you were going to die. Shoto couldn't help but smile at your wild arm gestures and the way you babbled about what had happened while snot and tears rolled down your face. Can you move? He asked, his worried eyes watching your face gently as you tried to shift your own weight again. You grimaced and he placed a hand on your shoulder. Don't move, he commanded. He placed his right hand over your knee and activated his quirk again slightly. We need to contain the swelling, 
he commented, looking down to watch what he was doing. You wiped your eyes and nose on your sleeve, sniffing heavily. He glanced back up at your face, his turquoise eye glistening as it locked onto you. It wasn't often that you got to see him up this close, and he nearly took your breath away. You just looked into his eye, then switched and looked into his grey eye. He just stayed transfixed on you. You're beautiful, he whispered quietly, throwing you completely with his gentle adoration, his left hand still softly holding your shoulder. I look like a potato with sweaty eyeballs, you replied in the most deadpan voice you could muster. I'll be honest with you, Yin. I don't really understand how you can compare yourself with a potato. He said with the most innocently perplexed look on his face, and it made you laugh. <laughs> you really are gorgeous, Shoto, you giggled. His face flushed, and he pulled back from you, looking away with embarrassment. You reached out and tossed his dual-coloured hair, and he hesitated to look back at you and cleared his throat. Um, well, in any case, we need to get you medical attention, he said, looking up the small cliff that you'd fallen down as he frowned. How are we going to get back up there because I seriously can't move, you said glumly. That is true, he replied. We'll listen for the next person that comes along the trail, and if we hear them we can call out for them to help, because I'm not leaving you. You smiled softly. Okay, sounds good. In the meantime, he said, standing and walking around behind you, you must rest. He gently hooked his hands under your arms and dragged you closer to the base of the cliff so he could sit down with his back to it and you could lean up against him. Yin, would you mind using me to rest against? I don't want you to feel uncomfortable with being so close to me, he said softly in his monotone voice. Boy, if you don't insist I lean against you, I'm going to throw a tantrum. You reassured him that you would be very happy with being close to him, and then he positioned you between his legs so he could reach his right hand across your body and hold it to your left knee. Pardon me, Yin, is this okay? He asked slowly. You swallowed thickly and nodded, trying to calm your breathing. He instructed you to lean back against his torso, and you did, with heart pounding, as he rested his left arm protectively around your shoulders. Are you comfortable, Yin? Shoto asked slowly as he held you against himself. You nodded. You were more enraptured with his scent to give him a verbal reply. He smelled like campfires and the wind of snow. It was an intriguing mixture and you breathed in deeply, trying to commit it to memory. Shoto was enjoying having you alone without the interference of the exploding nuisance and he wanted to ask you so many questions, but didn't want to come off as needy, pushy or nosy, but he just had to know where he stood. Y Yin. I apologise if this is sudden, he said, pausing to collect his thoughts, but uh, I would like to know if your heart rate increased, if you see me more than just a friend. I know now is not the right time for me to be asking you to consider a relationship with me, but a Shoto, he replied, turning your head to look up into his eyes as he gazed down at you. I definitely see you as more than a friend. I... I really like you, you mumbled shyly, blinking as you found it hard to maintain eye contact. You didn't have to try and prove your worthiness to me this weekend. I already know how wonderful you are. Shoto blushed and glanced to the side. Um, I, I get jealous when I see you with Bakugo, but I understand the situation is complicated. It's just, I can see that he has feelings for you. You nodded. Yeah, I know. He said, turning your head back around and nestling into him again. And I'm kind of torn about that too, because I think I like him a little too, you thought. Like I said before though, Yin, I will wait for you until you are ready to make your decision. Thank you, Shoto, he said, looking back at him. Suddenly he looked up. Midoriya, he said as he looked up the cliff. You looked to where he was looking but couldn't see anyone. You breathed in and then let out a yell. Midoriya! You hollered. Yin? The reply came. Where are you? Over the side of the cliff! You yelled back. His beautiful freckled face popped over the edge as he looked down and saw you and Shoto together. T Todoroki! He yelled. Are you guys okay? We're fine, Midoriya. But I just need some help getting Yin back up. She is injured. Shoto called back. Midoriya looked back down the cliff and decided that he could jump down with his quirk, so he activated and leapt from the rocks above, green lightning coursing through his veins as he absorbed the impact on landing. What her? He screamed when he noticed the jaguar eye statue. 
Yep, that's the correct response, Midoriya, you called out. Did it try and attack you both? He yelped. Not only me, but Shoto just got to me in time, you said with relief. Yeah, that's Todoroki for you. Always turns up right when you need him, Midoriya replied with an admiring gaze at the jewel head hero boy, still holding you in his embrace. Um, so, where are you injured, Yin? Midoriya asked, rubbing the back of his neck bashfully. The position Shoto had you in, in between his legs, was causing Midoriya to get a little flustered. You two looked very comfortable with each other, but weren't you and Bakugo supposed to be going out? Here, Midoriya, Shoto said as he lifted his right hand off your knee, revealing the swelling. Oh, I see. You were cooling her knee with your quirk, Todoroki. Oh, I'm very impressed, Midoriya fanboyed. Shoto nodded. I don't know how many other injuries she has, so I was hesitant to move her too much. Um, should we alert Aizawa? Midoriya asked. Yes, I think so. Best to get a stretcher, Shoto replied. Oh, of course, Midoriya said enthusiastically. Will you be okay here while I get help? Yes, we'll be fine, Shoto said, placing his hand back on your knee. Midoriya nodded and stood back a bit, crouching slightly as he activated his quirk and then jumped his way back up the cliff. You and Shoto chatted until Midoriya returned with Aizawa and a few other classmates who all set about helping get you up the cliff again. Momo created a stretcher and Tokoyami with Dark Shadow helped to guide you up while Shoto used his quirk to create a pillar that he stood on to get himself back up the cliff. Aizawa had called for an ambulance and you were carried to the back of it and loaded in. Shoto insisted on going with you to the hospital and climbed into the back as well while Aizawa grumbled about injuries and paperwork. Shoto was very attentive to you as they moved you from a stretcher to CT scan bed and then on to another bed and wheeled you to the holding bay. You had finally been given a phone so you could text your mum and tell her what had happened and Shoto left to get some food for you both while you conversed with her. You were near the nurse's desk and there were two younger nurses chatting about a particularly interesting patient in bed bay 7 that you'd just happened to overhear. Well, he's grumpy but he's good looking, one said. The other giggled. He's old, you're a spib. You're probably closer to his age, and I don't go for blondes. Your interest peaked. Grumpy blonde? Surely not. You buzzed for the nurse and she walked over to you. Hello, Miss Lynn. What can I do for you? Oh, um, sorry, I just had a question. The guy in Bay 7, it's a wild guess, but he wouldn't happen to be Katsuki Bakugo, would he? The nurse looked at you curiously. Sorry, love. I'm unable to disclose names of other patients, but if I have your permission to disclose your name to patient in Bay 7, and he happens to know you, then that's okay. Uh, yeah, that's fine, you replied. Tell him I say hello. She nodded and walked out. A few minutes later, she returned. Uh, love, I've got a message from Bay patient in Bay 7, she said, then paused. Please excuse my language, as I'm going to repeat the patient's exact words. You stifled a giggle. The nurse took a deep breath in and repeated Bakugo's words exactly. What the actual hell is Yun doing in the hospital? Which bed is she in? Make sure you take really good care of her, okay? Don't repeat that last part. You burst out laughing. You can tell I'm in bay three, the nurse said. Okay, bay three. And that I have an injured leg and he can come visit me if he's allowed. Stress the allowed part, you said with a laugh. The nurse nodded and left just as Shoto returned. My apologies for being late, Yin, he said as he presented a big plastic bag laden with food. Your eyes nearly fell out of your head. Food, you moaned, sounding like a starved zombie. I didn't know what you wanted, so I bought a few different options, he replied sheepishly. Meh, I'll eat anything, he replied dismissively. Thank you so much for getting so many things. What did you buy? You asked, bouncing eagerly in the hospital bed. Shoto gave you a small, amused smile. You looked like a little girl who had just been gifted her first giant teddy bear. He walked over and placed the bag down next to you on the bed, pulling up a chair so that he could sit beside you. I went to the ramen shop just outside the hospital and got ramen and cold soba, he said plainly, lifting out the two dishes and placing them down beside you. Then some snacks, he added as he pulled out some pocky sticks and other desserts. Then mochi balls. He pulled those out too. Whoa, you went all out, you said, your eyes as big as saucers as you looked over the delicious array of food items. Anything for you, Yin, he said, 
his beautiful heterochromic eyes gazing fondly at you. Your heart fluttered. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate it. He nodded and handed you some chopsticks and a plastic spoon. You quickly broke the chopsticks and eagerly awaited him to pass you the bowl of ramen, digging into it the minute he had taken the lid off for you. He smiled and patted your head softly. Slow down, Yin. You'll get a stomach ache. He tried it gently, finding your love of food adorable. You looked up at him, cheeks full of noodles, and nodded sheepishly with a closed-lipped grin and goofy look on your face. He settled back in his seat and opened his cold, sober noodles, holding the bowl up slightly and inhaling the aroma tenderly before setting the dish back down and taking the chopsticks out of their paper covering and breaking them. He held his hands together with the chopsticks between his thumbs and the edge of his index finger and took a moment to hold them up in silent prayer before eating. You watched curiously. That's um, it was quite a ritual you got there, you commented, mouth still half packed with food. Yes, he replied. Sober noodles are to be revered. You would have laughed except he was so dead serious about his noodle dish that you dared not, just in case there was a sober noodle god who was watching, ready to smite you the minute you dared laugh at his sober disciple. You watched Shoto savour each mouthful, chewing slowly and reverently enjoying his meal. You swallowed yet another whole ass bunch of noodles before speaking. Shoto, can I try some soba? His eyes flicked up and met yours. You could almost feel the internal struggle. This was a test. He looked back down his dish and then to you, waging a war within himself. Finally, he nodded slowly and took a small portion of noodles in his chopsticks, standing slightly and leaning over to you. Open your mouth, Yin, he said lowly. You obeyed, maintaining eye contact with him as you did so. He gently placed the noodles in your mouth and you chewed them slowly, letting your eyes flutter closed so you could focus on the flavours. Shoto was spellbound. He had expected you to inhale them like he did with the ramen noodles, but you were respecting the soba just the way he did, and not going to lie, he was a little turned on by it. H how was it? He asked as you opened your eyes and swallowed. Amazing, you breathed. He blushed. Thank you for enjoying them, he said softly, before sitting down and continuing his meal. You grinned. Also, Yin, Midoriya rang to update me on how everything went after we left. Everyone got home safe, I presume? You said, reaching for the pocky sticks after having successfully downed a bowl of ramen noodles. Yes, Shoto replied, but Aizawa found out what that black cat was that almost attacked you. Oh, yes, I'm listening. Was it okay? Yes, it was still alive. It was an escaped jaguar from a travelling circus nearby and was out for blood, Shoto said as he opened a drink bottle. What do they plan to do with it? You asked, biting down on the pocky stick. Giving it to a wildlife sanctuary was the plan. Shoto replied, taking a sip of his drink. You nodded. Okay, well, at least it won't be back in the circus then. Shoto nodded too, watching you eat the chocolate sticks. Are they nice, Yin? He asked, his eyes trained on the stick in your mouth. Delicious, you replied, your word half mumbled by the stick in your mouth. Try one. He reached out to the packet and pulled it out. No, no, Shoto, this one. You said, poking your head and neck out towards him to indicate that he should try a bite from the stick in your mouth. He blushed heavily and froze. You wiggled your eyebrows, tempting him with a little giggle. Come on, you cajoled. I don't bite, you said as you wiggled the pocky stick in between your teeth, the tip of it waving enticingly. He continued with his hesitation and you thought you'd beaten him until he stood up and leaned forwards. Suddenly you were the bashful one. He moved with such determination it took you by surprise and you shrank back a bit. Oh, don't be coy now, Yin. He said lowly with a mischievous look in his eyes he leaned in. You offered. Well, yeah, that's true, but you were shy 0 0.02 seconds ago. Now you're dominant top rocky. His face neared yours and you pulled back even further, so he lunged for the pocky stick, his nose grazing yours as he bit the stick super close to your lips. You squealed and covered your mouth when he had moved back. Delicious, he said lowly as he sat back down proudly. I didn't even know you had it in you, Shoto, you replied with a smirk, referring to his dominant move. There are a lot of things you don't know about me, Yin, he said, his head lowered as his eyes burned into you with such a look in them that it rendered you speechless. What's that supposed to mean? you questioned nervously. Shoto smirked and reached for the pocky packet, pulling out another stick and putting it between his teeth like you had done. Come on, Yin. 
take a bite. He coaxed in a velvety smooth voice, leaning forward so you could take a bite. You're too far away, Shoto. I can't reach, he replied innocently. He took the bait and leaned in closer. Just then you lunged at him, and your lips just brushed his as you bit down on the pocky stick, quickly pulling away. He was stunned. You. He stuttered with his eyes wide in surprise. You giggled. Yes, Shoto? You asked as you tilted your head to the side, chewing the last of the stick down. I want a real one now, he said with a flicker of lust in his eye. A, a real one what? A kiss, he replied, slowly leaning in. Your heart started pounding as you leaned closer to him. Time seemed to be slowing down as your lips got closer and closer to his. Just then the doctor arrived with the results of your CT scan. Miss Lynn, how are you feeling? The pleasant lady doctor asked. You and Shoto quickly looked away in opposite directions and he pulled back, clearing his throat as he walked around to the other side of the hospital bed and leaned up against the wall. Um, okay, I guess, you replied, not quite knowing how to answer the question. I mean, what was the doctor referring to? Your leg or the fact that you're pretty sure you had a mild cardiac infarct from almost kissing Shoto? Well, you've done some serious damage to your knee and ankle, she said, walking over to the end of the bed and picking up your chart. There is a torsion injury in your knee, grade 2 tear of the medial collateral ligament, frayed fibres of the anterior cruciate ligament, and what looks to be a possible meniscus tear. You grimaced. Ugh, sounds like I'm about to die. She laughed. <laughs> no, not quite, but you will need some work done on it. I won't even get started on the ankle. Ma'am, we are students at UA. Our nurse, recovery girl, could heal Yin, correct? Shoto asked. Oh, you're from the hero course, the doctor asked, looking from Shoto to you. You both nodded. Well, yes, I'm sure she could, she said with a smile. We would, however, like to put you in a leg brace for now, Miss Lin, to prevent any further injury. You nodded. Yeah, that's a wise move, because I'm a klutz. The nurse continued. And we'll keep the pain medication up to you, because without that, you wouldn't be so chirpy right now. What do you mean? I'm doing fine, you replied. Yes, that's the endone talking, she said with a sigh. Just rest for now and we'll discuss your discharge and transfer to, to your UA nurse tomorrow. Okay, you replied with a smile as she turned and left the room. You glanced over at Shoto, who was still looking towards where the doctor had left. So, he said with a sheepish laugh, <laughs> where were we? His eyes met yours and a flicker of mischief sparked in them as he pushed off the wall and walked over to the bedside. He leaned down onto the side rail, his eyes burning into yours as his face came closer. You closed your eyes as you felt his nose gently brush the side of yours and your heads tilted to connect the lips. A tingle went through you as you felt his lips brush yours but no kiss came. You are on painkillers, Yin, he said, his face still millimetres from yours, his hot breath on your lips. I want to kiss you when you're well and not in a slightly altered state, but it doesn't mean I can't get close, he added on the end. The way he said that last bit sent a shiver down your spine. Your eyelids fluttered open and he pulled back. I must get going home, Yin, he said as he went to step away. You grabbed his arm. Don't go, you pleaded softly. I like you here with me. He smiled softly and turned back to you, reaching in to give you a hug as he gently kissed your cheek. I'll be back first thing in the morning. Call me if you need anything, he said as he turned to get his things. Thank you for being with me today, he said as he walked to the door. It was my pleasure, Yin, he said before politely nodding and leaving. You sighed and leaned back on the bed, clutching your heart. Whew, doki doki todoroki is going to be the death of me. 8pm that night, you were flicking through your phone on social media of choice, maybe on quirky fanfics when you heard a commotion outside in the hallway. Sir, please return to your bed. You should not be walking around, an elderly nurse implored. Shut it, old hag. Now see my girlfriend. You cracked a smile. Here he comes. You have a girlfriend? Lord have mercy on her, you heard the same elderly nurse say. A loud followed then. Yin, where are you? Bay three and stop telling people I'm your girlfriend, you called out trying to hide the growing grin on your face. You heard someone stalk purposefully down the hallway and you put your phone down, waiting for your explosion to burst through the door. What's up, cat sicky? You chirped as Bakugo marched through the door. Not sick, dumbass. Perfectly fine, he growled. What happened to your leg? I'll kill him. 
Calm down, you rogue pack of dynamite. It was me. I fell off a cliff. The hell? Yes. Can't freaking trust you alone, idiot. He sighed as he walked over and sat down on the end of the bed, making sure to keep the back of his gown facing away from you. Like you can talk, you walking septic disaster. Why didn't you get help sooner? You could have been in real trouble had I not come and found you in the morning. So you came in? He asked, eyeing you. Yeah, why? You asked dubiously. I don't remember anything between going to bed on Saturday night and then waking up the next morning in the nurse's office. He said angrily, what happened in that time frame that I was out? Uh, um, okay, well, first of all, I came in in the morning and you were already feverish. So you saw me in my boxes? He asked, his crimson eyes burning into you. Dude, I freaking sat in your lap naked in the hot springs pool. You snorted. Seeing you in clothes is a delight. Yeah, you were checking me out. I know it. Anyway, continue. He said with a dismissive hand wave. Anyway, you huffed. Karishma and I dragged your sorry, hallucinating ass to the nurse's office and dumped you there. End of story, you said, looking away abruptly. He studied the side of your face for a bit and then scowled. I said, don't lie to me, Yin, he growled. I'm not lying, you protested. That all happened. I don't doubt that that happened, but you're lying about the end of story. There's more to it, he said, narrowing his eyes at you. And what? You said you don't remember anything, so what would you know? You shot back at him your heart starting to pound in your chest. I don't remember anything, but I know you're lying for three reasons. One, he said, holding up a finger. Your end of storyline is too abrupt of an ending. Two, he said, flicking his second finger up. I had some pretty whack-ass dreams. And three, he said, holding up a third finger. Nurse said I tried to cuddle with you when we were alone. And I've noticed you've skipped that part of the story entirely. You flushed red, your heart still pumping a million miles an hour. Yeah, well, I skipped it because I thought that you'd be embarrassed about it, you said, loudly and defensively, crossing your arms across your chest. To be honest, I'm more embarrassed about the dreams I had, he grumbled. What were they? You asked curiously. <laughs> like I'd tell you, he snapped. Tell me, you demanded. He sighed. Fine, he resigned. Dreamed that I made out with a pizza roll. You snorted with laughter. Shut up, he snapped. Felt so damn real I was worried I'd actually... Actually what? <laughs> you laughed. Kissed someone. And the nurse was the only one in the room at the time, so I thought it might have been her. He said with a shudder. You laughed again, remembering that you had called him a half-baked pizza roll, so that must have infiltrated his delusional state. But you were alone with me at some point. He said, looking down. Did... You froze, his eyes looking back up at you questioningly. Did, did I... You swallowed, not daring to say anything at that point. Did I try and do something with you? He asked in an almost numb voice. You didn't know how to respond. Did you tell him or not? No. You replied softly, trying to maintain eye contact. The hell? He whispered. What did I do? I said no you didn't, he repeated. Yeah, I heard what you said, but you're lying in. He said lowly, his eyes searching yours. H how do you know I'm lying? You asked, your voice coming out as a dry rasp. Because I know you by now. And the pizza roll had your voice. You snorted. Shut up, he growled. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I can't. I just can't with the pizza roll. He replied, bursting into laughter, tears pricking the corner of your eyes. Yun, would you tell me what I did? He barked, lunging at you to pin you to the bed, his gown falling open from the back in the process, showing his back and ass, and threatening to show all of him, including the front. You shrieked. Put that thing back where it came from! Oh, so help me! Ugh! He yelped, yanking himself off you and hurriedly pulling his gown up. Just tell me what I did, Yin. Remember the pizza roll telling me to stop. Well, you should have listened to the pizza roll, shouldn't you? You yelled. Who listens to a pizza roll? He barked back. Well, not you, obviously, you snorted sarcastically. Did, did we kiss? You looked away, chewing your bottom lip and nodding slightly. W was it consensual? He asked softly. Look at you, using your big boy words, you replied with a smirk, trying to divert the conversation. I, I mean, did I force you to kiss me? Or did you do it of your own free will? He growled. 
Uh, both, he replied, staring him down. I don't know how both works here, he replied with a grunt. Well, it does, okay? So just leave it, he replied, looking away with a huff. Well, I was tripping balls, okay? So I wasn't in my right mind. You just shrugged. It's fine. I'm okay. Sorry, he grunted. I am. Really. You looked back at him. He was looking sadly down into his lap. He truly looked broken. So you softened. Hey, it's fine, okay? You didn't know what you were doing. I've forgiven that. Plus, he passed out on me anyway, so you didn't get very far. He sighed. Come here, he said, opening your arms. He looked up and saw the invitation for a hug and scooted closer, being mindful to hold the back of his hospital gown closed. Frickin' gowns, they open all the way up. Can't wear any underwear underneath, he grumbled as he shifted into your arms. You just snorted a laugh in response and hugged him. Sir, you are supposed to be hooked up to an IV line, the same elderly nurse as before gasped as she walked in and saw Bakugo sitting there without the drip in his arm. Bakugo pulled back from the hug. A thing gets in the way, he growled. I pulled it out. She gasped again and clasped her hands to her mouth. <gasps> no, 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 she tittered. Please return to your bed at once. Bakugo released a noise and stood up. Way to break the mood with my pizza roll, he growled to the nurse. You burst out laughing. <laughs> Go, Katsuki. I'll see you later. He nodded and marched out the door, desperately clutching the gown together at the back so you wouldn't see his bare ass as he walked back to his bed. Under much duress, the nurse got him back into his bed and checked his wounds over before rebandaging them and reinserting his IV line. He grumpily slumped back in the hospital bed and reached for his phone that was beside him, but he just couldn't think about anything else except for what he may have done to you when he was in a fevered state. He recalled the pizza roll weakly trying to fight him off while he caged it beneath himself, and he didn't remember exactly what he said, but he does remember the hot as kiss before blanking out. Man, did we actually make out? I remember there was a bit of tongue action. He shook his head, trying to correct his images, but the pizza roll remained burned into his memory. Later that evening, the nursing staff came in and put your knee and ankle in a full leg brace, adjusting the straps so that it fits snugly. You thanked them and they left you to sleep for the night. Getting comfortable was a bit of a pain and you moved around a bit to try and find the most comfortable position, falling into a restless sleep as the sporadic noises of the hospital would occasionally wake you. At 11pm, the new night nurse came in to introduce herself and check on you. Hi, Miss Lynn, she said in a bubbly tone. I'm your nurse for tonight. If you need anything, just buzz for me, okay? She checked a few things on your chart. You nodded groggily and fell asleep again. She was halfway through checking your medication list when she got an urgent call from another bed and left in a hurry, forgetting to document your pain medication. 3am, you awoke in agony and let out a sharp cry, fumbling for the buzzer that you couldn't find in your drowsy state and tried to sit up. Pain shot down your leg and you squealed, whimpering and biting down on the inside of your cheek to stop yourself from crying out too loudly. Ah, oh, my leg, you wailed internally. It hurts. It hurts so bad. You tried to look for the buzzer again, and you saw it on the bench, just out of reach, and you started sobbing as you desperately stretched your arm out towards it. I can't reach it. Tears streamed down your cheeks, and you toyed with the idea of just calling out to see if a nurse was close enough to hear you. Right next to the nurse's station... Someone should hear me, Ryan. Nurse, please, please help, you cried out, your voice quivering as you called for someone to come. Please, you wailed, your head lowering in despair. Nurse. You heard a crashing sound and a few swearing and your head shot up. Damn, Ivy line, the voice hollered down the empty hall. Katsuki, Katsuki, you wailed. Desperate for someone, anyone, to come and take this pain away. You heard running footsteps and he came flying through your door, his crimson eyes flashing in the dark, occasionally catching the light from buttons and side lights as he looked for you. What happened? Were you hurt? He barked, making his way to your bedside. My, my leg is killing me. You squealed out as tears continued to cascade down your face. Okay, okay, he replied frantically, pulling the covers back to look at your leg in the brace. Don't know what to do, he panicked. Get a nurse, Katsuki, please, you sobbed. Nurse. Ah, oh, nurse! 
He spun around, not bothering to close his gown at the back, and thankfully, or not thankfully, your eyes were so filled with tears that you didn't see his ass as he raced out the door. Where the hell are the nurses? You heard him scream out into the hallway and the nurse's station. We need help! In bed three, get your asses in here now or blast every single one of you! You half laughed as you continued to cry. He was dead serious about your state of well-being, and although he was threatening people unnecessarily, it was endearing in its own way. Sir, get back to your bed, an authoritative voice yelled. I'm not moving until you people do your damn job and attend my girlfriend. I'm not your girlfriend, you scream cried. Okay, fine, pizza roll, he hollered back. You snorted and wailed harder. Just then a nurse entered and saw your stricken state and attended to you right away, while another calmed your irate, pantsless hero and ushered him back to bed, hooking up the third IV line in less than 24 hours. Your boyfriend is an interesting character, the nurse said once she'd given you your pain medication and readjusted the brace. He's not my boyfriend, he's just a good friend of mine, you replied with a sheepish smile. She looked at you with a raised eyebrow. Well, look, honey, I've been around for a while and I can tell he really cares about you, so you might want to have a talk to him about some things and make sure you're on the same page, she said as she left the room. You didn't respond. Just sat there thinking about what she had said as he drifted off to sleep. The next morning you awoken at some ungodly hour to the morning nurse introducing herself. Ugh, her happiness at this hour in the morning is almost disturbing, you thought as you watched her adjust a few things around the bed and check your chart. Has she been sneaking some of the hospital pills to keep her awake, functioning and happy? Soon she left and you drifted back off to sleep. Bakugo had been woken too, much to his displeasure, and his crimson eyes stalked the nurse as she flitted around the room adjusting things. She dared not speak for fear of being eaten alive, judging by the animalistic look in Bakugo's eye, and she quickly exited as soon as she could, retreating back to the nurse's station in a haste. Oh, mate, kid in bed seven something else, ain't he? She said with a shudder to the other nurse on shift that morning. I haven't met him yet, the other nurse replied as she set up the medication chart. Saw another kid a moment ago, came in asking if it was okay to see the girl in bed three. Now he was a looker. Only a few minutes later you heard a noise in the hallway. You jumped violently, your head whipping around, eyes searching the hospital room that you were in. I swear I just heard a loud explosion noise. You sat up. Nurses raced past your door and one dove over the nurse's station bench and grabbed for the phone. We need the aggressive response team in fast track ASAP, she hollered into the receiver before slamming the phone back down on the panel and jumping off the bench as she tore off down the hall. What is going on? Fight me, half and half. Ugh, that's what's going on. You groaned internally as you heard the commotion getting more and more out of hand. Ugh, I have to get out there and sort them out myself, you grumbled trying to lift your leg brace off the bed, but failing and ending up just letting it fall heavily on the floor instead with a thud. Ah! You hissed, pain shooting down your leg again, making you even angrier. You pulled yourself up to standing and painfully and gingerly hobble limp to the door, poking your head out into the corridor. As your eyes focused, you saw Shoto standing there in a fight stance, his right arm raised up in front of him with a serious, concentrated look on his face as he stared down Bakugo, who was stalking him in a semicircle, his left arm clutching the gown behind him while small explosions crackled in the palm of his upturned right hand. Get the hell out of this hospital, Bakugo snarled. I'm not here for you, I'm here to see Yin, Shoto replied coolly, his keen eyes not leaving Bakugo for a second. A plastic bag that looked like it contained food clutched in his left hand. Bakugo stopped moving and threw his right arm out, propelling an explosion at Shoto, who dodged it and placed his right arm down on the ground, casting a sheet of ice at Bakugo's leg, but the fiery blonde jumped at the last minute and Shoto missed. There was another scream from the terrified nurses and patients who were watching from nearby in their rooms and you scowled. Ugh, they're going to ruin the place, you thought as you hobbled out into the hall. Bakugo was just about to throw another explosion when he saw you coming up behind Shoto. Stay out of this, Yin! He barked as he prepared for another launch attack at Shoto. Stop it! The two of you! You yelled as you came up behind Shoto and hobbled around him. You got yourself between the two boys and Bakugo walked closer as you turned side on to both of them. Without warning, you slammed your palms into each of their chests, simultaneously sending them both to their knees with your weight quirk. 
Shoto had dropped to one knee with his head bowed, and Bakugo collapsed onto both hands and knees, the back of his gown falling open. I don't want to hear one more word about you two fighting. You're supposed to be heroes in training, you scolded heavily. I'm sick of this. Man up and grow a pair of tits. You released your quirk by bending awkwardly and touching their shoulders. Tits? Bakugo huffed as he gasped for air once your quirk had been lifted. Man up and grow tits? They're stronger than balls. Fight me, squash lemon, you snapped. I must agree. It's not possible to grow tits, naturally, for a male. Shoto panted in confusion. Good. Both agree on something, then, you said sharply as you turned and hobbled back to your room. The aggressive response team had turned up just as you intercepted the fight and had stood back to see if you had handled the situation successfully, deciding not to jump in because everything seemed to have resolved on its own. How... How the hell are we supposed to report that incident? One team member asked the in charge. Eh, girl in leg brace gave both boys hefty chest compressions, told them to grow tits, called one a lemon, and the problem resolved itself. The in charge replied nonchalantly, like it was the most normal thing in the world. That afternoon you were discharged from the hospital and transferred to the UA nurse's office to see Recovery Girl, who worked her kiss magic on your leg and healed it straight away. Bakugo was being held back for an extra day in the hospital because he kept pulling his IV lines out and he hadn't finished his course of antibiotics yet. It was nice to have him and Shoto separated again. There had been so much testosterone flying around the hospital. Things were starting to get out of hand with your boys. Something was going to have to be done. Your grandma had been staying at your house for close to a month now and she was getting more and more frail. She couldn't eat solids any longer and was being fed through a tube that went straight to her stomach. She didn't have much time left. The next week went slowly as you got back into the routine of life. Bakugo was back at school again and his wounds had healed nicely thanks to a bit of extra help from a recovery girl once he had finished his antibiotics. Shoto was being as sweet as ever and paid you a lot of attention, occasionally throwing in a serious heart-pounding line whenever he got the chance to be alone with you. Okay class, school open festival is coming up, Izara announced one day, sounding just as done with life as ever. Class rep, you take over. Ida took to the stand in front of the classroom and took charge while Aizawa flopped into his favourite yellow sleeping bag and passed out on the floor like a drunk caterpillar. Please call out appropriate suggestions in an orderly fashion, Ida announced as he turned to the board to write the suggestions that were being thrown at him. He immediately dismissed naked mud wrestling and setting people off on giant rockets, which was a joint suggestion by Sero and Kaminari, backed by Bakugo, then narrowed down the other suggestions to the two most popular, which were a maid cafe and a stage play, Romeo and Juliet. Everyone was then asked to write down which one they preferred on a piece of paper and asked to come up to the front and place their folded paper in a box. Ida waited for everybody to comply, then started pulling the papers out one by one and tallying the votes. And the winner is stage play Romeo and Juliet, he announced proudly. After the excited chatter had died down, parts of the play and actors of the parts were vaguely discussed as everyone left their seats and sat on desks and backwards chairs in a wonky circle, making the setting quite casual. We need a Romeo and a Juliet, Momo said as she gave Shoto a sidelong glance. He looked over as she bashfully looked away. Uh, and the Juliet needs to be someone perfectly suited for her show. Uh, uh, Romeo, she corrected quickly, her cheeks dusting pink as she hesitantly looked over at Shoto again. His gaze went straight past her to you as you idly picked at your nail or ear, whichever you're more likely to do, and his face softened as he looked at you fondly. I would like to volunteer as Romeo, he said suddenly standing up. If Yin will play Juliet. Your eyes snapped up and met his. Well, what? But I was hoping to be like, I don't know, a tree or something. I make an awesome tree prop. Watch me blow you away with my skills, you said confidently as he waited for your reply. Sit your ass down, Icy Hot. If Yin's playing Juliet, then it's only fitting that I'd be the Romeo. Being a boyfriend and all. Bakugo quipped, leaning back in his chair, arms behind his head, feet on desk with a devilish smirk as he looked at you. Hey, true, Kaminari said. We have our very own couple here. Let's make them Romeo and Juliet. The chemistry will be amazing. Your eyes widened and you stared at Kaminari. Wait, hold up. I don't know if that's going to be a good idea. All in favour? Kaminari yelled, standing up and raising his hand. Almost the whole class put their hand up. Shoto was not impressed and sat down without raising his hand. And all those opposed? Kaminari called out. 
Shoto and a smattering of others put their hands up. It's settled then, Kaminari de declared triumphantly. Bakugo and Yin will play the parts of Romeo and Juliet. Kaminari, may I be the one to stab Bakugo if there's any fight scenes? Shoto asked coolly. I dare you, Bakugo snarled. Classmates, let's focus, please, Ida called, bringing the attention back to the play. You sighed. Ugh, looks like I'll be stuck playing funsies with the crazed love child of Thor. Later that day, Bakugo and Karishima were having lunch on the roof by themselves. Hey, congrats on getting the part of Romeo, Kiri said to Bakugo with a bright, sharp-toothed grin. Bakugo smirked. <laughs> it was bound to happen. I'm the perfect person for the part, he replied confidently. Karishima laughed. That's true, bro, and especially since Yin is Juliet. You'll be spending heaps of time together practicing for the play, so you can ask her to actually be your girlfriend. Bakugo dulled slightly. I don't know, shitty hair. I haven't really actually told her how I feel properly. But you did, bro, Karishma replied with a laugh. On that morning that she came in to get you when you had the fever at camp. I, I what? Bakugo shouted, grabbing Kiri by the collar and yanking him closer. Whoa, bro, what are you... Kiri blushed as Bakugo pulled their faces closer together. What did I say to her when I was out that morning? Bakugo growled, his crimson eyes piercing into Karishima's shocked ones. You, you told her you thought she was hot and gorgeous and you asked if you two were dating, Karishima replied softly. Ah, crap. Did I really say that? Bakugo breathed as he let go of Kiri's shirt. Karishima just nodded. Oh, hell. Bakugo groaned. What'd she say back? Uh, she, she, she was just shocked, I think. She didn't really reply. Just got you up and we both took you to the nurse. Bakugo stared at the ground silently for a moment. Guess I did a lot of things that day, he mumbled. Oi, pizza roll. I'm walking you home today. Bakugo announced to you as the last class ended. I don't need you to walk me home, you aggressive wet fart. I can manage it on my own, you huffed as you turned to leave. He caught your arm. I... I want to talk to you about some things, he said lowly, with a slight blush as he looked away. You saw his vulnerability and softened. Okay, fine, you said. See you at the gate. He let you go and you walked to the lockers and got your bag, heading outside to the gate, waiting for him. It wasn't long before he came sauntering over to you, hands in pockets as he usually did, with the bag slung over one shoulder. You turned and he silently fell in step beside you. Do you have any acting experience? You asked him, referring to the fact that you had both been picked for leading roles in the play. Oh wait, you do. You act the fool all the time, you said with a snort, laughing at your own joke. Bakugo was unusually quiet and you looked at him. Uh, hey, <laughs> what's up? You asked. He looked away. Oh crap, I can't just ask her to be my girlfriend point blank. She'll reject me for sure. How can I? Bakuho Katsaki my dick, are you there? Don't call me that whack-ass name, pizza roll, he exploded. Oh, good, you're back, he chirped, skipping ahead of him and turning around to walk backwards. Now, what do you want to talk to me about? Uh, the play, idiot, he huffed. We need to practice. We have four weeks. Okay, you replied dubiously. Was that all? Yes, he replied curtly. Hmm, you hummed as he spun back to turn around and walk forwards. But you tripped on the pavement and Bakugo just managed to grab you before you fell. Break your knee again, he muttered as his arms wrapped tightly around you, the smell of his delicious caramel swirling around you as you breathed deeply. He pulled back a little and his eyes met yours as your noses almost grazed each other. You cleared your throat and looked away as he blushed and let you go. You continued to walk home, making awkward light conversation as you went, and it wasn't long before you'd reached your house. Turning to him, you were about to say goodbye when he grabbed your wrist. Yin, I need to ask you a question. You waited. Would... would you be my... Yin! Your mum's terrified cry rang out as she saw you. It's Grandma! She sobbed. You and Bakugo raced into the house. You dropped your bag in the hallway as you tore through the house to Grandma's room, with Bakugo hot on your tail. As you got to her door, you slowed and called her name gently as you entered. Her room was dark and slightly, and the pounding of your heart pulsated your vision so much that it distorted your focus. Grandma? You called again softly as you walked in and over to her bed. Bakugo stayed at the door, 
as your mum came up behind him and she walked around to the other side of grandma's bed so that you were both either side. You took grandma's hand and rubbed your thumb over the back of it tenderly while your mum sobbed quietly in the background. Slowly you looked up at your grandma's face as tears pricked the corners of your eyes. She looked very gaunt and pale and she was chain breathing, one breath every few seconds, but she was still cognizant and rolled her head to the side to look at you, her eyes dull and distant. Grandma? You croaked, your voice cracking under the strong emotions that were building. She just continued to stare through you, unwilling or unable to communicate at that point. You remembered hearing somewhere that people who were about to pass away sometimes needed to be told that it was okay to go, otherwise they would keep hanging on unnecessarily, and you swallowed thickly as the weight of that responsibility clung to you. You didn't want to tell her it was okay to go. You didn't want her to go. She couldn't go now. Tears rolled down your cheeks as you continued to hold her hand in yours. Grandma? You sobbed. I love you. Your mum cried harder, not helping the situation. Grandma rolled her head the other way and tried to focus on your mum unsuccessfully. She can hear you, mum. You can talk to her. You sobbed, your voice quivering. You and your mum cried and talked to grandma as best you could, telling her how much you both loved her and thanked her for being the person she was. Her breathing laboured further and you knew time was running short. A knot formed in your stomach and a tightening occurred in your chest. You knew it was time. Grandma, it's okay. You can go now. You bawled. We'll be okay. You've done so well. You can rest. She rolled her head back to you and her lips moved, but nothing came out. Her breathing was every five to seven seconds now and you bawled as you held her hand. A few more minutes and she had gone. It was a haunting process that you hoped you'd never have to experience again in your life. When you and your mum realised she had gone, you both lost it completely. Your mum collapsed and Bakugo ran to her side to make sure she hadn't hurt herself in the fall and you were feeling a little faint yourself but managed to get to a chair nearby before collapsing. As you landed in the chair, you felt Bakugo's strong arms around you and you wailed into his shoulder, your hands clutching into his shirt. Bakugo stayed with you and your mum until your dad got home and the poor blonde had to do most of the explaining since you and your mum were a mess. Dad gave you a big hug with tears in his eyes and then went to console your mum while Bakugo took over consoling you. He didn't say anything, he just held you close and let you cry. He didn't even complain that you had drenched his shirt with tears and snot. You sobbed on and off for most of that evening and night and he waited politely outside your bedroom door as you got changed into your pyjamas that night and then let himself into your room and tucked you in before leaving. Katsuki, wait, you sobbed. Don't go. Please don't go. He took silent pity on you and hopped up onto the bed, crawling in behind you and snuggling into you to keep you company. His arm around you and his warmth behind you eased your sobbing and soon you were out like a light. Bakugo gently got up and left, tiptoeing to the door before letting himself out. He said a quick condolences to your mum and dad who were sitting in the lounge room, got his bag and then left. You didn't go to school the next day or the day after and Shoto had dropped by one of those evenings to make sure you were okay. He bought some flowers for your mum and expressed his condolences and spent some time with you then left. On the third day after grandma had passed away you headed back to school. You were still a little down but seeing your friends again did wonders to fill that aching void in your heart. Oi, Bakugo whispered that afternoon from his seat behind you in class. I know you might not be up for it but we need to start practicing for the play. You nodded. Yeah, I know. You want to start after class? You whispered back over your shoulder. Yeah, he replied. Hey, you greeted somewhat flatly as he entered the classroom after everyone had left and gone home. He jerked his chin up sharply in greeting, hands shoved in pockets. Where's your script? You asked. Ugh, forgot it in my locker, he grumbled. Don't worry, we can share mine, he said flatly. Um, how are you? He asked, avoiding eye contact as he stood in front of you. I'm fine, you said softly as you stared down at your lap. You're not fine, he snorted. You know what fine stands for, yeah? You looked at him quizzically. Freaked out, insecure, neurotic and emotional, he replied. You let out a soft snort of exhale through your nose with a sly smirk. Where'd you get that from? The Italian job, he replied with a shrug. 
I loved that movie. You replied with a smile. Let's focus on this dumbass play, yeah? Take your mind off things, he said with a smirk. Okay, he replied, flicking the first few pages over and looking at Act 1. Let's go to Scene 5. That's where Romeo and Juliet meet. The next few weeks were ups and downs for you. Grandma's funeral, the play, what to do about the whole fake dating thing with Bakugo that you two still hadn't discussed, or your other interests, Shoto. There were so many things to think about and sort out. Most afternoons were spent practicing with Bakugo in the classroom after school. It was called practice, but 90% of the time it was you arguing with Bakugo about why you had to use such whack-ass language that and he couldn't just seem to get his lines right improvising at every opportunity it was now two weeks out from the stage play date and things were starting to get well and truly underway oh i don't like that they die in the end achako wailed sadly as she looked over the script can't we just end with a kiss well i don't see why we can't change the play up a little bit mama replied yin she called to you how would you feel if we changed some things in the play to make it easier and shorter yeah, sure, go for it, you replied from where you were standing on the school stage, helping with stage layout and props. Okay, now, props, Ida said, holding his clipboard and pen. I have no idea what props do we already have on the school grounds, you asked. Unfortunately, I do not know, he replied with furrowed brows. Todoroki, he called, turning around and looking for the jewel-haired guy. Would you help Yin find props for the play? Shoto put down the roll of fabric that he was carrying and nodded solemnly. Of course. You jumped off the stage and skipped over to him. Okay, let's go. We'll try the art storeroom first, he said with a smile. You and Shoto headed out into the hall. How many props do you need? Shoto asked as you walked side by side. Um, not sure, you hummed. I guess we'll have to make do with whatever we find and get Momo to make the rest. I don't think we have a big budget for the play. Shoto nodded silently and continued to walk with you, finally making it to the art room and letting yourselves in. The room was empty. Now, you muttered, what could we use? Shoto walked to the closet near the back of the room and opened it. You walked up behind him and tried to see inside, but it was too dark. Here, let me find a light, you said, ducking under his arm and half stepping into the closet. It's so squishy in here. You stepped in further feeling around for a light switch between the shelves. Shoto stepped in behind you and felt on the opposite wall for the switch. There's none here. You tried to step back, but he was right behind you, so you stepped forwards again so that you wouldn't bump into him, but in the semi-darkness you stumbled on an art easel and fell forwards. Shoto wrapped an arm around your waist as you fell and caught you, but all that sudden movement knocked a broom over that caused the closet door to slam closed, enveloping you both in darkness. Yin, are you okay? Shoto's soft, velvety voice asked from behind you in the darkness. Y yeah you replied bashfully, his arm still wrapped around your waist, pulling your back into his chest. You turned around to face him, your nose bumping his as you tried to stand up without support. He let go of you as you turned. Oh, sorry, it's super squishy in here. I can't see anything, you said with a nervous giggle. Yes, it is a bit cramped, he commented. His head ducked down due to the low roof. Uh, c can you open the door? We, we should get out, you said with a playful laugh. Do you really want to get out, Yin? The way he said that sentence caused you to break out in goosebumps. Um, uh. You became aware that he had his arms either side of you as you stayed backed up against the shelf, your eyes slowly adjusting in the darkness. It's been six months, he said lowly. I've waited patiently. Your mouth ran dry as your heart started beating rapidly. I... it... it has, he replied shyly. I... Shoto said as he raised his head to look at you in the darkness. You both looked at each other silently as he moved slowly towards you. You saw his lips part, and you leaned in as well, your noses grazing slightly as your faces moved closer, causing your eyes to flutter closed. He took one hand off the wall and gently placed it on your cheek as his soft lips connected with yours. You kissed back, noticing the slight temperature difference between his warmer top lip and cooler bottom lip, and you wrapped your arms around his neck, allowing him to deepen the kiss as your tongues intertwined the minute you became more comfortable. He wrapped one arm around you, pulling your body closer to his as your fingers laced themselves into his dual-coloured hair. 
Suddenly the closet door opened and you yanked back, your eyes flying open as they focused on Mina. Oh, she said slyly. Is this what it means to go looking for props? No, Mina, of course not. Shoto replied in his monotone voice. We were sharing an intimate moment. You squealed with embarrassment at Shoto's straightforwardness and blushed. Um, <laughs> you laughed with embarrassment. He, uh, <laughs> he's just mucking around, he said, covering his mouth with your hands so he couldn't say any more. Mina raised an eyebrow at you with an amused smirk on her face and sniggered. Mmm, whatever you say. Shoto reversed out of the closet with his arms still around your waist to pull you out with him, and Mina smirked again. Ah, uh, thank you, Shoto, he said softly with a smile at him. You're welcome, Yin, he said, his soft gaze causing butterflies in your stomach. You giggled slightly and turned your attention to Mina. Hey, um, we didn't get a chance to find any props. She gave you a look and you poked your tongue out at her. Okay, let me help, she said with a resigned sigh, setting about looking for the things alongside Shoto and yourself. Hey, um, Mina? You whispered when Shoto was out of earshot. Can you keep it quiet about Shoto and I, um, in the closet? I haven't had a chance to talk to Bakugo about the whole fake dating situation thing yet, and, well, yeah. It's okay, babes. I get it, Mina giggled softly. And I'm your girl, yeah? I wouldn't rat you out. Thanks. He whispered with a relieved sigh. You found some things in the art room that could end up being useful and a few ladders as well. Shoto, Mina and yourself carried them back to the hall where the stage was and set about seeing where the props would work. The whole time you were working you found it difficult to focus on anything other than Shoto, your eyes finding him wherever he was in the room. Oi, Bakugo said lowly as he approached you. We should do some test runs for some scenes. Huh? You hummed in question your eyes coming back from looking at Shoto to meet his. Stay focused, he grunted. I am, he replied defensively. Not on icy hot, you idiot, the play, he snapped. Your face flushed and you spun away from him. F fine, let's practice, you stuttered with embarrassment at being caught staring at your crush. Wait, hold on, you added, turning back to him. Momo changed a few things in the play, I think. Let's find out what she did before we end up practicing something that she cut out. You jumped off the stage and headed over to her with Bakugo following behind. Hey Momo, what things did you end up changing in the play? You asked her as you neared her. Oh, not much, she said, flipping through the script and pointing out sections that she had adjusted. Most of it was good. She had cut unnecessary scenes and shortened others. Oh, and we also changed the ending of the play to this, she said proudly, showing you the script. Your eyes scanned the final lines and you squealed in shock. What? You gasped. Let me see, Bakugo said, taking the script from your hands. We, we, you stammered. It ends with a kiss, Bakugo said in disbelief. Momo nodded excitedly. But, but, you stammered. It's fine, isn't it? You two are dating anyway, she said excitedly. You just stared at her numbly. Yeah, it's fine, Bakugo grunted and handed the script back to her. You are still standing there, shocked. The next afternoon, you and Bakugo were practicing your parts again, with Bakugo failing miserably as usual. Okay, time out, you said exasperatedly, throwing your hands up from where you sat on the desk. I need a break, can't deal. I'm nailing this stuff. What are you on about? Bakugo replied proudly. What you're doing is giving a perfectly good play anxiety. That's what you're doing, you retorted. Fine, let's practice this scene. This should be fine. Can't screw this one up, he said pointing to a spot in the script. Which part is it? You asked curiously. The kiss scene, he replied confidently. Kiss scene? We don't need to practice that. Yes, we do, he snorted. We need to practice everything. You just want to kiss me, he replied, poking your tongue out. It's for the play, dumbass, he replied with a scowl. Okay, fine, kiss me, but make sure it's a good one, he replied sharply. He walked towards you and you froze where you sat on the desk. He looked serious. He leaned down on the desk and placed a hand either side of you, slowly tilting his head up to look at you, his crimson eyes taking in everything from your chest up. As his eyes met yours, he smirked. You're ready for the best kiss you'll ever have, Juliet, he said in a low, sexy tone. Your heart began to thump in your chest as he leaned in, stopping just before he got to your lips, waiting for you to come that last 5% towards him. You did, and your lips met his. Your eyes shut as he gently reached a hand to the side of your neck and pressed his lips firmer against yours. 
You pushed your lips back into his, and he tilted his head a little more, parting his lips slightly and brushing the top of his tongue along your bottom lip. A shiver went down your spine, and you responded, parting your own lips and allowing him access. As you kissed, you reached your hand up to his, the one that he had placed on your neck, and gently caressed it, his burnt caramel scent intoxicating you and drawing you in deeper into the kiss. Neither of you had pulled back yet, and you found yourself getting more and more into it. He started to push your body back, as if to lie you down on the desk, and you halted him. Whoa, 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 boy, you giggled, breaking away from the kiss. How far are we going with this kiss? Surely it's just a simple kiss for the play? Well, if it detailed more, I'd definitely go for it, he replied with a smirk. <laughs> you just want me, hey, you retorted cheekily. I told you, it's for the play. <laughs> play, my ass. you're just enjoying this too much, you smirked. And you're not? He shot back with a mischievous glint in his eye. Meh, I could take it or leave it, you responded nonchalantly with a dismissive hand wave. You're lying again. He replied with a smirk and leaned back, his lips capturing yours in an instant. There was something alluring about him that just seemed to keep you coming back for more. His kisses were surprisingly gentle and he didn't try and push you beyond your obvious limit again. After retiring the kiss scene, you both decided to call it a day and made plans to practice again the next afternoon. Bakugo had to get going home straight away, so you walked home by yourself deep in thought. Shoto's sweet, caring, and I can see he has a dominant side that I'd like to explore. But then there's Katsuki, who's an asshole, brash, forward yet shy. He's shown me his vulnerable side a few times now. It's kind of cute. The more you thought about them, the harder things became to make a choice. You felt a tightening in your chest, like you couldn't take a deep breath in, and you could feel your heart pounding like you'd just done a 100 metre sprint, but you'd just been walking casually. <sighs> What's happening? Is my quirk acting up? Am I having a heart attack? You flicked your hands as you walked, as if to try to dispel some of the strange feeling from your body. You had a bit of a restless sleep that night. Every time you woke up, you felt that tightness in your chest come back, but you tried your best to just push it aside and focus on something else, like going over your lines for the play. The next day at school, the class had a rehearsal and there was a bit of extra happiness in the air as your classmates flitted about getting some of the props and stage lights up. Eurarika's anti-gravity quirk was working wonders for getting the lights up to the beam across the top of the stage and you watched as Sarah taped them in place before climbing down again. Okay, Yin, let's get you up the tower and do a few scenes. Start with Act 2, Scene 1, Momo dictated, looking at the script. You nodded walking around behind the tower prop and climbing the ladder to get to the makeshift landing that was set up, as the tower hadn't been fully completed yet. You cleared your throat. Oh, Romeo! Romeo! Wherefore art thou? You hollered clearly and poetically. What the hell, woman? Right here! You don't need to shout! Bakugo yelled back at you from somewhere behind the stage. Learn your bloody lines, you hemorrhoid! You bellowed back at him. You're ruining the play! I'm making it better! We've been over this before. As you two continued to bicker and banter, Kaminari, Sero, and Jiro sat in the audience seats watching on. Ah, this play is going to be amazing, Kaminari sighed blissfully. It's um, definitely different, Sero added hesitantly. It's a train wreck, that's what it is, Jiro said in a deadpan voice. Momo walked up to them and sat down next to Jiro. What do we do? She sighed sadly. The play will never come together at this rate. Hey, don't worry. I'm the narrator, remember? Kaminari quipped, leaning forwards in his seat to look at her. I'll have everything under control, he added with a cheeky smile, a wink and a thumbs up. It's like giving control to a toddler, Jiro commented. Uh, are you meaning me, or...? Kaminari asked, looking at Jiro. She just turned her head painfully slowly and stared at him with a dead look in her eyes. You have absolutely no faith in me, he said with a dramatic sigh. Momo leaned forwards and put her face in her hands, moaning pitifully as she rested her elbows on her knees. The days counted down to the play, and you had developed a new habit to curb the strange tightening feeling in your chest and pulsating heart, flicking your hands. Both Shoto and Katsuki had noticed this, but neither of them asked you about it, as it just seemed to happen sporadically and for short bursts, and then you would stop and focus on something else. Two days out from the play, you and Katsuki were due for a dress rehearsal. Momo was in charge of outfits, and she called you into the dressing room to show you the outfit that she had designed and made for the play. She had taken your measurements earlier, so the dress would fit perfectly. 
You walked in and gasped when you saw what she'd made. Momo, this is gorgeous. Isn't it? She squealed proudly, clapping her hands excitedly at your reaction. Try it on! You stripped down and she helped you into it, zipping it up at the back. You looked up into the mirror in front of you and covered your mouth with your hands with silent delight. Oh, it's amazing, you finally said. I'm so glad you like it, she said again with a giant smile. Now I just need to get back and go in here to put his on. I'll get him, you said, turning and stepping out of the change room in your gown. You walked down the hall to the stage area and entered. Oi, aggressive firework, you're up, you called, locating Katsuki in the room as he had his back to you. Huh? He snapped, spinning around to give you a piece of his mind, but he stopped short when he saw you. What? You replied casually, seeing his dumbfound expression. Nothing. He snapped, a light blush dusting his cheeks as he turned his head to the side. Okay, well, you need to go and get your outfit, he said. He walked over to you, intending to walk past and out the door, but you grabbed his arm and his head snapped over to you as he peered at you intently. What? He snapped. You're lying about the nothing part. You teased cheekily, using his own line against him. You weren't really expecting him to answer, but he did. Fine, he mumbled, still with blush and his eyes averted. You look amazing. Your heart fluttered and you let go of his arm and he walked past you and on down the hall. Finally, Bakugo returned in his outfit and you almost had a nosebleed. He had on a plain white shirt that was open at the front and cut in a V, showing off his decent set of pectoral muscles. Parts of his collarbone were visible too, and the sleeves were rolled up just enough to show off the lower portions of his biceps. His pants were a tan brown colour, and although the colour itself wasn't amazing, the way Momo had cut it was. Your eyes lingered on his body for just a split second too long, and he smirked as he caught you checking him out. He stalked towards you and wrapped an arm around your waist to your back, dipping you slightly as he pulled you into him. Julia likes what she sees. He said lowly as his crimson eyes smouldered with pride of knowing that you liked how he looked. That makes us even then, he replied with a devious smirk. He huffed in amusement and let you go. Okay, let's practice, he grunted. As he walked away, you watched his perfect ass in motion. I wonder how Shoto would look in that outfit. You looked across to where Shoto was helping with some things and he caught you looking at him, taking the opportunity to come over. You look amazing, Yin, he complimented you. Oh, thank you, Shoto, he said shyly. Oi, you coming pizza roll? Bakugo called from the stage. I, I better go, he said sympathetically to Shoto as he headed for the stage. Surprisingly, Bakugo was better at his lines this time, occasionally throwing in the odd swear word here and there, but it was much improved from previous practices. The day of the play arrived and everything was set and ready to go. You were still suffering that strange feeling every now and again, but the hand flicking seemed to work, and you used it at every available opportunity. You ready? Bakugo asked slowly as he walked up beside you at the back of stage. You were nervous as all hell, but you just nodded silently and walked away to your allocated start point. Bakugo eyed you as you left, his nose scrunched slightly with concern. He could tell something wasn't right, but just put it down to pre-stage nerves. People had started to file into the hall and were taking their seats, and your heartbeat increased. Instinctively, you started flicking your hands. Shoto, who was over at the back of the hall, could see you slightly through the break in the curtains and knew that something wasn't right. He had started to put two and two together by now and knew you were suffering from mild anxiety attacks every now and again. He pushed off the wall and walked silently and quickly down the side of the hall towards the door that led to the back of stage. You were trying desperately to calm your breathing and keep yourself from getting overwhelmed, but the more you tried to calm down, the worse it got. I... I can't control it. I think I'm going to have a heart attack. What's wrong with me? All these internal questions only worked you up more and more, and your hand flicking increased. Hey, Yin, are you okay? Momo asked softly as she approached you. I'm fine. I'm okay. I'm fine. I'm okay. I'm fine. I'm okay. You blabbered on repeat, trembling and flicking your hands rapidly. Yin, she said with concern. Please, take a deep breath. You tried, but the harder you tried to take a deep breath, the more shallower your breathing became. I, I can't breathe, you stammered, tears pricking at the corner of your eyes as you started to hyperventilate. You tried to scream, but nothing came out. Just then, strong arms enveloped you, and you grabbed onto the person, burying your face into their chest. They smelled like campfires and the winds in snow. Yin, 
Their low voice reverberated through, focus on me. You looked up into the beautiful mismatched eyes of Shoto. He pulled you closer and held you against his chest. Focus on my heartbeat, he said softly, pulling your head to his chest. You're going to be okay. What's happening to me? He almost sobbed. You're suffering from anxiety right now, Yin. He said, pulling you back a bit so he could look at you. But I know you can do this. You nodded and he let you go. You reached out and clung to him. No, Shoto, I, I need you here. I, I, I can't keep calm, but, but, but I can keep calm when, when you're here. Shoto looked from you to Momo, who was standing slightly behind you. Momo, make me a Romeo outfit, he said authoritatively to her. Sh Shoto, what, what are you... You interjected. Please, Momo, this is for the sake of Yin and the sake of the play, he said again, still focusing on her. She pursed her lips and nodded. Sh Shoto, what are you doing? You questioned him again, still in his embrace. You said you can stay calm with me around, correct? You nodded. Then I'm standing in this Romeo. He said firmly, keep your eyes on me. His dominant decision left you no option but to follow his orders. Not that you minded, of course. As Shoto, do you know the lines? Momo asked as she turned her back and opened the front of her blouse, making an outfit for Shoto. Yes, I know the play well, he replied confidently. Momo turned around when she had finished and handed the outfit to him. Excuse me, he said politely, as he stepped over to a quiet corner to get changed. You caught a glimpse of his sublime physique as he lifted his shirt up over his head and you quickly looked away and blushed as you looked back out to the gathering crowd. I should get Krishna to be with me when I tell Bakugo he needs to stand down from the role, Momo said apprehensively as she walked off to go and change the actor's last minute. Shoto was back by your side as soon as he changed, and you stepped back to get a good look at him. He looked like he was made for the part, his jewel-coloured fringe falling across his face as his heterochromic eyes shone. The white shirt fit him just as well as it did back ago, and the pants were again tailored to perfection. Your mouth hung open as you feasted your eyes on him. Make sure you keep your eyes on me, and me only, he said softly as he took your hand. I'll be across the stage from you to begin with. But if you start to get anxious, I'll be right back here beside you in an instant. He reassured you before walking across to his start point. You just nodded, still spellbound by his look. You have no idea what happened with Bakugo, and just assumed that Momo and Karishma had taken care of business. Plus, the play was about to start. The more people filed into the hall, the more your anxiety rose, and you started to shake your hands a little. Remembering Shoto's words, you quickly looked across the stage to where he was standing on the other side, just out of view of the audience. He was watching you and raised a hand to let you know that he had seen you and was still there, then placed his hand on his heart. You closed your eyes a second and just tried to breathe. It worked, and you smiled slightly, opening your eyes to look at Shoto, and he nodded proudly. Just then the lights in the auditorium dimmed, and Kaminari took to the stage, announcing the play and a few other housekeeping rules before bidding the audience a good show and walking to the side to take his place. The prologue started, narrated perfectly by Kaminari, and you had to be honest, you were impressed at how well he suited the part. Act 1, Scene 1 commenced, and the play was underway. Everyone remembered their lines and looked amazing in the outfits that Momo had made. Then Romeo entered, striding confidently up to Benvolio, who was being played by Ayama. Good morrow, cousin, Ayama said flamboyantly. Is the day so young? Shoto replied in his velvety, deep, monotone voice. You heard a significant amount of the girls in the audience sigh and fangirl. Shoto was indeed the perfect fit for Romeo, and you smiled. This is bullcrap, Bakugo seethed in the back room. Bro, calm down, Krishma said sympathetically with his hands raised in front of him, palms towards Bakugo to show passive support. Poor Karishma had been commissioned to hold Bakugo at bay in the back room and had been doing a pretty good job at it in all honesty, but Bakugo was getting more and more upset as time went on. Calm down. I don't need to calm down. I need to be out there with Yin, Bakugo growled lowly. Bro, she was having an anxiety attack. This was necessary for the play to go ahead, Karishma said sadly. I need to make sure she's okay, Bakugo mumbled looking down at the floor. That's so manly, bro, but... I'm sure she's fine, Karishma said, walking over and placing a hand on Bakugo's shoulder. You can check on her after the play is done. No! Bakugo snapped, his crimson eyes meeting Karishma's. No, 
Screw them. I'm going in. Bro! No, bro, come on. No, that's not manly at all, Karishma pleaded. You can't just barge into the play like that. I'm supposed to be freaking Romeo. My girl is up there with that half and half bastard. I'm getting her back, Bakugo growled, standing up and pushing past Karishma. That's kind of manly, but, but still, Karishma called as he chased Bakugo out the door. The play was going well, and you were ready for the introductory part with Romeo. Due to space and design, Momo had decided to put you in the tower for scene five so that Romeo could gaze up at you while the stage lights lit you up. Who doth she be? Fair maiden that I see. Shoto said longingly as he stretched a hand up to point eloquently to where you were poised up in the tower. Your heart jumped. He had improvised the line, but it suited perfectly. Suddenly, a loud voice interjected. Prepare to die, Montague bastard! Shoto whipped around to see Bakugo entering the stage. He whipped his head back the other way to look at Kaminari, who had a huge grin on his face. Oh, there appears to be another Romeo who's entered the scene, Kaminari narrated without skipping a beat. Die! Bakugo yelled as he ran towards Shoto with a plastic sword drawn. My apologies, audience. This Romeo is a bit rogue, and I cannot account for the words that are about to spill forth with much passion, Kaminari said apologetically. Some of the audience laughed and cheered. Shoto, seeing Bakugo coming at him with a sword, immediately reverted to fight mode and activated his ice quirk, shooting a rivulet of ice at the irate blonde. Oh yeah! Get to use quirks! Bakugo hollered with excitement, tossing the sword aside as he jumped out of the way of Shoto's attack. You saw Bakugo curl his fingers and release a few test explosions into the palm of his hand as his smirk grew. Katsuki, no! You yelled, but it was no use. He had target fixation on Shoto, and nothing else mattered at that point. The rogue Romeo plans on taking down Romeo Montague for the hand of Juliet! Kaminari cried with dramatic enthusiasm. Fight me for an icy hot extra! Bakugo snarled lowly with a growl as he threw his arm back and detonated an explosion, shooting towards Shoto at lightning speed. The crowd erupted into cheering and whistling, and Shoto ducked and rolled out of the path of Bakugo's attack slamming his right hand down onto the ground and freezing the stage. You gasped and covered your face. This definitely wasn't going to plan, but the audience was well and truly involved by now, and their shrieks of delight were almost deafening. Bakugo landed feet first on the ice and slipped slightly, before running back towards Shoto, who was up on his feet again and ready for the next attack. Bakugo took a big right arm swing at Shoto, who raised his right hand to freeze Bakugo's move mid-air, but unfortunately Bakugo saw his move at the last minute and withheld the punch, opting to throw a low explosion from his left hand at Shoto's side, sending the dual hair coloured heartthrob flying across the stage. Romeo! Oh Romeo! Um, art thou okay, Romeo? You hollered, trying to keep in character a little. Shoto flipped mid-air and dug his shoes into the stage on impact, throwing a hand behind him to create a small wall of ice that he could launch from. Fair Juliet, for thine hand I fight. Shoto said lowly with his head bowed as he came to a stop. His response was quiet, but loud enough for the stage mic nearby to pick it up, and the girls in the crowd screamed their approval. Back go spat. Come at me, damn half and half. I'll put you in your place. Rogue Romeo, that's not very Shakespearean of you, Kaminari chided gallantly. Use your lines! This shall determine that. Bakugo growled lowly, remembering his line perfectly from the fight scene between Romeo and Tybalt. Shoto charged at Bakugo, aiming to grab his arm and freeze him, but Bakugo used his quirk to dodge and elbowed Shoto as the lithe hero in training skidded past. Bakugo looked up at the light bar above the stage and had an idea, so he threw his arms behind him and detonated an explosion big enough to propel himself up there, grabbing onto the bar as he swung his legs up and over it. Oh! What's this? Kaminari gasped. Some of the girls started cheering for Bakugo. Shoto spun and was about to shoot ice when Bakugo dropped down head first. You screamed and braced for impact, your eyes squeezing shut. Shoto raised his right arm as Bakugo screamed. Die! Bakugo's right palm glowing as he fell rapidly, a massive explosion building. The blonde timed his arm movements with his fall his arm becoming outstretched as he almost met Shoto, and their right hands collided. There was an almighty thunder crack of an explosion, and powdered snow erupted across the stage and into the auditorium, covering everyone present. There were screams of confusion, 
Then as people opened their eyes and realised it was a sort of man-made snow, they cheered and clapped. Everyone on stage and backstage was shocked. Kurishima raced on stage quickly and grabbed Bakugo, who had been flung back by the impact, dragging him to the side as quickly as he could. Shoto stood for a moment, surveying the carnage before being prompted by Kenaro to wrap up the play. Romeo Montague has defeated the rogue Romeo for the hand of fair Juliet. He now lays claim to his prize, Kemenari said triumphantly. You had to stop yourself from grinning from ear to ear as Shoto turned slowly and gazed up at you in your tower. My love, Juliet, he said solemnly as he walked slowly through the patches of snow that lay on stage to the base of the ladder that had been placed at the base of your tower for him to climb. The foe of love hath been subdued. Translation my love, Juliet, the enemy of love has been taken care of. The fan girls in the crowd squealed with jealous delight for their new hero, Romeo Montague, and his charming lines. More than a few of them wished that they were in your shoes right now. Your heart pounded in your chest as his bewitching eyes watched your face as he climbed. I, my sweet Romeo, no more to rent us in twain, he replied airily. Translation, yes, my sweet Romeo, no longer will he pull us apart. Allow for me, fair maiden, to delight in love's first kiss. Shoto said lowly as he neared the top of the ladder and leaned over. Translation, please let me kiss you. Mine lips hath longed for thine, my love. Kiss, and let me partake of thine. Such a delight hath been withheld for long enough. You replied as your face neared his. Translation, I've been dying to kiss you. This has been a long time coming. The passionate kiss that followed took the two of you by surprise. His tongue brushed your lips, and instantly you were both enraptured in each other, chemistry bouncing between you. And in that moment, you knew he was the one. Whoa, Mina whispered harshly to Jiro beside her. Does, does that look like a real kiss or what? She added as they watched from the back of the auditorium. The audience had erupted at this point, and already people were starting to stand in their seats to give a standing ovation. You broke from the kiss as the cheering and clapping got louder, and both you and Shoto looked into the crowd. Unable to contain yourself any longer, you smiled brightly against the blinding lights. I think they liked it, you said looking at Shoto, and he looked from the audience back to you. All because of you, Yin, he said with a soft smile. The play ended at that point, and everyone involved in the play came back on stage after Kaminari's finishing outro and held hands bowing to the audience in gratitude as screams and shouts of encore echoed through the auditorium. You were beside Shoto, your right hand holding his left hand, and you could feel the fire coursing through his veins. While everyone was smiling out to the crowd, he was watching you standing beside him. You felt his eyes on you and looked at him, looking away immediately when you realised he'd just been admiring you that whole time. Three cheers for Romeo and Juliet! Kaminari called into the microphone. The audience was only too happy to comply, and a chorus of hoorays rang out. You grinned and then covered your giant smile with your left hand as Shoto squeezed your right hand, giving you a fond smile when you looked at him. Kurishima had to hold back and go back as he was desperate for round two with Shoto, his cries of challenge being drowned out by the crowd. Man, what an awesome play that was, Kaminari said proudly as he approached Jiro afterwards. It was chaotic, but the audience enjoyed it, so I guess I should say well done. She said, looking away with embarrassment. I'll take it. That's a compliment, Kaminari replied with a smirk. Come get dinner with me to celebrate? Jiro eyed him from the corner of her eye. Yeah, fine, she said. Awesome. It's the date, Kaminari replied excitedly. Date? I, I, I didn't say anything about a date, Jiro stammered. Ah, oh, come on. You can say you dated me just before I became a famous stage narrator he said, slinging an arm across her shoulders and casually walking her to the door. She jammed an ear jack in his ear. Everyone crowded you after the play, wanting to congratulate you and recount their favourite parts of the play as you stood backstage. You were a little overwhelmed by the throng of people, but did your best to thank and talk to them all. Then suddenly a strong hand grabbed you and pulled you from the centre of the crowd. Take a number and wait, you damn extras. It's my turn to talk to Juliet. Bakugo barked gruffly as he dragged you off down the hall. You waited until he had dragged you to a more quiet part of the backstage area before flinging his arm off. What the hell, Katsuki? You shouted. What was that all about? Oi, I was supposed to be Romeo, not icy hot. He shot back. Yeah, but 
I felt more comfortable with Shoto. You said more quietly as you dropped your head and rubbed one hand to your opposite arm, hugging yourself. I was, I was struggling, and you kept me calm. Bakugo's scowl deepened and then he softened. You've got feelings for Icy Hot, don't you? He mumbled. I saw that kiss. You looked up at him, slightly shocked. Uh, yeah, um, well, he frowned. Just so you know, we don't need to be doing the whole faking dating thing anymore. Your mouth fell open. Well, why? You asked incredulously. Yeah, he grunted, looking away. Everything's been sorted out. So go to half and half. Tell him how you feel. And don't let anyone else get in your way, okay, dumbass? You squealed with excitement and flung your arms around his neck, kissing him quickly on the cheek before hugging him. Don't kiss me, you idiot. Back you go, try to go kiss Icy Hot. You didn't need to be told twice, and with that you let him go, turned and ran, calling out another thank you over your shoulder as you ran. You came back to the stage area, searching for Shoto, but he was nowhere to be seen. You were about to give up and go to the dressing room to get changed when he caught you in the hallway. Yin, come with me, he said, extending his hand to you. You smiled and took it, following him as he led you up the flight of stairs to the roof. I, I was looking for you, Shoto. I, I have something to um, tell you. He nodded as he walked. I have something to tell you too, he said as he led you up the last of the stairs and out onto the roof, just as the sun was setting. Yin, he stated softly as he turned to face you, gazing down at you with those gorgeous mismatched eyes. I wanted to catch you alone for a bit. Yes, Shoto? You asked curiously, feeling like he had more to say. I feel now is the right time for me to tell you how much that I've fallen for you. He said gently in his velvety voice. I don't care how long I have to wait, but my dream is to make you mine. Your heart skipped a beat as he tenderly brushed the side of your face with his fingers, smoothing some of your fringe out of the way. He glanced at your lips and then back to your face, his eyes pleading for another kiss. You wrapped your arms up around his neck and leaned in to kiss him as his hands settled on your waist. After kissing passionately for a moment, you pulled back. Shoto, Katsuki told me that we no longer have to be fake dating anymore, so... He gently took his hands to your neck, feeling for the necklace that was already there, and undid it, taking it off and sliding the ring off the necklace into his hand. Yin, when we're older, he said, holding your right hand up and placing the ring at the tip of your finger. Will you marry me? But for now, will you be my girlfriend and wear this ring as a promise? Till death do us part, Romeo, he replied with a giggle as he slipped the ring on, leaning in for one last kiss. Everyone crowded you after the play, wanting to congratulate you and recount their favourite parts of the play as you stood backstage. Suddenly a strong hand grabbed you and pulled you from the centre of the crowd. Take a number and wait, you damn extras. It's my turn to talk to Juliet. Bakugo growled to the sea of people as he pulled you from their centre. You waited until he had dragged you to a more quiet part of backstage before flinging his arm off. What the hell, Katsuki? You shouted. What was all that about? Oi, I was supposed to be Romeo. Not icy hot, he shot back. Well then, Romeo, why did it take you so long to jump in and save me? You pouted. Bakugo's scowl deepened. Because I didn't think you wanted me there, he replied with a twinge of hurt in his voice as he looked away. Do you really think I think that little of you? You retorted. He frowned as he looked back to you. Just so you know, I don't need to do the whole fake dating thing anymore. You looked at him, a funny feeling in your stomach. W what do you mean? You asked, a little dejectedly. Crackhead auntie no longer controls our accounts. We won the court battle, he said frankly. Oh, you replied, looking down at the floor. Why do you have that stupid look on your face? He asked suddenly and lowly. Your heart jumped and you looked back up at him. What stupid look? You look sad, he said bluntly. I I'm not sad, you retorted, crossing your arms across your chest defiantly. Did you like us fake dating? He asked in an almost teasing tone. What? You stammered, your face going redder. He backed you up against the wall and placed a hand either side of your head. Stop playing in. I know you like me, he said lowly with a smirk. You took a deep breath. Pfft, okay, fine, what if I do? You replied with eyes narrowed, staring him down and trying to look menacing. 
He huffed with amusement, taking one hand down to reach into his pocket. Take that necklace off and ring off, he demanded. Why? You shot back. Because I got something better for you, he replied, producing a ring box. Your eyes shot open when you saw it, and you just gawked at him. What? What's this? You stammered. I'll show you if you answer this question, he said lowly. Will you be my real girlfriend? You hesitated for a second, not sure if he was playing around. His serious eyes burned into you, and you knew he meant it. Yes, you replied. Correct answer, he said back with a smirk, stepping back and opening the box to reveal a beautiful little promise ring. Now don't lose this one, you dumbass pizza roll, he said as he took your right hand and slipped the ring onto your finger. I promise, you stupid rogue Romeo, you replied with a giant grin. He grabbed you into a hug and then picked you up, spinning you around before putting you back down. Your lips crashed together in an amazingly hot kiss filled with all the pent-up emotions that you'd felt over the past six months. From now on, it was official. You two are dating. Let the world beware. You had managed to sneak away after the play had finished and had just changed back into normal clothes, sighing with relief that it was finally all over when the next problem presented itself. Oh, now if I can just sneak out of here and get home without anyone seeing me, that would be perfect, you thought as you stepped out of the change room and bumped straight into Bakugo's broad chest. You screamed in shock and stumbled backwards into the change room that you'd just come out of. Kadski, how long have you been standing there for? You stammered in shock. Long enough to wait for your slow ass to change, he said gruffly. Cobwebs have grown on my legs by now. Well, you could have just gotten changed and gone home like a normal person, you huffed, noticing he was still in his Romeo outfit. Why are you waiting for me? Because I I need to talk to you about something, he mumbled, crossing his arms across his chest. We? you asked suspiciously. Who's we? Half and half bastard and I, he replied sharply. Oh, is this about the play? you asked curiously. No, he replied. Just come, yeah? We want to talk to you. Okay, you said dubiously, narrowing your eyes suspiciously at him. He jerked his head for you to follow, and you fell in step beside him, following him to an empty classroom where Shoto was waiting for you. Both boys were still in their Romeo outfits. How fitting, you said with a chuckle. My two Romeos in one room. Yes, Shoto replied. That's what we want to be. What? you asked with a confused giggle. We both want to be your boyfriends. Bakugo chimed in gruffly. Uh, I'm sorry, what now? The two of you? At the same time? Yes, Shoto said plainly with a nod. Are you okay with this, Katsuki? You asked the blonde, still standing beside you. He didn't reply. Oi! You snapped at him. Answer the question. Yeah, I am. He replied with a huff. You're not very convincing, you snorted. Listen, both Icy Hot and I have caught feelings for you. We know that asking you to choose just one of us is going to cause you a massive amount of anxiety. So we figured that you could have us both, he said bluntly. So do you want us or not? Um, of course I do, you blurted out. The two hottest guys in the class as my boyfriends? Are you kidding me? It settled then, Choto said as he stepped forwards to you. From now on, you are my girlfriend and Bakugo's girlfriend. And we will work out the finer details later. Whoa. Okay, so is this a dream? I'm 100% sure of it, but that's okay, you replied. Bakugo grabbed you and spun you towards him, planting his lips firmly on yours. Shoto then pulled you away and gently caressed your neck as he kissed you down the other side of your neck and back up to your jawline, pecking you lightly on the lips. Still feel like a dream, Bakugo grunted from slightly behind you. Yeah, even more so, you said airily, staring off into outer space. Well, better get used to it, because it's going to be happening a lot from now on, Bakugo said with a smirk. You sighed happily as your gaze returned to Shoto's eyes. Well, this is the perfect way to fix me when I was torn down the middle, you replied in a bliss-filled voice. Thank you, Shoto. Thank you, Katsuki, you said looking from your jewel-haired boyfriend to your hot blonde boyfriend. My pleasure, Yin, Shoto replied. Whatever, pizza roll. Katsuki said with a smirk. And there ends Torn Down the Middle, the completed book. Thank you so much for sticking with me from start to finish. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope to see you in another book.